Welcome to the full audiobook narration of P.A. Mason's An Unforeseen Demise, Book One in the Witchy Cozy Mystery Series, Trouble Down Under. Chapter One Cupping the drooping leaves of a moth orchid, I focused with heavy lidded eyes and felt the electric tingle of magical energy in my fingertips. It was the houseplant that was giving me the hardest time, and I could still sense the bacteria causing rot after weeks trying to revive it. Perhaps I was holding on to some kind of orchid bias after the fiasco in California. The kettle boiled and blinking, I turned my attention to the task at hand. I sniffed as I poured boiling water over the loose leaf tea, hoping Grandma wouldn't pick up the scent of an extra ingredient. I took the tray into the dining room, trying not to take Grandma's ranting and raving to heart. Great Aunt Tabitha was her sister after all, and despite the vitriol coming out her mouth I knew she was hurting at the news of her passing. Grandma was just, well Grandma. Whoever heard of a seer passin' unexpected? Grandma spat across the table at Mom, who was trying to placate her. No, she did this on purpose to spite me. She was always using any excuse to seem flamboyant. Come now. Mom poured from the bright red teapot and nudged a cup over to Grandma. Don't you remember Nolene Gray? Her passin' was a surprise to everyone. Grandma snorted, her wizened face steely. That woman was just trying to keep her kin from robbing her blind. I know she had more tucked away than she let on, and Bob is still driving that beat-up old truck around, No, she had plans, and wasn't about to tell a soul about it. Grandma lifted her teacup to her lips and sniffed tentatively. Darn it, cat, what have you put in there this time? I'm not some familiar can dose up on herbs. I groaned internally as I stood and plucked the teapot from the table. You got a nose keener than Gus. You given me guff, girl. That cat of yours couldn't sniff out a mouse infestation in a barn full of grain. Lazy, if you ask me. Back in my day we didn't coddle familiars like. I'll freshen up the pot. I flashed my teeth in a smile and strode off to the kitchen, not knowing how much longer I could put up with Grandma in a state like that. I'd only used a little of the valerian in the tea to take the edge off her temper. I wished Marissa would hurry up and finish her shift at the bar. She was the potions witch of the family. I preferred to grow the herbs she needed. Dumping the tea into the sink, I stared out the window to the garden, where I'd spent the last few weeks cleaning up the mess I'd found when returning home. With my tail between my legs, News of Aunt Tabitha's death was like a kick in the guts after breaking up with Damon and the car crash on the road trip back to Arkansas. I winced as my arm seemed to recall the memory in a twinge of pain. Thanks to Mom's ministrations I'd been able to take the cast off after a week at home, but it hurt now and then while bones healed and flesh which opened up knitted back together properly. It was certainly the perk of having a healer in the family, and I'd planned to get my life back together and get out of tumbling springs after a brief convalescence. We hadn't even discussed the funeral arrangements though, which was complicated given Aunt Tabitha had lived most of her life in Australia. Am I gonna be waiting all day for that tea, Katerina? Grandma hollered. I gritted my teeth and filled the kettle. It's on the way. Prepping the tea with no extra ingredients, my mind swirled with thoughts. Having a seer die unexpectedly was a bad omen. Most witches with the sight could foretell their own deaths and make arrangements. I hoped it didn't mean something more sinister was at play. But the thought was ludicrous. Aunt Tabitha was the sweet to Grandma Sour, and I'd never met a soul who didn't have a good thing to say about her. If I was being honest, she was my favorite family member, even if we only saw each other at Christmas most years. With a fresh tea tray and a plate of cookies, I steeled myself as I walked back into the dining room to set it down in front of Mom. Her usually perky countenance seemed as flat as her shiny brown curls, which hung limp around her shoulders. She gave me a tired smile and took a last gulp of the valerian tea before refilling the cups. I supposed if we couldn't dose Grandma, the least we could do is medicate ourselves against her barbed tongue. So what do we need to do then? I sat, resolving not to listen to Grandma gripe any longer. It was time to make arrangements, 
Who was it that called again? Some woman called Beverly Mom frowned. I don't recall Aunt Tabby mentioning her, but she says she's the neighbor. Did she give us the details of the authorities we need to speak to? Is it any different in Australia? My mind conjured images of kangaroos and crocodiles, but in truth I knew little about the country. She said something about determining the cause of death, but only wanted to know who would be cleaning the place out and speaking with the local realtor. She wasn't exactly oozing sympathy. Figures. Grandma took a healthy gulp of the undrugged tea. It'll be me who has to travel halfway around the world to put things right. Always is. Typical that this happens right before the council convenes for the annual gala planning. If Polly gets her mitts on the nominations, we'll be swimming in awards for the Thompson clan again. Can't we just, you know, have it arranged? They have a thing called the internet now, and removalists will pack up your stuff and ship it wherever it needs to go. I crumbled an oatmeal cookie in my fingers, willing myself to patience. Think about it. Grandma tapped the crochet tablecloth with her finger. You must have left your head in California someplace. If normal folks get their hands on the Crow family relics, they'll be hell to pay. Oh! My jaw dropped a little. I hadn't even considered the magical items since Grandma kept her share of the heirlooms secreted away. I didn't think of that. Course you didn't, Grandma huffed. There ain't another seer in the family now, but that don't mean we just leave our relics to end up in some thrift store in Australia. They've been in our family for generations. There'll be a new seer soon enough, mark my words. I swallowed, reminded of Grandma's barely concealed disappointment that me and my cousin Marissa didn't manifest those powers. But she was right. Someone had to round up the relics and return them home where they wouldn't cause a catastrophic magical leak. The Arcane Council would have the families hide if we caused some international news debacle. I'll go then. It was out of my mouth before the idea really clicked in my mind. Cat Mom exclaimed. You're still recovering from that accident. Australia is on the other side of the world, for Pete's sake. It's not like you could take a bus there and be home in time for supper. But Grandma's eyes only narrowed as she considered me, and my aversion to getting back behind the wheel notwithstanding, it seemed right that I was the one to make the trip. Mama, you've got your hands full with all those critters in the barn, and Grandma's right. It's important that the crows are represented on the council. It didn't hurt to butter Grandma up, and it's not like I've got anything better to do right now. Aside from getting the garden back in order, anyway. As the words formed in my mind, the allure of getting out of Tumbling Springs banished any trepidations over a trip halfway across the world to settle Aunt Tabby's affairs. It seemed like a perfect excuse to get away from the I told you so looks from Grandma, and even worse, the sympathetic ones from Mom. I don't know. Mom shook her head and sighed. Maybe I can come with you. I could move some of the animals over to Terry's barn and Lucille could. Mom, it's fine. I held up my hand as if the gesture could convey the reassurance she needed. I'm a grown woman who can pack up some boxes and sift through paperwork. It won't take long to get everything together, and I can bring Aunt Tabby home for the funeral. Supposing that it was straightforward to check a dead body into the airport, but repatriating bodies overseas was something that happened all the time. I was sure that I was capable of filling in the right forms to make that happen. Mom made a face, the kind of twisted expression that told me she was a hair's breadth away from being convinced, and I switched my gaze to Grandma. I'm sure Marissa will have a whole horde of baby seers running around before long. If you write me out a list of what to look for, I can have them back here in a snap. Grandma nodded as if she'd proposed the idea herself and sipped her tea. It'll do you good to get out and stop moping about that darn Carrington boy. Sharon, you just... I slapped my hands down on the table a little harder than I intended, and stood, scraping the chair back behind me. Great. I ground out through gritted teeth. I'll go book some flights. Mom opened her mouth to speak, but I only held my hand out for the scrap of paper on the table with her cramped handwriting scrawled all over it. She swallowed before handing it to me, 
and I stormed out onto the wide porch surrounding the house. It took every ounce of willpower in my possession to keep from screeching, and I pulled my phone from my pocket to find a spot where I'd get at least one bar of coverage. I doubted Mom had even noticed the modem was busted while I was away, and the serenity of the wooded hillside of the Crow ancestral home notwithstanding, being disconnected was becoming a real pain. Taking slow steps around the house, I settled on a spot by the living room, looking over the barn which served as Mom's healing practice. It took some searching to figure out where the closest airport was to Aunt Tabitha's home, which took my mind off Grandma's harsh remarks, but a fresh wave of uncomfortable emotion swelled in my gut at my complete ignorance as to Aunt Tabby's life down under. I'd promised to visit so many times, but life had just been… busy. It took her death to get my full attention, and for that I knew I'd carry regret for the rest of my life. Booking tickets to Melbourne was pretty straightforward, with a couple of extra add-ons for a rental car the week I planned to be there. From the map, it looked like Aunt Tabby was a few hours away from Melbourne, so I would just have to put my big girl pants on and get back behind the wheel. I'd done a couple of trips into town already, and I refused to let the Carringtons dictate my life based on fear. Knowing the receipts and travel itinerary were en route to my inbox, I pocketed my phone and ran my hands across my scalp. My loose, wavy brown hair was still a little damp from the shower, but I hiked it into a ponytail and trotted down the bricked steps toward the garden shed. A few hours cutting through the tangle of cat's claws threatening to overwhelm the neglected gazebo around back would do me good. When I had returned from California, I was surprised to find the vine growing so voraciously given the climate difference to its native Peru. Marissa had plans for a big batch of arthritis tonic. The shed needed some work, too. The wooden door with its peeling white paint protested with a squeal as I wrenched it open, and inside, the damp earthy smell held hints of mold. Just as I was reaching for my pruning shears, a hatchet came tumbling down from the top shelf, and I jumped backward with a cry as its sharpened blade thumped itself into bare dirt. Damn it, Damon. I screeched, won't you just let up already? Chapter 2 My heart pounded as I stared at the hatchet, my mind flashing with all the other near misses I'd endured since coming home. But as I bent to pick it up, Marissa's voice scared me almost half to death. Um, you all right, Cat? She peered at me from the doorway with her arms folded, and I was surprised she'd managed to sneak up on me. Usually, you heard her car a mile away, she had the radio up so loud. Crap. I didn't need Marissa joining Mom and Grandma with their silent judgment, or begin to suspect what I was trying my best to ignore. I'm fine, cuz. Just tell me you have something on hand to quiet Grandma down. Marissa's laugh was irksome. I returned the hatchet to its place and dusted my hands on my jeans. She can't be that bad, can she? Marissa wrinkled her nose at my gesture, the antithesis of her always pristine outfits. You know what it was like when Granddaddy passed, Barkin is her way of sorting through grief. It was all very well for Marissa. She'd had the benefit of growing up under a different roof and away from the brunt of Grandma's temper. But I remembered coming home from Granddaddy's funeral with her as kids. We'd both been a little horrified to hear Grandma weeping behind her bedroom door that afternoon. Even so, she's convinced Aunt Tabby's passing is a personal affront. She doesn't believe a seer couldn't have known death was coming. It is strange. Marisa pouted perfectly glossed lips in thought as she stepped back to let me through. Maybe she's right. What? I scowled and set the pruning shears by the door with a silent promise to return soon. Aunt Tabby didn't have a nasty bone in her body. I don't believe for one second that she'd do something like that. Marissa opened her mouth and hesitated before speaking. Do we know what the cause of death was? I mean, the only other explanation is foul play. Maybe involving magic? Foul play? I halted in my tracks and swung around to stare at my cousin. Like murder. Wouldn't she see that coming too? Well, maybe. She shrugged theatrically and sighed. Neither of us are seers, 
and they ain't exactly falling out of trees. But it's possible, right? She always said the sight wasn't infallible. I didn't need to be thinking about that. But the notion resonated with the disquiet I'd felt since Mom had gotten the call. Despite open resentment on Grandma's part that Aunt Tabby had moved away years ago, I knew my favorite aunt wouldn't leave us with this kind of worry and grief if she could avoid it. She would have said something. Well, I'm sure I'll find out. It'll be me that goes to Australia to sort things out. I just booked my flights. My cheeks heated a little. I probably should have waited for Marisa to arrive to see if she wanted to come along. Oh. Marisa's eyes widened, and she scrunched up her face as we climbed the steps to the porch. Do you need me to come with you? That sounded like Marissa had plans. She always had plans. I'll be fine. I sat on the swinging love seat, unwilling to venture inside again yet. I just have to fetch the family relics, get her house packed up, and figure out how to get her home for the funeral. Marissa sank down beside me, and though her expression was sympathetic, I could tell she was relieved. You sure? It's only that Jake's taken me to his sister's wedding in. New York, I finished. How could I forget? Marissa had been bragging about it for weeks, and very unsubtly dropping hints at her boyfriend to take her to Tiffany's. You shouldn't miss the wedding. I'd say there'll be a fair bit of red tape involved in repatriating Aunt Tabby's body. The funeral won't happen for a while. We fell into a lull sitting side by side, the only sound birds chirping in nearby trees and the occasional bleat from Ned in the barn. The goat was a particularly cantankerous patient of Mom's. You sure you're feeling up to a big trip like this? Marissa's tone was guarded, and I closed my eyes, knowing what was coming. You've had a rough couple of weeks. Daddy hasn't got much work on at the moment. I'm sure he wouldn't mind seeing to things. Uncle Henry would do whatever Grandma asked, if with a good portion of grumbling, but as someone who avoided magic wherever he could, I couldn't see him wanting to round up the relics. Besides, I needed to get out of my hometown and clear my head. Maybe the accidents that were plaguing me would let up with that kind of distance between me and the Carringtons. Leave him be. He's been working on that car for weeks now. I wouldn't tear him away when he's so close to finishing it. Marissa rolled her eyes. She was less enamored than me with her father's lifelong hobby of restoring classic cars. Enthusiasts didn't begin to describe it. But I found it refreshing to have someone in the family who wasn't magically inclined. A little bit of normal in a town that barely concealed the magic of its inhabitants. A crash of shattering ceramic came from inside, shortly before Grandma bellowed a string of curses. Marissa and I groaned in unison, but before I could get up, Marissa patted my knee and stood. Let me, she said. I reckon I can get her to have a lie down with the right persuasion. Of that I had no doubt, so I smiled and nodded. Marissa's honeyed tongue had just the right effect on Grandma, and I didn't resent it a bit at that moment. I'll be in soon. I wasn't sure that I would as I considered the garden again. The afternoon sun waned, taking its scorching heat with it, and despite knowing I'd be plagued with mosquitoes before too long, it was preferable to being caught in the crossfire inside. The plants were looking a whole sight better than they did when I arrived home from California, but the summer's humidity made pulling weeds feel like playing whack-a-mole. Another muffled shout from Grandma decided me, and I stood with a grimace. Perhaps not the cat claws this afternoon. I doubted Marissa had much time for making potions this week with a fancy trip to New York clouding up her brain space. The Crow family home had been built by my ancestors in the early 1900s, settled on a hillside where the views from the second floor were stunning, but on the ground the forest gave a feeling of a private sanctuary. The barn out front was a later addition, bigger than the house itself, and the post and rail pens surrounding the structure had seen better days. Mismatched garden beds, tended to just as long as the house, dominated an open stretch of green on the west side of the house. Green witches were common in the Crow family, with healers just as abundant. Crunching over the gravel drive, I settled on the humble act of pulling weeds to pass away the time. There was something therapeutic in the simple act, and it was a mighty fine balm for taking out one's frustrations. 
the woody patch of rosemary and thyme at the back of the garden had seen little attention since I arrived, so I made a beeline through the fussier verbenas and swathes of chamomile. It was among the peppermint that I found Gus, my ginger familiar, who was sunning his belly with a blissed-out grin. Having fun out here? I planted my fists on my hips and smirked as he startled. I think Grandma's right. If you can sleep through me tramping through the garden, your hunting days are long behind you. Gus yawned and stretched before giving me the stink eye. I'll have you know I am a formidable predator. I just prefer cat food. Aha. Uh -huh. I rolled my eyes and stooped to pat his belly and earned a playful swipe for my trouble. Today is a good day to make yourself scarce out here. I'm also adept at deciphering human emotions. I'd rather sleep in the barn than spend the night in that cesspit of anger and grief. Some familiar. Aren't you supposed to be an emotional support cat? Ha. Huh. Gus stood and arched his back. My support only extends to warning you of impending doom. Advice which goes unheeded for the most part. He would never let me live it down. My new life in California which was over almost before it started. In my defense he could have told me that Damon was cheating on me, but then I hadn't been exactly holding up my end of the witch and familiar bargain with him either. Got any warnings for me this week? I'm heading to Australia to settle Aunt Tabby's affairs. We're leaving already? Gus's telepathic voice groaned. We only just arrived. Ah, no, we are not going anywhere. Australia is overseas, and I don't think I can check you into the airport with my luggage. Hmm. Gus sat and gave me one of those penetrating feeling stares. Those large metal boxes in the sky? I'd rather keep my paws on solid ground. Mom will take good care of you. I should be back before the week is out. I swallowed and asked the question that I hadn't dared broach with him. Gus, is there anything, like bad juju or whatever following me around? You are asking if the Carringtons have hexed you. I have been considering the same question since the car crash myself. I waited for Gus to give me the bad news. But all he did was yawn, and? It is possible. I should have felt the collision coming, but I didn't. A familiar should have picked up on that, perhaps not as specific as horrific car crash imminent, but at least a wary feeling. The only thing Gus had griped about on the road trip back home was feeling carsick, but I counted myself lucky that he was there to fetch help after I blacked out. Well, you don't get every warning, huh? Remember that time I fell off a ladder while cleaning out the gutters? I consider my ignorance a failing, I let you down and you were grievously hurt. Oh, Gus. I frowned and scooped Gus into my arms to give him a snuggle. There's no helping it if you didn't know, and I'm right as rain now. I will pay close attention while you are away. If there are any omens I shall visit your dreams to warn you. That was one familiar ability I wasn't all that keen on. Last time he deigned to visit my dreams I'd been having a particularly embarrassing one. Just knock first, okay? Only if you bring my meal out to the barn tonight. You're really not coming inside? I carried Gus over to the raised planter where weed snaked up through a mature rosemary bush and set him down gently. In your grandma's current state, I fear her hex magic more than the threat of the Carringtons. Gus wasn't wrong. Grandma certainly didn't earn her place on the Arcane Council by being a sweet old lady, and if she suspected for a minute that a Carrington had hexed her granddaughter, there'd be a bloody feud for years to come. Chapter 3 Flying to Australia meant a California stopover. I passed the two hours pacing inside the airport, hoping fervently neither Damon nor his dad were heading on a business trip somewhere. But nothing sinister happened, though I took the stairs instead of escalators and was pretty sure the molded plastic seats couldn't do me any permanent damage. By the time I got to Melbourne I never wanted to see another plane again. It didn't escape me that I'd be doing the trip again in a week's time, but I chose to ignore that fact and instead cursed myself for not reckoning with the different seasons on the other end of the globe. Wasn't Australia supposed to be hot? The rain outside the airport's windows came down in icy sheets, 
and people huddled in coats while waiting for cabs. Great. I was pretty sure there was only one just-in-case sweater in my luggage. After collecting my suitcase and wandering around looking for the car rental place for an age, I finally got to the booth and filled in forms for a teeny tiny Hyundai, which the attendant pointed out with a click of the key fob. I gave her a tired smile as she wished me a good trip down under and smothered a yawn as I wheeled my suitcase out of the relative warmth of the airport and into the rain. By the time I got my suitcase in the trunk my t-shirt was wet through, and I grimaced as I approached the left side of the car. Then a sudden realization dawned on me, and the shiver down my spine had nothing whatsoever to do with the cold. Somewhere in the back of my mind I always knew Australians drove on the wrong side of the road. But it wasn't until I stared at the steering wheel on the right-hand side that I considered what that meant for this trip. Not only was I going on my first road trip since the accident, this one would be completely back to front. I felt like a complete idiot. Rain dripped down my forehead onto my nose, and I gave myself a shake before hustling to the other side of the car. I climbed in, shut the door, and then sat staring at the dash trying to will myself to calm. Who even went overseas before looking into that kind of thing? I was surprised I had the presence of mind to check if my cell phone data would still work, like the internet might not even exist in the romanticized version of Australia that I'd envisaged. I certainly hadn't run into a kangaroo or a koala yet, or even one of those funny hats with corks Aussies were supposed to wear. It was just another city, even if the air held notes of pungent eucalyptus which was like a minty kind of camphor. I turned on the ignition woodenly and began tapping at the screen on the dash to bring up the GPS. The car journey at least I'd checked ahead of time, and after bringing up the route it looked familiar to the pins I'd dropped on my phone. Three hours. I hoped the rain would let up if the roads were going to be slippery. I blinked as the system began yammering at me and took a few deep breaths before taking the parking brake off. I could do this. Left side of the road is all. It was my own fault for not thinking about the practical stuff. Usually I was the more pragmatic witch in the family. But with the hothouse of emotions back home, I kept my head firmly in the sand or soil so to speak. Beneath me, the pedals were in the right order, and I loosened a little, knowing I wouldn't hit the accelerator while looking for the brakes. Inching out of the parking space, I swung out into the car park and followed the line of cars leaving, mindful of which lane I needed to head in the right direction. Traffic seemed backed up despite being close to noon, which was okay with me as I got my bearings, but once I'd turned onto the highway headed north, the speed of the nearby motorists picked up. I nearly had a heart attack when I saw the white sign that read 100 denoting the speed limit. It took me a second to register that it meant kilometers and not miles. I checked the dash as I accelerated, and after merging, stuck to a moderate 90 and stayed in the furthermost left lane. A couple of people went around me with a sweeping stink eye, but I wasn't going to sweat it. The rain was persistent, if not heavy, and if the trip was going to take hours, being careful would be prudent. It was about half an hour into my trip before I felt brave enough to hit buttons on the stereo for a local radio station. By that time, the traffic had cleared enough that I could breathe easy. The accents blaring through the speakers sounded alien, but somewhat familiar as I realized Aunt Tabby had adopted some of the inflections. She had lived most of her adult life there, after all. Not wanting to dwell on thoughts of my aunt and become teary behind the wheel, I turned up the volume and appreciated the views as suburban homes turned to open green fields with cows and sheep grazing, much the same as they did back home. So much for the pictures of desert scapes and red dirt. The hours passed, marked by directions given in a bland digital voiceover, and I groaned in relief when I spotted a green sign ahead with Myrtle Glen marked as 40 kilometers away. I was finally getting close, and it was only another ten minutes before I turned off the highway and onto a more rural-feeling country road. Farm stores with tractors became more frequent, with the occasional boatyard showcasing shiny speedboats like cars. Aunt Tabitha lived near the river, as I recalled, which would be the first body of water I'd seen since leaving the city. Glad to slow down as I approached the town, 
I perked up from my travel-induced lethargy and wriggled in my seat to peer over the wheel at the historic buildings I passed. They were cute as buttons. The older-looking homes dotted in between, often as not, had manicured gardens along with a sign marking them as B and B's, a tourist town then. I knew from memory that Aunt Tabby lived out of town on a big parcel of land, and I sighed a little wistfully at the bakery I passed. I could use something to eat but was too tired to stop. What I needed was a nap on the couch. I could explore later. The town seemed to disappear in my rear view just as soon as it appeared, and the roads became narrow, littered with potholes and crumbling tarmac on the shoulders. I had to get all the way over onto the orange gravel as a car came in the other direction, and the GPS told me the next turn would take me to my destination. Finally. But after turning onto the road, a streak of brown came bounding over the grassy curb and across my path. I hit the brakes and screeched. The car fishtailed before grinding to a halt. The kangaroo stopped on the other side of the road to stare at me, looking completely nonplussed by the near miss. My heart hammered, and flashes of memory accompanied by a stab of sharp pain in my arm. The torturous seconds before impact as I pumped the brake pedal frantically, my beat-up old van swerving as if of its own volition, crunching into the tree before everything went black. I gripped the steering wheel with sweaty palms and swallowed, the sound of my heartbeat deafening in my ears. Not willing to continue until the kangaroo had moved on, we eyed each other in a ludicrous Mexican standoff. Finally, the critter resumed chewing on the strands of grass hanging out of his mouth and hopped up and over a wire fence into an adjacent property. Willing my muscles to relax, I eased off the brakes and drove slowly down the dusty lane, keeping my eye out for a number 86. There didn't appear to be any mailboxes present, but the occasional number either painted or nailed into a post marked each property. The houses were set back from the road, mostly low bungalow shapes obscured by rangy trees. It wasn't until I got to the end of the no-through laneway that I spotted the twin driveways, one with a house almost butting into the gravel, and the other further off into the distance, barely a smear of white behind a wall of greenery. A woman in a raincoat with the hood pulled up over her head came into view around the side of the closer house, with what looked like a shovel in her hand. Beverly, the neighbor, I hoped. She appeared to be pottering away in the garden despite the weather, and I thought for a minute that I'd found a kindred spirit. But the ordered rows of rose bushes and perennial flowers reminded me of Blanche Baker's garden back home. And the scowl the woman wore as she stared at the car bore a striking resemblance. To be fair, I'd come to a stop and was looking at her from my rental car, so I took a deep breath and unbuckled my seat belt before climbing out to wave. Beverly, I called, trotting over to the house like I could avoid the drizzling rain if I kept moving. I'm Cat Crow, I'm here on behalf of. Tabitha's niece? I was wondering when you'd show up. Setting the shovel against the side of the house, Beverly pursed her lips and rummaged in her coat pocket. I've got the keys to the house right here. Oh. It wasn't even the lukewarm welcome that mom had warned me about. The woman had to be grandma's age at least, and beneath the hood of her coat I glimpsed a close cap of silver curls. Her voice sounded clipped for an Australian, like snippy was her permanent tone. Maybe grandma should have made the trip. I appreciate you taking the trouble of minding things until I arrived. Your aunt made sure I had emergency contact details. Just in case you know, I haven't picked up any mail, You'll have to go to the post office for that, but I can have Simon drop in tomorrow to talk to you. Simon? I cocked my head, and Beverly gave an impatient shake of her head. The real estate agent. It's just lucky there's already an offer on the house. The coroner will be a while, believe me, I've been through that nonsense before, but there's no need to hang around for that. The offer on the house was news to me, but I only smiled and took the keys, which Beverly jingled at me and nodded politely. Thanks again. Beverly looked me up and down, probably noticing my t-shirt getting soaked for a second time in a day. Best get out of the rain. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Well, 
and here I thought the people in Australia were supposed to be a friendly sort. Climbing back into my rental with another smile, I tried to focus on Aunt Tabby's house as I coasted past Beverly, though the woman's grim stare didn't escape me as I passed. Realtors and collecting mail aside, I'd spent around 24 hours of straight traveling, and all I could think about was turning in, even if it was only afternoon. Chapter 4 I woke, if you could call it that, in the guest bedroom of Aunt Tabby's house, my mind thick with jet lag and disoriented with the darkness outside the window. Rather than trying to find a light switch in an unfamiliar room, I reached for my phone on the dresser and recoiled at the blinding light as I glimpsed the time. 4 a.m. Awesome. Sleeping for 12 hours probably wasn't all that bad after such a long journey, but it was unlike me to get any more than six or seven hours of sleep in a night. My needy bladder had evidently broken through my coma-like state, and though I was blessedly warm under the covers, I rolled over to plant my feet on smooth timber floorboards. Then I held my phone out to light my way to the bathroom, promising myself a strong cup of tea as I smacked parched lips. After pulling open the green-painted kitchen cupboards, I found some tea canisters and gave each loose-leaf blend a sniff. A smile tugged at my lips as I recognized notes of citrus in one and recalled Aunt Tabby's fondness of lemon in her tea. Perhaps in honor of her memory, I spooned some of the blend into a strainer and filled a delicate white teapot from the more ordinary electric kettle on the counter. By the time I took my first sip, my mind felt less sluggish, and I flicked on the light in the living room to really see it for the first time. Two plush sofas upholstered in a leafy printed fabric looked like they'd been there for decades, and no fewer than three bookcases sat against the wallpapered walls, with an assortment of books and knick-knacks crowded in, mostly printed with motivational quotes in curly fonts. The television looked prehistoric, and I snickered as I sat, wondering if she had even used it much. Picking up the phone without putting me on hold or suddenly hanging up was an exercise in patience whenever I called, and I'd only ever attempted a video call with her once. But despite never having visited, the room and what I'd seen of the house absolutely felt like her. I took another healthy gulp of tea, the blend conjuring fond memories of Aunt Tabby at Christmas time when she came home every year. Noticing a blank postcard on the coffee table, I picked it up and peered at the scene, not unlike the view outside. It read Discover Australia and for a moment I wondered who it was intended for, and whether they were expecting a note from Aunt Tabby that they'd never receive. I placed it back with a sigh and blinked misty eyes. I'd held the woman in awe as a child when she warned us against accidents or told us to secure a gate that we'd left open before one of our critters could get loose, and she was the only person in the world who didn't bother stepping lightly around Grandma. Sometimes I thought it was Grandma who stepped lightly around her. And every time she started talking about her life in Australia, I promised I would come visit someday. But life got... busy. If I'd suspected even for a second that she didn't have long to live, I would have dropped everything to make it happen. Staring at my cell phone, I swallowed and sent a message to Mom to let her know I'd arrived safely and apologized for not letting her know sooner. Sometimes it was the people closest to you that you disregarded, and despite the weeks back home being a knock to my pride, I knew I should make more of an effort to keep my loved ones close. Even Grandma. In the silence of the house, the first bird calls in the pre-dawn sounded outside the window, a pleasant burbling unfamiliar to my ears. It was intermittent at first, but after taking a long shower and getting dressed for the day, Echoes of light illuminated the shadows, leaving me to squint at the silhouettes of gum trees beyond the porch. But it was the house I was interested in, and I drifted from room to room with a mug in my hands, as though staring for long enough would somehow unearth the mystery of Aunt Tabby's death. It was an older home, with timber siding painted white, and the decor coming right out of the 70s. Aside from the guest bedroom, and what clearly was my aunt's bedroom, the layout of the single-story house was pretty straightforward. The bedroom decor tended to deep shades of purple and gauze which made it look very fortune-teller. An outdated cramped kitchen, 
adjoining dining area with a round wicker table and glass top, living room, and a bathroom connected to the laundry. I supposed it was just her living there, and the real draw to the place lay outside the glass sliding door onto the back patio. As I inspected the bookcases a little closer, I was surprised to see a framed photograph of a younger Aunt Tabitha in a white dress. Beside her was a man with thick round glasses and a mop of brown hair in a suit. Aunt Tabby had been married when she left Tumbling Springs but had gotten divorced some time after. Billy Waite was his name, as I recalled. Any time he was mentioned back home, Grandma started frothing at the mouth while calling him every name under the sun. But that had all been when I was little, and if I was looking for any clues of foul play in Aunt Tabby's death like Marissa suggested, I doubted a crime of passion involving her ex-husband was likely after thirty-odd years. What I needed to assuage my fears was to speak with the coroner's office, or maybe find some indication that Aunt Tabby knew of her impending death and chose not to tell us about it. I couldn't quite bring myself to go rifling through her drawers just yet, though. Instead, I looked up the local post office on my phone, deciding that a trip to collect mail, followed by a hearty breakfast at the bakery I'd spotted in town, was in order. Thankfully, the post office, or what passed for a general store by the looks, was listed as opening at 6.30 a.m., which wasn't far off. It wasn't in Myrtle Glen itself, but it wouldn't take me far from the road which would take me back into town. Outside, the surroundings were just becoming properly visible, so I went searching for my just-in-case sweater and pulled my boots on before venturing out. I couldn't help but linger though as I glanced at the rental car, then did a full circuit of the house to check out the land. Closer to the road was open green, with trees huddled around the house, but a hundred yards or so away I saw long reeds and glimmers of water. Aunt Tabby had mentioned something about the place being a sanctuary of sorts for birds, with mosquitoes the size of the suckers back home being commonplace. I didn't realize she'd meant a swamp at the time. A crowd of kangaroos grazed off in the distance, and my pleasant surprise turned quickly to irritation as the near miss on the road sprang to mind. I sent a silent plea in their general direction to stay out of my way before returning to the car and pulling out of the long, gravel drive toward the post office. With no further kangaroo incidents, I arrived at the ramshackle building denouncing itself as the milk bar in flaking red paint above the timber-sided structure. If structure was the word for a building that looked less sound than some of the crumbling barns, I avoided going into back home. The siding was on a slight angle, making the facade look completely off-kilter, and the iron on the roof was mostly rust. Nothing but fields surrounded the place, which seemed odd. But folks went in and out with newspapers tucked under their arms, so I shoved my misgivings aside and stepped inside onto the squeaking linoleum floor. It wasn't immediately apparent where the counter was, as mismatched shelves crowding the floor space held a wide variety of items one might find in a general store. One wall held racks for DVD rentals, but in the corner a collection of trinkets caught my attention, and I stepped closer to get a better look. Crystals, dreamcatchers, and all manner of faux supernatural knick-knacks were on display, artfully nestled in bright scarves. Notebooks meant to resemble grimoires sat in stacks, along with dream journals and cookbooks for everyday witchcraft. The nook looked so at odds with the rest of the store it was remarkable, and I fought a smirk as I wondered if the manager realized an in-the-flesh seer had frequented their premises for years. See anything you like. A weathered voice came from behind me, and I turned in surprise. A woman beamed as she looked between me and the curated corner. If I had to place her age, I would have said somewhere in her late sixties, though her graying long hair was streaked with alarming shades of purple and green. She wore a spangly dress with crescent moon patterns and wire-rimmed glasses slumped on the tip of her nose. Ah, hi, I smiled back and offered my hand. I'm Cat Crow, I'm here too. Pick up Tabitha's mail? The woman cocked her head with an arched eyebrow, and though I wondered for a second how she knew that, I quickly realized my accent had given me away. Yeah, I nodded. I'm her niece, her grandniece, I guess. The woman took a deep breath 
and clasped my hand warmly, her eyes emotion-laden. I'm sorry for your loss. Tabitha was an amazing woman, and everyone in Myrtle Glen was shocked to hear she passed. The woman sniffed, then shook her head and made a face. But I'm forgetting myself, I'm Jan. Me and your aunt go way back. Pleased to meet you. I squeezed her hand back, then let my arms dangle at my sides. It seemed a little wrong that this woman was offering her condolences when she likely knew Aunt Tabby better than I did. The family is deeply shocked. Jan took a steadying breath and dragged a finger over her eye. Well, let's get you these letters. The postie doesn't go as far as your aunt's place, so she used to come in every day to collect her mail. Postie? I presumed that meant the postal worker. I followed Jan through the warren of shelves to the back of the store, where a long counter held what looked like a makeshift kitchen on one end, and on the other, stacked packages and small compartments stuffed with envelopes behind the register. Have you just arrived, love? Jan rifled through stacks of mail and made brief eye contact with me. Tabitha said the family came from. Was it the South? Arkansas, I confirmed. I drove up yesterday from the airport. A long trip. John made a sympathetic face. I don't know how Tabitha did it every year. I couldn't stand being cooped up on a plane that long. Neither could I come to think of it. Perhaps a year was long enough to forget how bad the ordeal was. It was fine until I almost crashed into one of your critters. A mighty big kangaroo leaped onto the road at the last second, just as I was getting to the house. Jan cackled, then held her hand to her mouth as if abashed by the outburst. All part of the genuine Aussie experience, love. You should drive your aunt's ute while you're here. She has a sturdy bull bar for that kind of thing. Ute? I frowned. Jan bit her lip with amusement and shook her head. I think you fellas call him trucks. Oh, I hadn't checked the garage yet but supposed a truck was another loose end that I would need to figure out to settle the estate. I don't plan on staying long. I don't suppose you have any advice on how to get rid of a truck quickly? Jan's face dropped a little. Then she cleared her throat. I guess you wouldn't be. Staying, that is. You can put a sign on the door if you're looking to sell it. She paused and pursed her lips. I suppose that estate agent has already been banging down the door. Jan's change in demeanor was a little disconcerting, and I guess the practicalities of dealing with Aunt Tabby's estate was a little on the nose. Beverly said something about sending him around today. Jan snorted, then handed me a stack of mail secured with a rubber band. Well, she would, wouldn't she? But before you go signing on the dotted line, expect a visit from Auntie May. She should have a few words to say on the matter. I have a set of keys for Tabitha's place as well. She left them with me just in case. I stood dumb, wondering how old a woman who Jan deemed an aunt would be, and whether she'd be mobile enough to make house calls. But the silence was uncomfortable as Jan's expression remained icy, so I thanked her after she handed me the keys before scuttling out of the store, trying to figure out what had gotten the woman's goat. Chapter 5 after devouring two, yes, two bacon and egg sandwiches at the bakery in town along with a large coffee, I headed back to the house with a boxed cake smothered with coconut, which I was informed was called a lamington. It made a pleasant change from airplane food and what I'd scrounged out of vending machines between flights. My mind kept returning to my strange conversation with Jan, and I wished I'd known more about this supposed offer on the house before I arrived. There must be a backstory to it all, and with Myrtle Glen being of a size with tumbling springs, I knew what small towns could be like. Everybody sticking their nose in other people's business and thinking they had every right to form a firm opinion on the matter. I reminded myself I was only there to collect the Crow's family relics and wind up Aunt Tabby's affairs. I didn't have time to get to the bottom of a local bruja. With that in mind, the first thing I did after stowing my cake away in the refrigerator and putting on the kettle was head straight to Aunt Tabby's room. I didn't think she'd keep the relics lying around the house, so her boudoir seemed like a safe bet. Getting a good idea of what I was looking for had been a pain in the rear end, with Grandma hunting down old photographs where the relics were, 
unhelpfully, in the background or written accounts of their use. There was one sketch, though, on thick paper with fading ink, where at least a more pragmatic witch in the family had sought to catalogue the collection with the tools available at the time. The conversation with Grandma had ended with me swearing that I would do a proper inventory when I got home, complete with proper photographs and descriptions backed up on the cloud. It was a little fruitless, though, as I was almost certain Grandma didn't know what the cloud meant. I checked my phone again, zooming in on each photograph of the sketches to note subtle details, and wondered where I should start. Aunt Tabby's bed was an old-fashioned four-poster with what looked like ample space underneath. It's where I might have stashed valuables if they didn't give me the heebie-jeebies, so I dropped to the floor and pulled out decaying boxes amid dust bunnies. I was looking for a crystal ball, spectacles, divination dice, a key, a teacup, an old canteen, and ick, a human skull. I protested heartily at the notion of carrying human remains back through the airport when Grandma mentioned that one, but she only muttered about weak constitutions and found a bag, which she assured me would shroud the items effectively from airport security. But the boxes underneath the bed were an assortment of old photo albums and mementos, along with yellowing paperwork and vacuum-sealed bags of clothes. I stacked the paperwork out into the hallway for later perusal, I'd also need to locate a will, and turned my attention to the freestanding mahogany armoire. When I rifled through the clothes, the lingering scent of Aunt Tabby's favorite perfume caught me off guard, and I dropped to the bed, choking down emotion. It took me a few minutes to get my composure back, and I blinked away tears as I studied the clothes on hangers before me. Perhaps I could see why John said they were good friends. One half of the armoire held the regular wardrobe I was used to seeing Aunt Tabby in at Christmas, knitted sweaters and elasticized trousers, with printed blouses which seemed respectable enough for her age. The other put me directly in mind of Jan's spangled dress, with sequins, moody dyes and a mismatch of fabrics from gauzy chiffon to tie-dyed muslin. I pulled out each garment and laid it out over the bed, my mouth twitching with amusement as I tried to picture my aunt wearing them. There was even a pointed hat among the collection, and I wondered if she had a supernatural side hustle that nobody knew about. I'd considered the possibility of Jan being a witch after leaving the post office, or milk bar, but decided that she would have said something if that was the case. I didn't know what the etiquette was in the Australian magical community, but back home we would consider it rude not to formally introduce yourself as a witch to another who was ignorant of your abilities. It was one of the many nuances in a world where magic was hidden from regular folks, and in a global age I couldn't imagine much variation in those customs in different countries. No, Jan was what people back home unkindly termed a magic quack or someone better described as having an enthusiasm for witchcraft with no affinity to the arts. Harmless, if a little annoying, and probably behind the cheesiest of witchy pop culture. After emptying the armoire dresser, bedside cabinets and even rifling through books on a shelf to see if any were hollow, I came up with nothing. I left the mess of Aunt Tabby's room to go through the rest of the house. Given there wasn't much to the humble dwelling, it didn't take a lot of time to ascertain that the relics weren't anywhere in the house. It was the guest room that I pulled apart last, and aside from a cupboard shelf that appeared absent of anything at all, perhaps left for actual guests, there was nowhere that looked a likely spot. I lay back on the guest bed in frustration and glared at the ceiling. The relics better not be up in the roof space, I did not want to introduce myself to what I'd heard were formidable spiders while crawling around up there, or underneath the house for that matter. But unless Aunt Tabby had stopped using the relics completely, it didn't make any sense that they'd be kept in such an inconvenient location. There was one part of the property that I hadn't checked out though, so I heaved myself up with a sigh to fetch the house keys from the kitchen counter. The garage was all metal and a good fifty yards from the house, with a carriage turned for cars planted out with what looked like native species. I hadn't spotted a single plant that I was familiar with in the garden surrounding the house, and kept meaning to check the greenhouse, which looked as though it had seen better days. 
Aunt Tabby had always admired the garden back home, so I assumed she had at least a bit of interest in gardening herself, but it wasn't immediately clear from what I'd seen. Perhaps she had more of a mind for respecting the local ecology, which I supposed was a notion I could get behind. The roller door to the garage was locked and protested mightily as I heaved it up. I had to really dig my heels in to get it going, and after it eventually sprang up out of the way, I puffed my cheeks to survey the dim interior. As I fumbled for a light switch, a slight vibration through my fingertips was the only warning I got as the roller door crashed back down, missing me by an inch as I jumped out of the way and into the now dark garage. A familiar mixture of fear, anger and indignation rolled through me, and I bunched my fists at my sides. So much for outrunning a hex. There was no way a roller door could have put up that much of a fuss going up, only to come down like a primed guillotine seconds later. My bad luck had followed me. I just counted myself lucky that so far all I'd suffered were broken bones. Perhaps my hopes that after the crash things would settle down were misguided. If these accidents didn't let up soon, I'd need to fess up to Grandma and be prepared to live with the idea of instigating a feud which might last generations. After locating the light switch and finding a length of lumber for my intended purpose, I heaved the door up again and braced it. I'd have to duck to get back out again, but that was preferable until I came up with a safer solution. Having made it through a three-hour car trip on the wrong side of the road in rainy conditions, I'd have never guessed it would be a roller door that could have spelled my doom. Turning my attention to the contents of the garage, the first thing that caught my attention was a dirty, old yellow truck with a faded Toyota imprint on the back. As promised, a heavy-duty bull bar protruded from the front, though I had a hard time imagining my aunt seeing over the top of the wheel. Somehow I always pegged her as a sedan type, but could see the allure of a bigger vehicle given the hazardous wildlife, not unlike deer back home. Beyond that were shelves and cabinets, so I made a mental note to look for the car keys later and resumed my domestic relic hunting, which only yielded further frustration. Besides decades' worth of accumulated junk and basic tools, there wasn't any sign of the magical items. Then I located the key for another armoire in the back, this cabinet with faded varnish and standing with a decided lean. Inside I thought I must have hit the jackpot, but as I pulled out long scarves, tarot cards, and a faux crystal ball, the strange clothes inside started making a little sense. A fortune teller's get-up? Maybe Aunt Tabby made a few extra dollars going around to carnivals and telling people their fake except not fake fortune. The notion tickled me as I pictured people rolling their eyes and secretly thinking she was a fraudster and a rogue. If only they knew. My wave of amusement didn't last long as I conceded that the relics weren't there either. I'd looked in every likely location for the relics and got bubkis. Some tomb raider I was. Running my hands over my scalp, I checked in the truck in case they were there, but after going through all the keys Beverly had given me, I couldn't locate the one I needed. Darn it. I gritted my teeth. Maybe she forgot to give me those ones. I ducked to get under the roller door and headed toward the not-so-friendly neighbor's house. The wire fence around the property looked strange from the back, like a perfectly snipped parcel of land taken from Aunt Tabby's larger holding, and I found the woman without her raincoat kneeling in a patch of petunias. Hi there, I called, waving as I approached. I must say your garden is lovely, and it's no surprise with you tending it so carefully. Beverly looked up from her work with a hostile stare, and I held back a sigh as my gracious words did little to improve the woman's demeanor. It's no thanks to that wild dog Tabitha kept. I should have told you yesterday to call the council if it turns up. Animal control should do something about it. Wild dog? I cocked my head. I haven't seen one. Your aunt never did either, supposedly. But I saw those two together from time to time. It makes a habit of destroying the garden every few months. This conversation wasn't going well, so I decided to simply ask the question I needed to and back away slowly after that. You wouldn't by chance have a set of keys to Aunt Tabby's truck, would you? They weren't on the set for the house. No, that's all I had. 
Beverly arched an eyebrow in an is that all expression, and I swallowed. Okay, thanks then. I'll have another look around. You do that. Beverly nodded as if that settled it, and I took my cue to skedaddle back to the house. How Aunt Tabby had abided the woman was beyond me, but I made a mental note to look out for a wild dog. Maybe I could find it a new home before the woman could get a shotgun out and brutalize the poor thing in one of her garden beds. Chapter 6 With no relics, no truck keys, and a house that was a mess of rifled through things, I put my focus on something that may yield actual results for the day. My stomach churned at the notion of the missing relics having something to do with Aunt Tabitha's death, and there was one way I could get a little assurance on the matter. I looked up the number to the coroner's office and called to let them know I'd be handling things. Tabitha Crow. Ah, uh, yes. I heard the person on the other line tapping away on the keyboard looking up the details. You're her next of kin? I'm her great-niece, but I'm in Australia on behalf of the family, so I can relay all the information back to my grandma, her sister, back home. Okay, well what I can tell you at the moment is that we are in the process of determining the cause of death for your aunt, but there is no need for concern. There is no police investigation or sign of injuries. We have done a few tests, but the coroner would like to perform an autopsy to be able to provide a definite medical cause. Most families. Okay, I cut in, feeling a little squeamish about the idea of autopsies, whatever you have to do, but no investigation at all? Was there anything that came back in the tests? I'm afraid they only paint a small part of the picture, but we were able to eliminate a number of causes, and nothing stood out that was concerning. Oh, I was sure that was supposed to be a good thing, but it didn't feel like it for some reason. My mind wandered to whether the hex looming over my head extended to my kin, but I gave myself a shake to banish the thought. When do you think we can get her back? The funeral will be back in Arkansas where she was born. The woman stepped me through the process, and we exchanged contact information so she could send through some forms via email. It didn't seem like it would be sorted out in under a week though, and I was a touch relieved given the problem of the relics. That I couldn't find them was gnawing at me, so I found a flashlight and a ladder to check the roof space and under the house. Thankfully, I didn't have to go crawling around in the dirt or through the cobwebs, the flashlight confirmed there were no boxes stashed away in either location. On the small chance they were in the greenhouse, or a dilapidated structure which seemed for that purpose, I checked that too and was surprised to find orderly plant stands with more familiar wilting greenery. A flash of indignation warmed my cheeks. Beverly was hardly the neighbor of the year, but I would have thought she of all people would have seen fit to water the garden. After checking to make sure there weren't any boxes or places where the relics may be stashed, I ran back to the house to locate a hose and dragged it to the greenhouse. It was a treasure trove of witchy specimens, from comfrey and sage through to heather and wormwood. I gave them all a good long soak tutting over the state of some which looked close to perishing. It seemed Aunt Tabby had a use for green magic after all, even if some of the pots would have done better out in direct sunlight. After shutting off the hose, the sound of crunching gravel kept me from returning to tend to the plants. A flashy, blue SUV crawled up the driveway, and I dusted off my hands on my jeans as I puzzled over who it was. When a guy climbed out of the car wearing a navy suit and a wide smile, though, I connected the dots. The realtor Beverly mentioned, and was he getting a gift basket out of the back? I tracked over to the car and smiled graciously, wondering if I should invite him into the mess that was my aunt's ransacked house. Hi there, I thrust my hands in my pockets. You must be. Simon. The realtor's smile was alarmingly wide, with teeth that shone a white so brilliant it was clear he spent an inordinate time doing whitening treatments. Simon Flagstaff with Flagstaff Real Estate. Mrs. Norris called to let me know that you had arrived. Cat Crow, is it? I looked past him to spot Beverly in her garden. Beverly Norris, apparently. She had pruners in her hand and a trying-to-seem-busy look about her. 
Ah, yeah, I'm Tabitha's grandniece. I'm so sorry for your loss, Miss Crow. Do you mind if I call you Cat? His smile was a little smarmy, but I shrugged in acquiescence. I understand you've had to come all the way from the States to wind up your aunt's estate. Our office wanted to make sure you had everything you needed for your stay. He handed over the gift basket, filled with what looked like takeout pans. From our local restaurant, Sabine's. That was. Pretty considerate. There was even a bottle of red wine tucked in the side. Thank you. I hadn't even thought about doing the groceries just yet. Of course. Simon rested a hand on my shoulder and made a sympathetic face. I had to remind myself the man had come bearing gifts before I scuttled away with a hiss. It must be very daunting dealing with all this so far from home. Your aunt was highly regarded in Myrtle Glen, and we're all sorry that she's gone. Something about his tone was really off. Maybe it was the fact he looked not that much older than me, forty tops, and was talking like I was some kid. I slid out from under his comforting hand and sat the basket down on the outdoor patio set. I was not inviting him in. Thank you for your concern. I understand there was an offer on the house. I folded my arms and cocked my head. When Simon visibly relaxed some, probably because I was the one to bring up the tacky issue of currency, I regretted not stringing him along. All very bad timing, yes, he chanced to smile. Or perhaps good timing, depending on how you see it. I suppose you're looking forward to getting back home, and I have a very motivated buyer. Simon held up a finger and opened his passenger side door to pull out a leather folio embossed with a gilded FR. He opened it with practiced ease and retrieved a fancy-looking pen with a click. Now my apologies for sounding crass, but do you happen to know who the beneficiary is for your aunt's estate? That was a little crass, but practical I supposed when dealing with legal documents. It had me stumped for a second, having not located a will yet, but I gave over the most logical answer. Her next of kin would be my grandma. They were sisters. Uh-huh. And her name? Sybil Crow. Do you mind if I? Simon waved at the patio set, and I nodded and sat across from him at the mosaic finished table. With his folio spread out in front of him, my nose twitched as I tried to guess at the delicious smells coming from the basket. I'm guessing you can pass on the offer to your grandmother? Sure, I wondered what grandma would make of the guy but pushed away the thought, though I imagine things will get a little messy while we wait on all the paperwork to come through. Our office will do anything we can to help. He looked up from his papers and flashed a smile. We have the best local solicitors at our disposal and we're happy to cover any legal costs until it can be deducted out of the settlement. Motivated indeed. But if there was an offer on the table before Aunt Tabby died, I wanted to know why she wasn't selling. Can I ask how long this offer has been sitting? I planted a sweet smile on my face, and why my aunt hadn't accepted. Simon held his features in a polite smile, though the flash of irritation didn't escape me. There was a story there, and I was getting mighty interested in figuring out what it was. The buyer approached us about a year ago. We've been in talks since then. Of course there's been some negotiation but you know, some older people are reluctant to downsize. It's a big transition for them, and it's not unusual for these kinds of sales to take some time. I frowned at the house. Downsize? From a small two-bedroom bungalow, the next step down would be a studio apartment, if there even were any of those in a place as small as Myrtle Glen. But Simon pointed to the yard where water met land, two hundred acres, it's a lot of land to keep up, and with the river frontage. River. I twisted and squinted at the reeds, looks like a swamp. There's a direct inlet from the river on the far side. Simon pointed, but I could only see trees in the distance. And the buyer? I frowned, wondering what the draw was exactly. The developer. Simon cleared his throat, and I spun back to watch him closely, with a proposal to turn this place into a holiday park for people to enjoy. A what now? I screwed up my face. Simon smiled a little wider, as if that could convince him of his sincerity. 
we Aussies flock to the water during peak holiday seasons, and the Murray River is a prime destination. Now, Myrtle Glen is in a time of transition but across the border. He pointed in the direction of the river. Most of the land within a spit of water has been developed with holiday homes and parks. It brings in a lot of tourism and prosperity, and people are turning to this side of the river to see what opportunities there are for the locals. Simon nudged a brochure across the table, and I picked it up to stare at it. A holiday park appeared to be a mix of trailers, people in tents, and cabins, along with pools and playgrounds for kids. Two hundred acres seemed apt for that kind of enterprise, except... Isn't it a bit boggy here for that kind of thing? Simon waved a hand as if it were of no consequence. There's ways around that. With some solid groundwork, the inlet can be turned into a boat ramp and the land will become workable. Aha. I was starting to understand why Aunt Tabby had refused. Right. Well, I'll be sure to get the offer to Grandma for you. He loosened a little and beamed as he handed me an envelope. Much appreciated. My card is in there, and if there's anything at all you need... I'll call. I stood and smiled back, and taking that as a cue, Simon stood to offer his hand. I shook it, reminding myself to be polite, and was glad to see the back of his shiny SUV as he drove away. Aunt Tabby hadn't spent all those years on this property for it to get turned into some kind of trumped-up trailer park. I was sure she would turn in her grave at the notion of dozers coming in to flatten the house and tear up her bird sanctuary. A black and white bird swooped down from a nearby tree to land on the chair that Simon had sat in. And I startled. It made that strange burbling trill I'd heard in the morning. And I chuckled in delight. The bird cocked its head at me as though it was waiting for something, then sprang into the air again and away into the trees. Heaving a deep breath, I tore open the envelope to look over the letter of offer, and my breath caught at the number of zeros on the page. Either my dyscalculia, difficulty with numbers, was playing up again, or Aunt Tabby was sitting on an unlikely gold mine. And money made people do unconscionable things, didn't it? Chapter 7 what do you mean they're gone? I squinted at my cell phone, and Marissa's perfectly painted face creased with concern. Rubbing my hand across my face, I sat up and yawned. The house was still dark at 6 a.m. I mean, I've torn this place apart and still can't find them. This is bad. I carried the phone to the kitchen and set it on the counter as I put the kettle on. Tell me about it. There isn't one place I haven't looked, or one scrap of evidence to suggest a witch lived here, aside from some weird fortune-teller stuff lying around. I knew I should have come with you, I saw Marissa pouting, despite her view being of the ceiling. I picked up the phone and scratched my head. Today I'll go through every scrap of paper in the house. Maybe there's some kind of security box at the bank or even a storage place she might have used. What witch on earth would leave magical items at those kinds of places? Marisa shook her head. I've got a bad feeling about all this. If Aunt Tabby died and her relics have disappeared, we could be looking at something sinister. Who had access to the house before you got there? Um, the neighbor, real unfriendly sort, and the woman at the post office had a spare set of keys, but... Have you asked them about the relics? Marissa's voice was a little frenzied, and I felt obliged to try to placate her, even if I was just as concerned. I haven't had a chance. I'll ask around about them. The post office lady seemed a little kooky with a whole lot of spiritual stuff at her store. A magic quack? Marissa groaned. See? People like that do all kinds of crazy stuff. Maybe she helped herself to what she thought she was entitled to. I don't know. I bit my lip, trying to picture Jan sneaking into the house, but given her reaction to Beverly, it would take a fair amount of gumption to do something that bold. I can ask the neighbor if she saw anyone at the house. That woman is always outside in her garden. I doubt anything escapes her. Sounds like you two should be friends, 
Marissa's expression told me she was teasing, and I arched a tart eyebrow at her. Oh, please, it's like Mrs. Baker's back home. All ornamental plants in orderly rows as though they wouldn't dare sprout a leaf out of line. Marissa rolled her eyes. You know, you're the only person I know who talks about plants like they're people. It was a conversation we had often, so I changed the subject. When are you heading off? Our flight leaves tonight. Marissa broke into a grin. It's going to be so beautiful. After the wedding, it'll just be me and Jake in the big city for an entire week. Well, you just be kind to his credit card, I quipped as I filled the teapot and rubbed my eyes. Not a chance, Marissa laughed. Hey, did you get that offer from the realtor Grandma was talking about? Ah, yeah, I was hoping not to bring that up so soon, having similar misgivings as Aunt Tabby. Except I know why she wasn't selling. Oh? I propped the phone on the dining table against a vase filled with dried flowers and sat to retrieve the letter of offer from the envelope. They plan on dozing through the swamp to turn it into proper river frontage for some kind of trailer park. Marisa only looked puzzled, and I rolled my eyes. Don't you remember Aunt Tabby talking about the place as a wildlife sanctuary? Marisa nodded slowly, though I doubted she did. More often she was bugging our aunt about who she'd marry when she grew up and how many designer shoes she'd own in her lifetime. I guess. How much were they offering? I fumbled with my phone to switch the camera around and held it above the letter so she could see for herself. I'd counted the digits that many times my eyes hurt, then plugged it into a currency converter to see how much it dwindled once it got to greenback. It was still a lot of money. Wow. That's a small fortune. But that only makes it more suspicious, don't you think? I dragged my hand over my face and groaned. My cousin had an enthusiasm for bad TV which might have accounted for her questioning. What on earth have you been watching lately? Come on, think about it. She refuses to sell, and the buyer goes a little cray-cray. Money is a powerful motivator. The coroner's office said there was nothing to suggest it was murder. I poured myself a cup of tea and took a blessed sip. But they haven't got a cause of death yet, either. My concern is if the relics have been stolen, could there be something magical at play? That wouldn't exactly come back in a blood test, but I'm not sure that anyone around here is a witch or warlock. Maybe it was too early in the morning, but I regretted laying out my fear as soon as I said the words. Marisa didn't need encouragement, and the family didn't need to get in a tailspin over a worst-case scenario. Exactly. Marissa got closer to the camera, her eyes widening. Surely they've got inquisitors in Australia. Grandma can pull a few strings and... No, I shook my head. For all we know, she could have buried the relics somewhere and all that happened was a heart attack. You're in over your head, Cat, Marissa warned, and if you come home empty-handed, Grandma will be pissed. I'll find them, I promised. If you let me take a darn shower in peace and let me get to work. Marissa rolled her eyes theatrically. Fine. I should go do some packing anyhow. That a girl, I teased. You'll need at least twenty outfits if you're in New York for a week. Not if I plan on going shopping. Marissa gave an impish grin, and I sent a silent prayer for Jake. I'll talk to you later. After getting off the call and rubbing my eyes, I stared at the letter of offer again. It couldn't hurt to look into this buyer, so I did a search for the company online and dug a little deeper for the owner's name. It turned out George and Tina Munro owned a whole chain of holiday parks across Australia, but they were also pictured on the other side of the continent on the same night of Aunt Tabby's death at some charity event. So much for that. I doubted they knew much about my aunt beyond the dimensions of the land they sought to acquire. In Jan. Well, she seemed genuinely upset about Aunt Tabby's death. It was possible she might have been interested in the relics and moved to hold on to them as mementos, but I could check with Beverly about any visitors to the house. And from what I'd seen of the neighbor I doubted she likewise had an interest in a bunch of junk, unless she thought they were valuable. 
I decided on a shower, and after getting cleaned up, took my tea tray and the first box of paperwork outside to the patio set. The bird song and golden hues of dawn put me in better cheer, and I rifled through old bills and the paper trail of Aunt Tabby's life. I learned she used to work for the local government, something to do with historical preservation, from what I could make out. There were also old petitions lying around for environmental causes and the receipt for her truck, which she'd bought brand new close to two decades ago. While it was an interesting venture into her past, it wasn't helping me with the problem of where she might have kept the relics, and I recalled the unopened mail sitting on the kitchen counter. I went to fetch it, and after tearing open the first letter came close to spraying a mouthful of tea all over the page. Aunt Tabby had a bank account balance to rival the offer on the house, yet the woman always insisted her magic didn't help with lottery tickets. I was prepared to call bulldust on that. The subsequent bills for utilities didn't faze me, but there was nothing else of use in the stack of mail. I shook my head a little ruefully at the thought of Aunt Tabby casually dismissing the offer on the house as unsubstantial and peered up toward the waterline. It didn't seem right that I hadn't gone off to explore since arriving and being out amongst nature usually helped if I had something troubling me. In the past few minutes dawn had turned to early morning light, so I grabbed my boots from inside the doorway and laced them up. A shiver of excitement ran up my spine at the thought of immersing myself in a new world of greenery, and I had a spring in my step as I crossed the open green toward a lone park bench which sat on the waterline. A sign stood beside it, though, and I frowned as I read it. The Murray River holds cultural significance for Aboriginal people, but its wetlands hold a bounty of edible plants and freshwater fish, which made them a sustainable source of food for thousands of years. Huh. My first thought was perhaps the sign had been there before Aunt Tabby bought the place, but it looked too new. It seemed strange that she would have installed something like that herself. I kept wandering around the shoreline and found similar signs dotted around in various locations. The water looked deeper in some parts and like mud pits in others, but I spotted a small john boat tethered by a makeshift dock and thrust my hands in my pockets against the cold as I made my way toward it. The native plants piqued the curiosity of my green thumb. Their shades of green were lighter than what I was used to back home, but brilliant flashes of yellow and red from flowers made the swamp seem alive with color. Each gentle breeze brought an intoxicatingly exotic scent toward me, and I lamented that I wouldn't have time to properly examine everything. The property was fenced to go around the water, opening up from the narrow strip up the front to a wide section at the back, where I assumed a crowd of trees marked the border. Natural island-like land formations poked up above the water here and there, and I thought I saw a dog-shaped blur passing by on one of them. A particularly big blur. Wondering whether it might be something other than a stray, maybe one of those dingoes people talked about, I tracked back to try to get a better look, but only saw ripples in the water. I should probably have taken the boat out to have a look, but I didn't fancy chasing after a wild animal across unfamiliar waters. Beverly might have been right about animal control. I decided if the creature came up to the house of its own volition, it might have been a wayward pet. As I continued my walk, the neighboring property caught my attention as a large structure came into view. I thought from a distance it was an overly large barn, but up close it was unmistakably a greenhouse. Curiosity got the better of me, and I drifted to the wire fence to look. The panes on the outside of the metal structure were an opaque white, preventing me from seeing what was inside, but as I was staring, a woman with a wheelbarrow full of fresh-cut flowers emerged from the side, and my cheeks burned as she spotted me. She probably thought I was some kind of creep, but I told myself to stay put when she waved and headed toward me. I waved back, a kind of weak gesture, and tried to come up with a logical reason for lurking on the boundary line. Hi, the woman looked somewhere in her mid-thirties, with a baseball cap over a strawberry blonde braid. The rubber boots she wore were liberally caked in dirt, but she wore a broad grin and didn't seem affronted by my appearance. You must be Tabitha's niece. Jan told me you'd gone by the milk bar. She'd reached the fence and stuck her hand over the wire, 
and I took it with a friendly shake. I'm Kelly. We're all really sorry about what happened. Thank you. I'm Kat. Sorry, I was just having a proper look around and noticed your greenhouse. Didn't mean to look like I was snooping. Kelly's eyes lit up as she glanced back at the greenhouse and shook her head as if it were of no consequence. I grow wholesale flowers for a living. I'd meant to leave you a bouquet yesterday but got caught up with the kids. Kelly pointed, and I saw two small shapes bouncing on a trampoline by the house. I smiled and shrugged. No problem at all. It's nice to meet you. You're here to wind everything up, I guess. Kelly screwed up her face. We weren't sure what the family planned on doing. It's just. Well, I also wanted to invite you to the barbecue we're hosting on the weekend. For Tabitha, you know. It took a couple of seconds to understand what she meant. Ah, like a memorial service. Kelly's cheeks colored, making the freckles on her nose stand out. Pretty presumptuous, I know. I guess we assumed you guys would do your own thing back in the States. Tabitha had a lot of friends here, so we thought it would be nice to get together to remember her. Of course. I held up my hand, more than a little abashed for not considering the people on this side of the pond who had every right to grieve. I completely understand. I'd love to come. Fantastic. One of the kids let out a squeal and she winced. I better go sort that out before it turns into World War III. Saturday at lunchtime, yeah? Sure thing. But Kelly, have you seen any wild dogs around? I swear I just saw one out in the swamp. I jerked my thumb over my shoulder. Might want to be careful with the kids outside. Kelly frowned and tugged gardening gloves off her hands. Probably just a kangaroo. Never seen any dogs around. None that have come onto my property, anyway. She tapped her temple with a wink. Don't take Beverly too seriously. She's harmless but is always looking for something to be outraged about. I couldn't help but snort. So, it wasn't only me that the woman was uppity toward, but then the kids started hollering again and Kelly made a face. Sorry about this. Those two do nothing but bicker all day. I'll see you later, hey? I nodded with a smile as she trudged over to the house with a kind of grim determination. It was a shame she had to take off so quickly. I got good vibes from Kelly, and perhaps she could clue me in to the political undercurrent of the small town of Myrtle Glen, and what those funny plaques around the swamp were about. I got a feeling I was going to put my foot in it as I went around asking questions about the relics, and that I didn't know the half of it when it came to this property sale. Chapter 8 the next course of action I'd meant to take was to stop by Beverly's to ask about anyone at the house, but I didn't see her outside, and I was reluctant to bang on her door. The next logical step was to at least report the items as missing to the police in case they were at some local pawn shop. Or maybe see if a potential theft might tempt them into investigating Aunt Tabby's death. I warred with my feelings over it as I drove into town, wondering why I was angling at something like that. It wasn't like I wanted my aunt's death to be something more sinister than old age or health complications. But I was struggling to make sense of why she hadn't seen that coming. I guess I wanted to really put things to bed and not have her specter hovering over me for the rest of my days. Unfinished business was a little taboo in the magical community, but it was widely accepted that injustices had to be righted before the magical dead could truly rest. Maybe that's why Grandma was so adamant that Aunt Tabby had simply been holding out. It was easier that way. The town of Myrtle Glen was a hive of activity at close to 9 a.m. On a weekday, with the school crossing slowing down traffic and people presumably getting to their place of business. It had me gripping the steering wheel something fierce, convinced I would let my thoughts wander too far and end up on the right-hand side of the road, causing a collision. While I'd done okay so far, driving opposite was still a feat I wasn't sure I'd ever be truly comfortable with, and I looked forward to more familiar roads back home. I hadn't bothered to look up the address for the police department, figuring it couldn't be too hard to find in a town that size, but I spent a little while combing the streets before spotting a blue and white sign on a corner beside the fire service. 
I parked the car, wishing I'd stopped at the bakery to pick up a couple of coffees, then marched up to the door. When I let myself in, I was a little surprised to find nobody sitting at the counter, or anyone else for that matter. Two molded plastic chairs sat by a window looking out onto the street, and I frowned at them before calling out Yoo-Hoo, anyone there? A shadow moved at the back of the hallway leading to what I presumed were offices, and a tall man came into view wearing a navy blue, short-sleeved shirt with a heavy-duty belt on his matching trousers. I glanced at the badge as he approached which read Constable Lewis and smiled. Hi, I'm... Tabitha's niece? I was wondering if you might stop by. I'm Constable Lewis. I knew your aunt growing up around here. I was going to have to get used to the fact that my accent made me stand out, but the officer's smile seemed genuine, and his kind brown eyes made me think he was the good kind of law enforcement. Small town, huh? I chuckled. I'm Cat Crow, and I was hoping I could catch you for a minute. No worries. Constable Lewis waved me ahead and pointed to the right, just the first room there. Can I get you a cuppa? Tea or coffee? Ah, no thanks, I'm fine. I ducked into the room which seemed less like an interview room on TV and more like a lounge. I perched on the edge of a sofa, and Constable Lewis turned a chair around to face me before sitting. He seemed a little young, and perhaps a touch uncomfortable as he cleared his throat and blinked. Then, Rubbing his knees he spoke first, and I smiled politely, wondering what he had to say to me before I went rent raving about a bunch of heirlooms. Now, I'm not sure how they do things in the States, but I've completed the report for the coroner's office which you can get a copy of with their final report. Have you got their number? I nodded. I've been in touch. You, um, found Aunt Tabby? Constable Lewis scratched the back of his neck and met my eye. Beverly called it in, of course, but I was the first officer on the scene. Beverly, I frowned. Mrs. Norris, the neighbor. Constable Lewis folded his arms as though recalling the events. Your aunt wasn't there long. Beverly had seen Tabitha the day before and had gone over to talk about some dog that morning. She said it was strange for her not to answer the door. A morning person, I suppose, so she looked in through the bedroom window and saw her. My eyes betrayed me as I pictured a lifeless Aunt Tabby, her final moments alone. I sniffed and dragged fingers under my eyes and Constable Lewis stood to fetch a box of tissues from the table. I accepted them gratefully and willed myself to calm as I blew my nose and mopped up my face. I'm sorry, I ventured. It's perfectly fine, her death was a surprise to all of us, she seemed in good health. Constable Lewis swallowed, and I got the distinct impression he had no idea how to handle a weeping woman. But we found nothing to suggest that she was in distress when it happened. If it's any consolation, she seemed peaceful. I wondered if this was the first body the guy had found but rubbed my nose as I willed myself to think of some questions which may actually be useful. Was the house locked? Had anyone been in there? Constable Lewis frowned and narrowed his eyes a little. Well, no, the back door was unlocked, but in a place like Myrtle Glen that isn't a big surprise, it's not like the city, there isn't much by way of crime around here, and people aren't as conscious of stuff like that. And you left the keys with Beverly? I cocked my head, thinking that was a little off. She said she would get them to the family, that she had the phone number, and the news would be better coming from her. I suppose that was factually correct, even if that sounded like something a sweet old lady would say, and not Beverly Norris. From the sheepish look on Constable Lewis' face, I guess that wasn't standard procedure, but I guess the woman cowed him as much as she did me. Aha. Uh -huh. It's just. Well, I'm here on behalf of the family to settle Aunt Tabby's affairs, and there are some family heirlooms that are missing. Heirlooms? Constable Lewis blinked in confusion and when I opened my mouth to speak he held up a finger. Hold on a minute, let me get something to write this down with. I chewed my lip as I waited on the officer, wondering how he came to be the face of law enforcement in Myrtle Glen. He looked young enough to warrant some oversight at a larger department, mid-twenties at the most, 
but perhaps he'd been stationed at this sleepy town because nothing bad usually happened. I just hoped he hadn't missed anything on the scene. Sorry about that. Constable Lewis came back into the room, flipping open a notebook and clicking a ballpoint pen. He pulled up a chair at the table this time, and his features seemed more businesslike than before. So, you'd like to report some valuables as stolen? Uh, I wasn't sure how to respond to that so I moved from the sofa to turn a chair around and sat across from him. More sentimental, I suppose. Been in the family for generations. Okay, Constable Lewis frowned. Why don't you start with some descriptions? It wasn't until I started rattling off the list that I realized how kooky it sounded. Ah, well let me see. There was a crystal ball with an ornate stand, an antique pair of spectacles, a key carved from bone, an old soldier's canteen, divination dice, twelve-sided of course, a fine china teacup with a painted eye inside, and, um, well, a human skull, carved with symbols. The poor guy's eyes bugged out, and I wondered how I thought coming here was a good idea. So, the fortune-telling thing runs in the family? His nose wrinkled, but I thought he probably wasn't aware of it. Absolutely. I heaved a deep breath and rolled my eyes with a smile. Not sure I put much stock in it myself. But my grandma would be distraught if she finds out they're gone. Right. He tapped the notebook with the pen absently and sucked in a sharp breath through his teeth. So, when did you last see the items? My face fell. Well, I haven't. That's the point. He scratched his head before lacing his fingers on the table. For the police to establish that something has been stolen, it's important to know when they were last seen. The rest of the family are in the States, I'm guessing? Yeah. My mind raced a little frantically, trying to figure out a way to impress just how important the relics were without sounding nuts. So, did Tabitha mention the items recently? When was the last time that you knew for certain that she had them? The last time I'd spoken to Aunt Tabby was when I was in California and her magical stash had not been the topic of conversation at the time. I don't know. I guess I could check with Grandma, but I know how dear they were to her. If they'd gone missing while she was alive, she would have said something to us. Constable Lewis licked his lips and glanced out the window as if searching for the right words. Look, I'm sure that the family is very upset, and you have my condolences but Tabitha retired a while ago and sometimes the elderly resort to selling the odd thing here or there to make ends meet. It was just her alone in that place, and... She did not sell them. I thumped my hand on the table, then jumped at the noise. My throat thickened with emotion, and a fresh wave of hot tears spilled down my face. I'm sorry, it's just... I understand. He went to fetch the tissues I'd left on the sofa, and the pained expression on his face made me regret snapping at him. My nan died a couple of years ago. It's strange how much you take for granted, and how unprepared we are for these kinds of things. I only nodded as I cleaned myself up, knowing the guy couldn't possibly understand my predicament. Tell you what, maybe Beverly remembers seeing them around, or knows what might have happened to them, or John Thorpe at the post office. She used to run a fortune-telling stall with Tabitha at some of the regional fairs. The gear you spoke about sounds like something you'd see in one of their tents. Maybe Jan was holding on to them for the next one. If you get any more information and it looks like they have been stolen, I'd be happy to look into it. Sure. I took a deep breath and forced a smile. I'll let you know if I find anything you can act on. Constable Lewis showed me out of the office, and I was conscious of my no-doubt blotchy face as I made my way to the car. Passersby smiled and nodded to me, some a little too familiarly, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the old lady pushing a buggy was lingering out the front. After hopping in the car, she ambled away toward the shopping strip in the middle of town, and I wondered if she'd seen me go in the police station. Small towns. It was the kind of nosiness I was used to back home, but it still made me a little uncomfortable to think I was the talk of the town. At the very least, it was an unfair advantage when I was the one who was supposed to be doing the snooping.
Chapter 9 I knew I should have headed straight over to see Jan at the post office, or even stopped in at Beverly's house to ask them about the relics, but I needed to blow off some steam. The problem of navigating a magical problem in a regular world was grating on me something severe, and I couldn't find words that seemed adequate enough to convey the situation. My mind was fixed on a green solution to my frustration and there was one particular greenhouse which I knew could use my attention. The liberal soaking I'd given to the potted plants in Aunt Tabby's collection had done some good, with leaves perking up in condensation on the plastic walls indicating the moisture was sufficient. After finding a pair of pruners on a bench I went about the business of cutting away dead stalks and wiggling my fingers into the soil to get a sense of what each plant needed to thrive. While I knew little about the Australian gardening conditions, I still couldn't see why something as hardy as rosemary wouldn't be better suited to growing right out in the garden, or why comfrey wouldn't do better away from the warm plastic walls. It was like the greenhouse itself was a medicinal cupboard, with ingredients kept away for when they might be needed. After shifting a hefty pot, I located a small vial at the back of a plant stand. Curious, I popped open the lid and gave it a tentative sniff. It was potent in the worst kind of way, and at the forefront of the heady notes was the camphorous reek of eucalyptus, unpleasant when stored in such saturation. Back home, I'd heard that eucalyptus trees could leach toxins into the soil, and wondered what kind of brew for plants it could possibly be used for. I slipped it into my pocket with a mental note to scrutinize it later, turning my attention back to the overly woody witch hazel. If the concern was the external ecosystem, some plants would be more problematic than others. I was tempted to look into which plants may be considered pests in this part of the world, but kept reminding myself I'd be gone in a week, and that perhaps I should offer the pots up to Beverly, or Kelly next door. A developer surely wouldn't have use of them, which meant most of the furniture should likewise be handed off to thrift stores or charities. The likelihood of getting out of Myrtle Glen in a week was dwindling the more I thought about it. I had yet to find the key for the truck in the garage and hadn't sorted through what I'd send home for the family and what could go. I should have picked up some boxes while I was in town. I was considering these more normal problems and shifting some pots out by the patio when I startled at a figure rounding the corner of the house toting a walking stick. I was almost positive I hadn't heard a car come up the driveway, but nevertheless the woman whose white cloud of hair was a stark contrast to her rich, brown skin stopped and smiled. Ah, uh, hi? I smiled back, my arms full of pots. Auntie May. The woman lifted her chin as she considered me. I reckon you must be Katerina. Only Mom, Grandma, and occasionally Aunt Tabby ever called me by my full name. Usually when I was in trouble. I unburdened my hands and dusted them off before tracking over to offer my hand. Pleased to meet you. You must have been a friend of Aunt Tabitha's. Auntie May squinted at my hand before pulling me into a hug, her walking stick at odds with her firm grip. I froze then melted into her embrace, feeling a disconcerting wave of familiarity with the woman. I recalled somewhere in the back of my mind that family titles were a mark of respect in some cultures, and the brief conversation I'd had with Jan about an auntie of some sort paying me a visit. Your aunt was a good woman, she murmured in my ear, and was always talking about you girls back home. You and your family have my condolences. She released me and I let go a little reluctantly, my eyes prickling with tears. She cupped my chin with a sad smile, then looked out toward the water and took a deep breath. I don't know what happens with you lot, but I'd like to think the ancestor spirits are taking care of her. I blinked, feeling at a complete deficit, not knowing who Auntie May was or the nuances of her culture, but got a hold of myself to offer her some hospitality. Thank you for coming round. Can I get you something to drink? I waved toward the patio set. Auntie May glanced at it and pointed to the park bench by the water. Tea would be lovely, black with one sugar. Her eyes twinkled with humor. Just don't tell my doctor. I snorted as I laughed and wasn't sure if I should offer her a hand to get to the bench, 
but Auntie May was already striding away, and I got the impression her walking stick was more of a crutch than a necessity. I kicked off my boots as I trotted inside to put the kettle on and mulled over the connection between the signs around the property and the elderly woman. It was clear her relationship with Aunt Tabby was close if she knew about me, and mixed feelings plagued my mind. There was just so much I didn't know about my aunt's life here. Like she was a complete stranger on this side of the world. With two mugs in hand, both the citrus blend, I frowned at a lack of vehicle in the driveway and took measured strides to the waterline to keep from sloshing tea around. Auntie May accepted hers with a smile, and I sat beside her to blow gently on my steaming mug. I didn't hear you come up? Don't tell me you walked all the way here? I grinned and Auntie May chuckled. My nephew Jaron dropped me off at the gate. She sniffed her mug and smiled. He'll be back a little later. We were supposed to run a tour today, but we cancelled out of respect. I followed Auntie May's gaze to the enameled sign by the water, and everything clicked into place. Right. So those are yours? The Aboriginal Land Councils, she corrected. I'm the chair of the council and Jaron does the cultural tours. It's been a good fifteen years now. Oh. I took a sip of tea to process that and rounded back to the offer on the property. Does the land hold some kind of cultural significance? Auntie May's laugh was wheezy, and she held her chest before taking a sip of tea. I gave her a moment to collect herself, unsure if her breathing usually sounded like that, but the tea seemed to steady her some. All land holds cultural significance. She twirled her finger in the air. Aboriginal people have been the custodians of the land for thousands of years, but water is special for our mob, and these wetlands are a good example of how we lived here before colonization. Of course. I nodded, not quite sure how to respond to that. Your aunt and I had an arrangement. It didn't start off all sunshine and roses, you know. The land council didn't have the money back then to buy the place, and there were some heated words on the matter. But after your aunt moved in, she came down to the council herself to offer free access for us whenever we wanted. Auntie May looked out over the water, a small smile on her lips. The tours came later. Somehow she swindled the right kind of zoning with the city council for it all to be legit. Sounds like something she'd do. I smiled as I recalled Aunt Tabby's kindness and sense of social justice, but it occurred to me that perhaps whatever she'd done had also appealed to the developer. Do you know anything about the offer on the house? Auntie May's face turned sour, the deep lines around her face twisting. That bloody Simon Flagstaff. I reckon that slimy fellow went looking for those caravan park people because he saw a dollar in it. His commission on the sale? I frowned, not understanding the particulars of how that worked. Too right. He wasn't happy when your aunt turned him down either. After that, he came sniffing around at the land council, some under the table deal to have us buy the property then sell it to the developer with enough money left over to build a new community center. My eyes widened. Wouldn't that be illegal somehow? Probably. Auntie May waved her hand as though that wasn't the point. It caused all kinds of drama, some families wanted to do the deal, and others wanted to buy the land and just hold on to it. Reckoned it would make a juicy news story if people found out what had happened. But I wasn't having it. I wondered at Auntie May's position in the town and figured if even Jan at the post office called her auntie she must be a force to be reckoned with. Beverly next door seems keen for the sale to happen, I ventured, cocking my head toward the neat little house in the distance. Course she does. Aunt May glared over her shoulder in that general direction horrible woman. She just wants to sell up too. She was always complaining about the tours. Some rubbish about disturbing her peace. I shifted in my seat to look at her house properly and the patch of land which cut into Aunt Tabby's larger parcel. An offer on her place conditional on the sale of the rest made sense if the developer wanted wider road frontage. I see. So I guess you've come to pack up then go home? Auntie May gave me a measuring look and I chewed my lip at the scrutiny. Yep. 
I thought it was going to be a simple matter of packing some boxes and sending the rest to charity. I sighed. Nothing is ever that easy, though. None of this mess is yours. Auntie May pressed her lips together. But I hope you'll do the right thing. I licked my lips and hoped the answer to one of my problems was sitting in front of me. Would the land council like to buy? No. Auntie May thumped her walking stick on the bare dirt. That'll only cause problems. Have you met Billy yet? Billy? I screwed up my face, picturing the people I'd met since arriving. Who's Billy? Never mind. Auntie May made a face and held her chest as she stood. I can hear the bus coming. I stood and turned to the driveway where I saw a cloud of dust in the laneway beyond. A small bus came into view and drove onto the property and around the carriage turned by the garage. The sign on the side was in earthy, bold colors, and a man behind the wheel waved out the window. Auntie May began hobbling toward it, and I kept a close step with her. Will you be at the memorial at Kelly's on Saturday? Wouldn't miss it. Kelly's a good sort. Went to school with my daughter, Cheyenne. Great. I felt an impending sense of alarm as we got closer to the bus, not wanting Auntie May to leave. Do you? I mean, have you got any advice I could use with all this? Auntie May stopped to turn toward me, amusement crinkling her eyes. You'll figure it all out. Your aunt always said you had a good head on your shoulders. She reached up to pat my face like only the elderly can without making you feel like a small child. But before she could take the last few steps to the bus, I took a chance on the woman knowing something about the relics. I'm having a lot of trouble finding some family heirlooms. They mean a lot to my grandma, and I'm trying to figure out who might have known where they ended up. Auntie May held up a finger toward the bus, and her brows knitted together. What you looking for? I rattled off the list of relics, ignoring the crazy-sounding factor. And at least Auntie May didn't scoff or roll her eyes. She made a rumbling sound in her throat as she thought about it, then shrugged. Afraid I can't help you with those. Maybe Jan Thorpe might know something about it. But I understand why they sound important. Her meaningful look spurred a flash of hope in me. Are you a witch? I blurted, regretting the bluntness as soon as the words rang in my ears. Auntie May cackled, clutching her belly as the wheeze stole her breath. Good grief, no, but maybe don't ask my grannies that question if I'm having a bad day. Hoping she thought I was making some weird joke, I gave a nervous laugh and saw her to the bus door, too mortified to know whether I was babbling as she introduced me to her nephew Jiran. But as they drove off down the dusty laneway, I realized the sky didn't fall around my ears, and no inquisitors had leaped out of the bushes to arrest me for revealing magic. It was time to get my big girl panties on and front up to post office Lady Jan with some hard questions. Chapter 10 Perhaps going to see Jan before seeking out Beverly wasn't quite big girl panties, but everyone kept pointing toward the woman as a likely suspect or source of useful information. All I had to do was ask her if she'd kept the relics in her safekeeping, and if she did to return them immediately. Politely, of course. If that was the case, maybe I could live with the anomaly of Aunt Tabby's death. And if she didn't know what happened to the relics, I'd have to bite the bullet and fess up to Grandma even if that meant kicking off an international magical investigation. The last time I avoided that sort of intervention, my fears had been for naught, and solving a magical crime I wasn't even sure had taken place was way out of my league. I pulled up at the post office and nodded to an older gentleman with a polite smile as I passed him in the doorway. If the cars out front were any indication, there was only one other person still in the shop, so after entering, I browsed the shelves as I waited for them to go about their business and leave. It gave me a chance to pick up a couple of items that even a well-intended gift basket couldn't account for, including toilet paper, and sneak a closer glance at the spiritual corner of the store. Not that I thought Jan may have taken the relics simply to sell them off, but perhaps there was some sign there that she was a little more than a magic quack. But if she had a witchy secret, 
she evidently wasn't silly enough to go displaying it in her store. It always miffed me a little to go reading the labels of spiritualism products. An anxiety crystal kit sounded wacky, and I suspected the sorceress oils were probably just scented to make like they were the real deal. I was sure the odd witch made for a savvy entrepreneur with this kind of stuff for regular folks, but if the magical community needed products, these days the witchy web was the place to be. I blinked as something slid into place in my mind, and I cursed myself for not thinking about checking out the witchy web as soon as I got to Australia. It could at least tell me if there were any locals selling a magical service, and they could be able to help fill in some of the missing gaps. Laughter interrupted my thoughts, though, and I turned to see a man in a faded blue singlet and a wide-brimmed hat wave, then stride out with a bundle of odds and ends. Jan smiled politely at me, if a little too polite, from the counter, so I took a deep breath before approaching what I knew would be an awkward conversation. Got a couple of letters for you, love. Jan rummaged through her bundles of envelopes on the counter, her glasses looking close to falling off her nose. Thanks. I eased my groceries down on a clear patch of chipped laminate. I've been meaning to come by anyhow. I understand you and Aunt Tabby used to do some work together? Something about fortune-telling? Jan met my eye with a weak smile and nodded, all the local fairs and some even further, for close to thirty years now. I found some things at the house, mostly scarves and tarot cards. Can I bring them in for you? I thought offering a little honey might make my next questions less bitter. Oh, I don't know. Jan looked down and shook her head. It was your aunt who did the actual fortunes, you know? I know my way around a tarot deck, but when we went out to those kinds of things I usually sold bits and pieces in the stall out the front. She gestured to the magic quack corner. Huh, not quite what I expected. Maybe just to remember her by then, I need to get her things together to send back home, but there's only a few keepsakes that my grandma really wants back. I paused, then smacked my lips as if the thought had just occurred to me. I'm having some trouble finding them, but maybe you can help? They're really family heirlooms but anyone could mistake some of them for fortune-telling gear. Jan flicked an elastic band on a bundle of mail, and her eyes looked a little wary. Ah, I guess. What are you looking for exactly? I rattled off the list but kept a close eye on the woman to try to get a read on her. She didn't give me the same peculiar look that Constable Lewis had, but then she was a true believer type. I could only hope she fessed up if she did indeed have them. After pursing her lips, she cleared her throat and didn't quite meet my eye as she spoke. I think I might have seen one or two of those over the years. I remember the crystal ball in particular, but Tabitha always said they were too valuable to go lugging around the countryside. I ordered the crystal ball she used for the fairs through my supplier. I nodded but wasn't done with the woman quite yet. I have been over every inch of the place and can't find them. It's just strange, you know? I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Constable Lewis tried to suggest she might have sold them, but they were particularly precious to her. If there was any time to speak up about being a witch, or knowing about the magical community, it was right there and then for Jan Thorpe. But her features only twisted with emotion, and she held a hand to her mouth. I couldn't see her selling them for the world, and it's not like she was short on a dollar. But I don't know what to say. People leave valuables in strange places, but I don't know where she might have kept them if they aren't in the house. Do you know where she would have kept them in the house? I pressed but felt like I should clarify. If I can't establish where they were before they went missing, apparently Constable Lewis can't help me. A flicker of understanding crossed Jan's features, and her lips twitched in amusement. Chris is a sweet kid, and I have trouble thinking about him as Constable Lewis, but I think she might have kept them in her guest bedroom. I stayed there a while ago and saw them in the cupboard. The empty shelf that I assumed was reserved for guest items. Bingo. How long is a while, do you think? I hoped fervently it was recent. Oh well. Jan rubbed her chin and stared off into space. We'd gotten back home late, must have been from the fair over in Woodford, so Tabitha told me to crash at her place. 
that would have been. Six months ago. Six months was better than nothing, but I still wish it had been more recent. Thank you. Hopefully that helps Constable, I mean Chris. Jan reached over the counter to clasp my hand. You really think someone stole them? I shrugged. I really don't know. It just vexes me to think that this is all a weird coincidence. They might not seem valuable, but really they are the only items in the house that meant anything to the family. The only person I can think of who might have known about that and lives in Australia is Billy Waite. I frowned and Jan raised her eyebrows and clarified, the ex-husband. My eyes boggled as I recalled the framed wedding photo on Aunt Tabby's bookcase. Of course, I whispered. Jan looked a little alarmed as she seemed to catch on to what I was thinking. Now those two have been divorced for thirty years. I only know he's still in Australia, because he works in a small town further north where my sister lives. As far as I knew, he and Tabitha weren't in contact. Not in contact, maybe, but she certainly had to be reminded of him every time she looked at that photograph. I didn't even remember Billy from my childhood, but I would have been a tyke when they split. What I knew was that he was definitely a wizard, and Grandma despised him. The Waite clan back in Tumbling Springs were a dime a dozen, and for the most part Grandma shunned them over the decades-old divorce. What town did you say that was again? My heartbeat thudded, but my voice was eerily calm. Ah, Coolavale. But I don't think. You've been very helpful, Jan. I gave her hand a squeeze. Thank you so much. I fled the store, leaving the groceries and letters behind, my mind in a frenzy of intrigue and suspicion. I needed to get on the phone to Mom and Grandma and pull in the big guns. Jan was right. Billy had to be the only magic user in the country who had intimate knowledge of the Crow family relics. It wasn't like Aunt Tabby had a string of warlock boyfriends after that judging by the wedding photo at the house. Perhaps its prominence meant they weren't quite as estranged as Jan thought. All I knew was that if this was a magical murder, regular law enforcement wasn't going to help me. Chapter 11 When I arrived back at the house, Simon Flagstaff's shiny, blue SUV was parked in my way. I ground my teeth as I took the rental car around it onto the lawn and hopped out. The realtor was leaning against the car wearing a slick pair of sunglasses, and he slid them off to tuck away in his lapel as I approached. Cat. His greasy smile made my skin crawl as he reached to clasp my hand. Maybe it was learning about his double dealing, or that I was worked up and didn't have time to deal with the man. I was just in the area and wanted to stop by to see how your grandmother felt about our offer. We're still considering it, I said through my teeth. As I'm sure you can understand. He nodded gravely. Well, I'm here any time you'd like to talk through the offer, and I'm happy to be on a call with your grandmother to reassure her of any doubts. She's still grieving. My voice was tart. Now if you don't mind I'm very busy. I went to move around him, but the man stepped in my way. I completely understand. Losing loved ones is a hard time in everyone's lives, but I can't guarantee this offer will sit for long. Other property owners are asking about opportunities. Oh, I looked him up and down, bristling at his proximity. The offer was good for a year and suddenly there's a ticking clock. He held up his hands. No, no, nothing like that. I just want to be sure that your family gets the best deal on the table. As a local, I consider myself a buyer's advocate, and... Listen, I snapped. I've got an urgent call to make, so I'm going to need you to leave. I'll call when I've got your answer. Simon looked a little irritated, and perhaps a touch flummoxed at my change in attitude, but I really couldn't give two hoots. I was bent on finding another way to pass on the property to someone with no intent to doze it over and had plans to schmooze mom to my cause on the matter. She could never resist the plight of a vulnerable critter. The trick was to convince grandma of the same. But the first order of business was Billy Waite, and I stared grimly at Simon as he got into his car and turned out of the driveway. He stopped to stick his head out of the window to chat to Beverly, and I rolled my eyes before heading inside. 
those two must be thick as thieves. Maybe they were giving each other ill-considered pointers on being personable to me, in an effort to make the sale. I kicked my boots off at the door and headed into the living room to scoop up the wedding photo from the bookcase before dropping onto the sofa. To have an effective conversation with both mom and grandma, I'd have to call the landline, and I grimaced as I considered what my next phone bill would look like. It rang five times before mom picked up, and I belatedly realized it must be the middle of the night back home as I stared out the window at the late afternoon sunshine. Hello? Mom's voice was groggy. Cat, is that you? Sorry, Mom. I winced as I pictured her in bed using the rotary phone on her nightstand. She always insisted on being available in case of medical and veterinary emergencies. I didn't even think of the time. But this is important. Do you think you can wake Grandma? What's wrong? Mom grunted, and I heard the faint click of a light switch in the background. I'm fine. It'll just be easier to explain myself the once. It's about the relics. I stared at a younger Billy Waite's face in the photograph on my lap. Gimme a minute, Mom muttered. I barely kept my knees from bouncing with impatience as I waited for Mom and Grandma to get assembled, Mom in her bedroom with Grandma using the phone in the kitchen. A video call would have been infinitely easier had the modem back home been in working order. Mom had learned that trick solely for the purpose of consulting her patients who were too far away to come into her clinic, or barn depending on who you spoke to. Grandma picked up the phone with a grumble, and was the first to speak up as though she had to talk louder to be heard all the way from Tumbling Springs. This had better be important, Katerina, she griped. I've been up and down all night. Finally get to sleep and then the phone starts screeching. Sorry, Grandma but it is. I've been meaning to call, but I didn't want to get anyone worried. The relics are missing, but I think I have a clue as to who may have them. Say what now? Mom's voice had lost that sleepy sound in her voice. I have combed every inch of the house and garage here and there's no sign of them. In fact, I'd hardly even suspect Aunt Tabby was a witch at all going through her things. I closed my eyes, waiting for the onslaught from Grandma but there was only static on the line. Well? Grandma finally barked. You said you'd figured out who took them. I took a deep breath. Here goes. The only person in Australia who I know for certain uses magic and knew about the relics is Billy Waite. Billy. What? No, those two haven't spoken in years. Are you sure he's still even in Australia, Cat? Maybe the relics are under a floorboard somewhere. Mom, bless her, was always trying to de-escalate situations. But if I heard one more person's second guess if my search had been thorough, I would scream. If he did, I'm going to skin that son of a bitch alive. Always told Tabitha never to trust a darn weight. Duplicitous every one of them. Grandma's voice held steel. Tell us what you know, Cat. I rubbed my eyes and tried to figure out where to start. Look, I figured it was weird when I got here that Aunt Tabby kept a wedding photo with her ex on the bookcase but didn't really think anything of it. I started getting worried when I couldn't find the relics, and so far as I know, the only two people who could have gotten into the house after Aunt Tabby passed is the neighbor and the lady at the post office who kept a spare set of keys. I can't see the neighbor having taken them. Her only interest is getting the place sold so the offer on her house comes through. She looks a world away from being a magical type. Jan from the post office appears to be a full-blown magic quack, but I went down to speak to her today, and she seemed genuinely concerned that the relics were missing. She last saw them around six months ago. Saw? Grandma screeched. What do you mean, saw? I wasn't sure how Grandma would take the news of Aunt Tabby and Jan's enterprise. They, ah, well... They were long-time friends who did the carnival circuit running a fortune-telling stall. She remembers seeing the relics over the years, but Aunt Tabby never used them in the biz. It was around six months ago that she happened upon them in a cupboard while staying over the night. They aren't in the cupboard now. Magic quack? What in the light was Tabitha doing? Grandma's voice had dropped and knowing the question wasn't intended for me, I didn't answer. 
But what makes you think this woman wasn't just lying? And where does Billy fit into this? I just can't shake this bad feeling. I pulled my legs up onto the sofa and rested my chin on my knees. All of Aunt Tabby's magical gear going missing at the same time as her death. And this town is so normal. Not a single person has introduced themselves as a magic user since I've been here, and Myrtle Glen isn't any bigger than Tumbling Springs. If she had magical acquaintances in the area, they're certainly not friendly. I sighed. Don't you think it's a little odd that Aunt Tabby would have her wedding photo displayed in the living room after all these years? Maybe they were, I don't know, rekindling the flame or something. Well, odd, maybe. But are you suggesting that this was a murder? Mom sounded a little incredulous. Over a box of odds and ends? Every magical family has relics and ours aren't exactly the crown jewels. Well, I don't know how else to explain it. But I'd rest a lot easier if this was properly looked into. Inquisitors? Grandma made a thoughtful sound. What do you have in mind? I paused to take a deep breath. I spoke to the coroner's office yesterday. They've done some preliminary tests but haven't come up with anything so far. They're looking to book an autopsy, but if we could have someone go by with the skills to see if magic was involved. If there's enough of a trace left behind, that is. Mom knew more about that kind of thing than me. It would take some clever magic to take a seer unawares. And the body doesn't tend to hold on to magic long after death. She always had one particular blind spot, Grandma grumbled. That darn Billy Waite. I let go of a breath I didn't know I was holding. At least Grandma could see the argument had merit. I'll make some calls and see if I can't arrange for the council over there to send someone. If time really is of the essence it'll take too long to fly someone out. But you'll have to mind your manners, Cat. It will be their jurisdiction, and I won't be able to get you out of the frying pan this time around. My cheeks colored at the memory of my last encounter with Inquisitors. It was the first time Grandma had brought it up, and I'd vaguely hoped she didn't know the particulars of that situation. But it appeared I was mistaken. How's everything else going down there? Mom picked up the lull in the conversation. Did you speak to that realtor the neighbor mentioned? Only moms could shift a topic of conversation like that. It was one of their superpowers. I wasn't sure if it was the time or place to try to get Grandma to join a crusade to protect the local wildlife, but I couldn't exactly avoid the subject. Ah, yeah, the offer comes with a whole lot of zeros and strings attached. Oh? Mom sounded wary, but I wondered how Grandma was doing. It wasn't like her to go quiet. The property is 200 acres of mostly swamp. It's close to the river, and the buyer has plans to block the water coming in and bulldoze the rest to make way for a fancy trailer park. I stared out the window, a wave of repulsion upsetting my stomach as I tried to picture it. This realtor has been bugging Aunt Tabby for a while and I understand why she'd turn him down. The place is, well, beautiful. Oh, so now we're expected to pick up my sister's environmental causes, Grandma huffed. Figures. From what I can understand, this whole town has been holding out against city folks turning it into some kind of seasonal theme park. Maybe we can find another buyer who'll keep the place as is? I hoped anyhow. Oh, sure, Grandma's voice dripped with sarcasm. I'm sure a lot of folks will front up promising to protect the birdies and whatnot. For a discount, of course. I'd give them a week after that before greed gets the better of them, and they decide to take the developer's offer. Grandma always saw the best in people, and maybe I'd inherited just a touch of her sarcasm. But it put me in mind of what else I'd discovered, and though the crows were far from destitute, I thought it might sweeten the deal. I came across one of Aunt Tabby's bank records, though. Now, I know she always said the site was no good for lottery tickets, but I get the feeling she was telling a white lie. It has just as many zeros as the offer on the house. I doubt she made that kind of money telling fortunes or working at City Hall. I let that sit for a moment for them to chew on. I'll send some pictures over for you to take a look at, 
But you know as well as I do that Aunt Tabby wouldn't want us to roll over for some city slicker with a mind to tear the place up. Of course not, Grandma grunted. She'd expect us to take up her life's work with no mind for anyone else. Never mind the fact she shirked her family obligations years ago and left me to deal with. Ma, would you just quit being ugly? Mom snapped. I can't take it no more. You've been madder than a wet hen for a week, like you're the only person who lost someone. Great. I kicked off a war. Things must have been pretty bad back home to get Mom riled up. She was my sister. Grandma spat. And don't we know it. Mom screeched. Not a minute has gone by in this house where you haven't seen fit to remind us all of how inconvenient this is for you. Cat is only showing respect for the dead and being a good citizen of Mother Earth. Or do you want that kind of bad juju following the family around for generations to come? I sank back on the sofa, rubbing my eyes and wondering how long this was going to take. Grandma had a particular talent for cherry-picking which parts of widely regarded magical beliefs to champion and others to dismiss. And her magical skill set never really washed with earth magic. All the way from Australia? Please, Grandma tutted. I'll think about it, but it doesn't make sense to throw money aside for the sake of sentiment. Wow, I'll think about it wasn't usually in Grandma's wheelhouse. Aunt Tabby's death must really be riding her. Okay, but look, we need to figure this out. I'll talk to the coroner's office again to make sure they aren't moving too quickly, but we'll need to get the local arcane council on board Lickety Split. I'm assuming the hour isn't quite so godforsaken over there? Grandma ventured. Just getting to dusk, I confirmed. I'll make a few calls and apologize for the hour, but I should be able to track down a number pretty quick. Grandma made a heaving noise like she was getting up out of her seat, and I was grateful for her connections if not her attitude. Thanks, Grandma. I'll keep trying to figure this all out on my end. I don't suppose you can think of a spell or two that might help Mom? I thought she probably wouldn't, but I was concerned about how she was doing on the other end of the line. I'll think about it, her tone was clipped, and I'll call you at a more reasonable hour. I took the point and wondered if I'd likewise get a call at stupid o'clock in the morning. Okay, sorry to wake you both. Why don't you both go back to getting some sleep? Unlikely, Grandma griped. I'll let you know as soon as I learn something. I sighed after getting off the phone, worried about both Mom and Grandma. At least I'd been able to skip out of the country. If those two were at the stage of firing off sharp words at one another, I was sure Gus was still sleeping in the barn. He was a smart familiar like that. Chapter 12 I think I must have been getting used to crashing early and waking before the dawn, but after getting off the phone to Mom and Grandma I'd realized it was too late to call the coroner. After heating up a particularly delicious tray of pasta care of the slimy Simon Flagstaff, I'd fallen asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow in the guest bedroom. It wasn't like I thought the trip to Australia was going to be some kind of vacation, but spending my days either worrying, searching, or trying to piece my aunt's life together through a string of unfamiliar faces was exhausting. At least I hadn't been woken to a call from Grandma overnight, but then I wasn't sure what that meant for her endeavors to get some local help. Wiggling my toes and stretching my arms overhead, I willed my body to resume an upright position and took a shower to wake up my muscles in preparation for the day, likely filled with the more ordinary business of packing boxes and contacting freight companies. But when I filled the kettle, the light from the kitchen reflected off the mosaic-topped patio set outside. It was still completely dark out, but it appeared to be on its side. Ha! Huh, I grunted, frowning as I rounded the counter to the sliding glass door where the outdoor light switch was. When I flicked it on, my eyes widened in alarm. So far as I could tell, the patio set was just one of many bits and pieces littered around the paved outdoor area. The tabletop itself was in three pieces, with jagged bits of tile thrust upward under a bent iron frame. My heart hammered, and I unclipped the latch on the sliding door. When I poked my head out, I recoiled when I saw the light coming from further around the house by the boiler. 
I closed the door and snapped the lock back in place, holding my chest as I thought someone with a flashlight was about to emerge. But after several grueling seconds nothing happened, so I crept on tiptoe into the living room to steal a glance through the curtains. I couldn't see anyone lurking, and after stealing myself to open the musty, printed drapes, I frowned at the dull glow coming from what I'd assumed was a busted, old refrigerator outside. The door hung wide open, and I sagged with relief. Using my phone as a flashlight, I puffed out my cheeks and sought my boots before heading outside. The damage was more than a critter could account for, and I picked my way over shattered pots and torn up plants as I made for the refrigerator. A pile of shredded cardboard and crumpled cans lay heaped in front of the appliance. I frowned, trying to put the scene together. From what I could see there was nothing but beer in the refrigerator and I knew Aunt Tabby didn't drink. It looked like a band of college kids had torn it apart and guzzled down a whole case, leaving one of the wire racks bent at an odd angle. Kicking aside the litter, I stared for one long moment at the bottom, where another case of beer sat untouched before closing the door. What the heck? The chairs to the patio set were in pieces on the ground, with stuffing from the cushions in white poofy lumps all over the place. How I hadn't heard that all happening was more than a little concerning. Dragging my hand over my face, I decided that I wasn't going to figure it out while standing outside in the dark, and if someone was waiting for me to find their handiwork. Alarmed, I rushed back inside and locked all the doors, pulling the curtains in place as if they could keep me from harm. I wasn't in some suburban yard where kids with nothing better to do could have trashed the place. It couldn't have been opportunistic. Not when the property was a good fifteen minutes out of town at the end of a lane. The Carrington's hex came to mind first. Falling hatchets, garage doors, and car crashes trying to kill me hadn't taken a person to do the actual damage. But if that was the case, the hex had most definitely misfired unless the intent of the hex was really just to scare the crap out of me. I paced the small kitchen, pushing away that thought and trying to come up with a more tangible explanation. It seemed like an act that was supposed to rattle me. So who was it around here who might want to do exactly that? The first thing that sprang to mind was Billy Waite, but I had no reason to suspect he was in Myrtle Glen, even if he did make off with the relics. In fact, it would probably be stupid for him to be hanging around. Unless he had designs on the house, maybe? Could people even contest a will after they divorced? But the next thought was that I'd brushed off Simon Flagstaff the night before rather rudely, and he had a very keen interest in getting me off the property and on a flight back home. I knew he was crooked enough to take a shifty offer to the Aboriginal Land Council to try to make the sale, so would trashing the house after I turned him away be out of the realm of possibility? He had to be making a fair commission on the house, and if he was prepared to go to those kinds of lengths, was I barking up the wrong tree when it came to Billy Waite? Except if it was the sale Simon wanted, taking the relics only delayed his desired outcome. But there was nothing to say the relics, Aunt Tabby's death, and the destruction outside had anything to do with each other. Not yet, anyway and unless some beer-guzzling monster with a penchant for twisting patio furniture was planning to set up a new fortune-selling store someplace, it would be wise to treat them as separate incidents for now. I could only do what was in my control, so I brewed a pot of tea before planting myself in the living room, cursing myself for not lugging my laptop to Australia. But I had the Witchy Web app on my phone, so it was time to figure out exactly what was up in Myrtle Glen when it came to magic, and whether I could find Billy Waite anywhere in the database. It proved more than a little difficult. Illusion magic really dwindled in popularity as the world moved into modern times, as restrictions on conjuring elaborate displays of magic tightened with the advent of cameras. It was becoming almost the bottom-dweller brand of magic until the tech age took hold, and the new generation of magic users began coding with a magical twist. So far as I knew, regular folks who saw the app in store would think it was for horoscopes and find a totally different interface when using it. But for witches and wizards it was like eBay, replacing the idea of hanging a shingle outside your door for passing customers. 
There was also another app for social media which was really starting to take off, Magic Me. But while I had an account I didn't surf much on it. Too many cat videos to make it much different from regular social media. I set a search for Myrtle Glen and surrounds in Witchy Web, leaving the description blank to see what turned up. It surprised me to see the first listing was Tabitha's True Sight Services and stared at the smartphone on the bookshelf, which I dug out of her purse and had long since gone flat. I decided to check for any messages. But knowing my aunt, who could barely tell one side of a cell phone from another, I was truly flummoxed at how she had the news to set up a listing on Witchy Web. The only thing I could think of was that someone had set it up for her. Chiding myself for being so tunnel-visioned on the relics, I went to scour the house for an appropriate charger and plugged Aunt Tabby's phone in on her nightstand. Returning to my online search, I sipped tea and scanned the local listings for magical services, only two of which were in Myrtle Glen itself. One was for a tech illusionist of all things, and the other was hawking magically infused aromatherapy junk. A tech illusionist sounded promising if I was looking for someone who might have helped Aunt Tabby to configure an account, so I looked for a number and address on the listing. Scrawling the information on a notepad, I wondered if Ash was a guy or a gal, but thought it was too early to go calling to find out. I'd put that on the list of things to do for later and hoped they might be able to shed some light on the situation. I didn't exactly want to add anyone to the list of who might have taken the relics but had come up with nothing so far with the current pool of candidates. I spent the next hour or so scouring both Witchy Web and Magic Main for any sign of Billy Waite but didn't find so much as a mention of the guy. I supposed he was also in the generation who might think tech magic was too newfangled for his tastes. The passing of time brought the wreckage outside into stark view, and I became more annoyed than frightened about it. I still had a while to wait before the coroner's office would open, so I got off the sofa to clean up the mess outside, muttering all the while about the missing keys to the truck, which would have been useful to take the broken stuff away to a waste disposal place. As it stood, I thought I'd need to arrange for a roll-off dumpster to be brought around. After sweeping up the last of the potting soil from the pavers outside, disgruntled at the shredded plants from the greenhouse mingled in with it, I moved it over to a pile on the lawn and sighed. Ugly pile of trash aside, it looked to be shaping up into a beautiful day, and my gaze wandered across the property where birds, in a full chorus, sang from all directions. One long, lanky stork flew directly overhead to swoop down into the swamp, and I gave one last wistful look at the great outdoors before heading back inside. I was about to dial the coroner's office when my cell phone rang in my hand, startling me so much I dropped the darn thing on the glass top dining table. Picking it up with a wince, I hurried to catch the call, which appeared to be a local number, and answered in confusion. Ah, uh, hello? Cat crow? It's Amelia Ward here from the Australian branch of Magical Inquisitors. I've had a request come through to investigate the death of one Tabitha Crow who I believe is your aunt. Sheesh. String pulling aside, that was quick. Even for Grandma. Chapter 13 Ah, sure. I blinked, not quite sure what to say. That was quick. What can I do to help? I'd just like to run through some details with you. We have a team going over to the coroner's office as we speak to perform a reading of the body. Pretty standard when a registered magic user passes away and is subject to a police investigation, but in this instance, nothing came up as flagged in our database. Amelia's tone sounded apologetic, if coming short of an actual apology. No, I understand. The local law enforcement didn't believe anything was suspicious. Heck, neither did I until I found out all her magical gear was missing. I bit my lip. What do you want to know? We started with standard details which I confirmed from their records, age, address, and magical abilities. Then I described the sequence of events that led me to Australia. You didn't think it was strange that a seer died suddenly? Amelia paused, then clarified. I only ask because some estranged families may not disclose that kind of foresight. We were far from estranged. 
I bristled a little but reminded myself that Amelia was an inquisitor. She was just trying to do her job. She came home every year to Arkansas for Christmas, and the family kept in touch. She really was the sweetest woman you could ever meet. Grandma thought maybe she just didn't tell us but part of the reason I came out here was because I was worried. And you said some of her things were missing? Honestly, I can only account for the family relics I was sent here to collect, but there isn't a single magical item in the house. I gave a list of the relics themselves and thrummed the table with my fingers. But that's not even accounting for any grimoires or other magical items she might have had. I'm afraid I have no way of telling what those might be. And can you tell me a little bit about the circumstances for your aunt at the time of her death? Does anything stand out to you? Geez, where should I even start? I drew a deep breath through my nose and decided on going in the order that I discovered them. I spoke about the offer on the house, her friendship with Jan the magic quack, and the ideas I had on Billy Waite. When I glanced outside my eyes lingered on the pile of twisted patio furniture, then I told Amelia about the mess that I'd found that morning. Anything else? I could hear the faint clicking of a keyboard in the background. I think that about does it. I'll let you know if I think of anything else. Amelia gave me her cell phone number and promised to get back in touch as soon as she heard back from her people at the coroner's office. As I put the phone down, it felt like someone had lifted a weight from my shoulders, with the right people for the job on the case. It meant I could get back to the business of packing boxes and cleaning the place up, but there was one thing I'd meant to check on the night before. Aunt Tabby's cell phone was fully charged on her nightstand, and I unplugged it to check any messages that might be of use, but there was a passcode on it, and I grunted as I glared at the screen, of course there was. And bar it being something as silly as 1234 I had no way of knowing what it was, I tried a couple of combinations but was wary of sending the contraption into lockdown and then remembered the tech illusionist in town. It was worth a try, and they could at least let me know if they indeed helped to get Aunt Tabby onto Witchy Web. Rather than call, I searched the address in maps and smirked as I saw the pin come up in a location for a local computer repair store. Hidden in plain sight, then. I guessed it was appropriate to just drop in with my passcode dilemma, so I collected the keys to the rental car off the counter. It seemed like I was just never going to get used to the driver's side being on the right. I glared at the steering wheel through the window after approaching the wrong door and rolled my eyes as I rounded the car. As I went down the gravel driveway though, I spotted Beverly out surveying her gardens, so I put the car into park and hopped out, reminding myself to smile as I approached. I gave a wave, and she approached the fence line. Hi there. I jerked my thumb over my shoulder toward the house. I was hoping you might be around. I had some property damage at the house last night and thought I'd check to see if you heard anything. Property damage? Beverly's sour face twisted. What happened? I told the woman about the wreckage outside, and she shook her head. Probably that dog. I can't tell you how many times it's torn this yard to pieces. A dog big enough to break iron furniture? I tilted my head. I don't think so. It didn't look like anything a dog could have done. Well, I didn't hear anyone drive up last night. Beverly put her fists on her hips and glared. And I would have if that were the case. I was up and down with a headache, and there was nothing but crickets outside. I was getting pretty sick of the woman's attitude. If she honestly wanted me to believe that anything on four legs could have smashed up the place like that, my suspicion of Simon the Realtor was sounding the more likely scenario. You and Simon Flagstaff seem close. I arched an eyebrow. I saw him stopping by as he left here last night. I suppose you're just as keen for me to sell the place as he is, huh? What do you mean by that? Beverly snapped. Well, I'm sure you've got an offer with some lovely round zeros from that developer. You know, with the deal only being good if this property sells. So, what exactly is it that you're implying? Do you think I came around to break a couple of chairs while you were sleeping? Beverly scoffed and shook her head. Should have figured you'd be as strange as your aunt. She just had to bring Aunt Tabby into it, didn't she? 
Is that so? I gritted my teeth. Well, perhaps you can pass on a message to that slimy realtor. We ain't selling to some developer with a mind to turn this place into a trailer park. I'll find a way to keep the property as is so he can quit any ideas he has about rattling me into a sale. You're out of your mind, Beverly spat. And if you come here again accusing me of anything, I'll be making a complaint to the police. You do that, I grunted, as I turned my back on her to hop back in the car. I drove off with more than a little uncharitable satisfaction at the cloud of dust I left in my wake. Beverly was lying, that much was clear. Anyone who came up the driveway was just yards away from her timber-sided house, and if she was up all night, she would have heard the culprit go past. I mean, sure, I didn't hear the wreckage taking place, but I'd been accused of sleeping like the dead on more than one occasion and there was something in the fact that she had bullied Constable Lewis into notifying us about Aunt Tabby's death and held on to the house keys that didn't sit right with me. It was certainly in contrast with the icy demeanor she had shown after that. But rather than ruminating on the facts all over again, I told myself to place my faith in Amelia and the Inquisition's resources she had at her disposal. I could call her to ask if Beverly was a covert witch or something, but I highly doubted it. First, I needed to find out the cause of death, and if there was anything on Aunt Tabby's phone which might explain where her relics could have gotten to. With that in mind, I tried to recall the exact route to Ash's computer repair shop. For a small town, I managed to get turned around a lot in Myrtle Glen. I ended up on the far side of town where I hadn't ventured before and saw a green signpost noting the direction to the river and Goldbury over the other side. Curious at Simon's mention of the more touristy town, I took a detour toward the bridge and found his description alarmingly accurate. From the bridge itself, the far side of the river was a wall of townhouses with direct water frontage. I saw people on balconies sipping coffee and activity on the beach with people taking a stroll or holding onto fishing poles. It wasn't exactly brimming with people, but then I imagined tourist season would be in summer, Speedboats went in both directions in the golden-tinged waters as I drove over the bridge's top and down the other side. I quickly came onto a main street filled with cafes and restaurants. I drove without a particular destination in mind and kept reminding myself that I was in a small town and not somewhere closer to the city. It seemed like every other place was either a holiday park or hotel, and its modern feel put a sour taste in my mouth. It didn't have the same kind of charm as Myrtle Glen's sweet little bee and bees and historical buildings, but maybe that was the point. After finding a sign pointing me back around to the bridge, I quietly slipped out of Goldbury and returned to my errands in the sleepy town of Myrtle Glen. The computer repair shop sat snugly between a florist and a used bookstore in a row of cream bricked windows. Above were ornate stone moldings which clashed with the tacky neon signage marking the place. It looked dim inside, but after parking and approaching the door, it swung open as I pushed. The interior appeared to be wall-to-wall -wall with electronics. Up the back was a counter and a young man bent over a laptop, its glare reflecting on his face the only light source in the room. With a mop of brown hair dangling in his eyes, I was surprised he could see anything at all, but he looked up and blinked as though surprised at receiving a customer. Can I help you? He stood as if a little rushed and hurried to hit the light switches beside him. Sorry, one of the lights is playing up. It was driving me insane. The fluorescent light overhead indeed began to flicker, and I curled my lip up at it in sympathy. Ugh, that'd bug me too. The guy dragged his fingers through his hair, and I got a look at his face. He was remarkably tanned for someone who sat in the dark in front of a computer, and couldn't be older than twenty-five. He looked a little alarmed, though, and I hesitated as I approached. I'm looking for someone by the name of Ash? You must be. Tabitha Crow's niece. Cat, I confirmed, one step ahead of the accent recognition game for once. I'm Ash. He drew a deep breath and waved to a stool on the other side of the counter. I only just heard about Tabitha. Got in from the airport last night, I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm forgetting myself. He brushed his hands over a puffer vest and offered one to me. 
Ash Stevens, tech illusionist. I took his hand with a smile, warmed by the simple and familiar gesture of a magical introduction. Cat Crow. Green Witch. Green, huh? Ash made an appreciative face and sat back down. You'll fit right in around here. Maybe. I haven't exactly had a chance to play in the garden since arriving, but it surprised me to find a tech illusionist on Witchy Web in Myrtle Glen, I smirked. Somehow I always pegged you folks as city types. Ash grinned and shrugged. I prefer peace and quiet, and they invented this thing called the Internet a while ago, he held up his hands, and conferences when I have to go out and see real people. I picked up on his meaning and looked him up and down blatantly. Conferences someplace beachside? California, Ash sighed, but I probably spent less time at the sessions than I should. One week of hanging by the pool with my laptop is probably more accurate. The word California left a sour taste in my mouth. I'd be glad never to see that state again. Well, good for you. But I hope you didn't skip a session on bypassing passcodes. I pulled Aunt Tabby's phone out of my purse and held it up with a theatrical sigh. Ash only gave me a you've-got-to-be-kidding face and held out his hand. And here I thought you had some work for me. Chapter 14 I swear he unlocked it on his first try, and I stared open-mouthed, more than a little envious of his brand of magic. But he couldn't hold a straight face and chuckled as he handed it back to me. Good thing I set this phone up for your aunt, huh? He rolled his eyes in good humor. I always tell people to change the passcode to something more secure, but they never listen. Oh, I blinked. Well, that was easy enough. Did you by chance also help her get onto Witchy Web? Yeah, Ash scratched his nose. I knew she did the fortune-telling stuff and when she came in looking for a new phone, I asked her if she wanted me to set it up. I suppose you'd like me to delist her account? Probably a good idea for whoever ends up with this phone number. I made a face. I'm sure it would make for some pretty weird messages. No doubt. Ash waved as I proffered the phone and turned his attention to the laptop. I can get in through here. Are you going to the memorial tomorrow? Tomorrow? I frowned, trying to reckon with the days which had become a blur in my brain. But Kelly had said Saturday, so it added up. Absolutely. It was very kind of Kelly to organize. Ash nodded, not taking his eyes off the laptop. I don't know her that well, but I see her from time to time delivering flowers next door. He nodded to the wall beside him, and I recalled the florist shop next door. It sounds like half the town will be there. I guess I never realized how well regarded she was here. This is my first trip to Australia. Aunt Tabby was always the one coming to us. Ash gave the kind of awkward smile that a guy of his age would when confronted with feminine emotion, and I took a deep breath. I don't suppose you might be able to help me out with another matter? I'm guessing tech illusionists are pretty good at tracking people down. I didn't want to put it in more blunt terms, but that brand of magic was also getting quite the reputation for hacking. I didn't know if that was what it would take to find Billy Waite's details, but I felt compelled to learn more about the man even if inquisitors were already on the case. Ah, Ash swallowed. Who are you looking for? It didn't take long for Ash to scrawl a phone number and address for Billy Wade onto a notepad and slide it over the counter toward me. After assuring me that the witchy web listing was down and fobbing off my attempts to recompense him for his time, I stood with a smile and slid Aunt Tabby's phone back in my purse. Thank you so much. Any time. Ash's eyes darted, and he licked his lips. I'm sorry it couldn't have been under happier circumstances. I'll see you tomorrow? I cocked my head. Ash's eyes widened, and he raked his hair out of his face again. I guessed memorials for old ladies weren't something a guy of his age would find appealing. Ah, sure, wouldn't miss it. Smirking, I left the shop, certain Ash had every intention of missing it. Quite aside from his age, he seemed the awkward type, and a memorial full of tears, bittersweet stories, and unpredictable outbursts was surely something he'd rather avoid. 
but after getting into the car and checking both voicemail and Aunt Tabby's text messages, my amusement fizzled. There was nothing in voicemail and the only texts were confirmations from old doctor's appointments and sales notifications from stores which I'm sure she'd only inadvertently subscribed to. Interestingly enough though, Aunt Tabby had Billy Waite's number on her phone, which I cross-checked with the scrap of paper Ash had handed me. Cell phones couldn't have even been a thing back at the time of the divorce, so why did Aunt Tabby have his number? Chewing my lip, I made a mental note to pass the information on to Amelia. If they'd been in contact, her people would be better placed to track the records down. I spent the rest of the morning rounding up things I'd need for packing up the house properly, from boxes through to tape and markers. Noting the location of the mechanic in town, I wondered if I should stop in to see if they could help with the truck and key situation but figured it might be a specialist job. A landscape supply store sat beside it, with roll-off dumpsters sitting out front painted with for hire signs. I pulled into the dusty car park and noted the guy on a front loader moving piles of dirt into the back of a truck. I wasn't sure if I should wait for him or head into the small office building, but as the man continued working, I opted for the latter, and a bell sounded as I pushed the door open. An elderly man sat behind a desk and turned a smile toward me. He looked far beyond retirement age, but dressed in a flannel shirt with bracers, he looked like he was there on business, even if the desk was absent of any computers in favor of an old-fashioned register and what looked like paper ledgers. Good day. What can I do for you, love? I was starting to get the idea that this love thing was a particular quirk shared by older Australians, or maybe he and Jan were just like that. Hey there, I smiled. I'm Tabitha Crow's niece, just here to inquire about the dumpsters out front. I jerked my thumb over my shoulder in a rough estimation. Good grief. The man stood on wobbly legs. Come, sit down. Can I get you a cuppa? I counted Tabitha as a dear friend. No, no, don't trouble yourself. I hastened to plonk myself down on the seat in front of the desk. Pleased to meet you? Alfie. The man barked a laugh and sat. I'm Cat. I suppose you're sorting out the place, then? He pressed his lips together and shrugged. No helping it, I guess. It's a nasty business cleaning up after someone else's life. There's a lot to sift through, yeah, I offered a weak smile. But I've got some busted furniture to get rid of and can't find the keys to her truck. Is that so? Alfie frowned and tapped a pencil on the desk. I can get Bill to drop a skip bin out to you this Arvo, or dumpster if that's what you call it. I smiled and nodded, reaching for my purse, but as I reached for a credit card, Alfie held up his hand and shook his head. None of that, love. I owed Tabitha a debt of gratitude. It was strange, though. She called me up at Sparrow's Fart one morning a few months back to tell me to get the front-end loader looked at. When I came in that morning the pivot pin was busted on the bloody thing. I doubt Bozo out there would have noticed. Could have done some serious damage without the warning. Alfie leaned over the table to give a conspiratorial whisper. Never much believed in that fortune-telling stuff she used to do. But after that I reckon there must be more to it, hey? I wasn't sure that Sparrows farted, but I took his meaning and blinked away threatening tears. I recalled times when we likewise got calls from Aunt Tabby with strange warnings about innocuous things, and it struck me then that I'd miss those calls. Particularly with a hex chasing me. I was never much of a believer myself, but I have to admit I've heard a few stories like yours, I shrugged. She was a good sort, your aunt. Alfie squinted as he scribbled a note in his ledger. I'll be by tomorrow to pay my respects. Taking that as my cue, I thanked Alfie and went on my way. I had to take measured breaths as I drove back to the house, telling myself that I needed to keep hold of my faculties lest another kangaroo leap out onto the road. I just wished I'd have taken the trip out sooner. Despite the circumstances I was starting to find the town and its inhabitants rather endearing and reckoned I would have rather enjoyed an extended vacation with my aunt. As much as I was always scheming to get away from my hometown of Tumbling Springs, 
I did enjoy small town life, just not my own, I figured. I could really see why Aunt Tabby had chosen to stay in Australia all those years rather than head home to do Grandma's bidding. In a place where almost everyone was a magic user, I imagined it would have been hard for a seer to find any peace and quiet. After avoiding Beverly's stare, as I pulled up the driveway and parking by the house, I wrangled flat boxes out of the rental car and got busy with the work of packing away odds and ends that I thought Grandma would want to hold on to. Those boxes stayed in Aunt Tabby's room, and I dragged out her entire wardrobe to bag up in the living room for the local thrift store. I tried not to think too hard about the junk that amassed to a person's life being scattered to the four winds but wondered if I should offer mementos to folks at the memorial tomorrow. It was hard to know if that would be weird, a teapot to remember her by, or perhaps one of the books on her shelf that held a shared interest. Certainly, I'd have to re-home what was left of the plants in the greenhouse, and we really didn't have the space to take everything back to Arkansas. I thought perhaps I'd keep one or two of the beaded bracelets I'd spotted in her bedroom, which I recalled her wearing on her annual trips home. I was busy sorting through linen when I heard a truck backing up with a slow beeping sound and startled as I looked out the window. Daylight was dwindling fast, and a guy in a faded blue singlet and broad-brimmed hat leaned out the window of a truck as he dropped the roll-off dumpster in the yard. I thought I recognized him from the post office, and he jumped out of the truck to undo the chains holding the metal box in place. I rushed outside to greet him, and when he spotted me, he tipped his hat and smiled. Just running this out for you, his face bore deep lines and he looked as though he'd spent his entire life out in the sun. Do you want it by that rubbish? Yeah, thank you. I folded my arms as he got back to work, looking like he was in a rush to drop it off and get out as quickly as possible. After he finished, he trotted to me and proffered a card. Just let us know when you need it picked up. Alfie said no rush, hey? Before I could respond he was off to his truck again, and I watched him leave. I saw Beverly in the distance, apparently keeping watch from her rose bushes, and turned my back on her to size up the work in front of me. It was probably a job for the morning I'd have time to get things cleaned up before the barbecue, so I decided to keep going with my packing inside. But before I turned, I spotted a blur in the distance and frowned. That dog. I'd have to do something about the animal sooner rather than later. From the corner of my eye, I noticed another figure approaching from the other direction with a basket in hand, and I smiled at the sight of Kelly making her way through the wire boundary fence and across the lawn rather than going the long way around and up the driveway. I smiled at the casualness and wondered what she could possibly be bringing over. Hey there, I waved. Doing a bit of a clean-up? Kelly eyed the pile of trash as she approached. I wasn't sure what to tell her about the broken patio set and didn't want to get bogged down in all that again. Her house was a good deal further from both Aunt Tabby's and the road than Beverly's, so I doubt she knew what had happened. And she had what looked like gifts in that basket. I guess so, yeah, though I might wait until morning for this lot. Would you like to come in? I jerked my thumb toward the house with a smile. Wish I could. Kelly took a theatrical deep breath. The kids are driving me up the wall, but I could only get over here for a minute to drop this off to you. I'd been meaning to stop in, but Ben's been home from school with a cold. I understand. And thank you. I accepted the basket and pulled out a teeny, tiny jar of Vegemite. I've only ever heard about this stuff. Kelly grinned and adjusted her baseball cap. It's an acquired taste, but if you want, I can make you some proper Vegemite and cheese on toast. Most of you fellas use way too much of it. I recalled the odd YouTube video I'd seen of people trying this stuff in the States and smirked. I'll leave it for a day when I'm feeling adventurous. Or maybe never, I silently added to myself. I can promise you the Tim Tams are good. Look up the Tim Tam Slam and save them for your morning cuppa. I made an appreciative murmur as I located the pack of chocolate-coated cookies. Kelly really was the friendly neighbor. Are you sure I can't get you a coffee now? Nah. Kelly waved her hand. Graham's about to head out, so I need to get back. 
Maybe next week if you're still here? I'll have a lot more time on my hands once Ben's back at school. You're still coming tomorrow, hey? Of course I nodded, and I completely understand. Thank you so much for this, it's really too much. Someone had to give you the Aussie induction. Kelly clapped my shoulder and chuckled. But if you need anything at all, just come on over. Just don't mind the noise. Or the mess. I'll remember to take you up on that. Kelly said her farewells and apologies for leaving so soon and jogged back to the fence and over to her property. It must have been quite the juggle, I mused, wrangling a young family and running a business. That she'd put thought into bringing me a gift basket put her in super mom category to me, who could barely remember all the family birthdays I was supposed to. I might just take Kelly up on the offer to hang out, but after the weekend it was time to really get serious about tying up the loose ends around here so I could get back home, find a new buyer for the house, rehome a wild dog, figure out how to sell a truck with no keys, and organize a freight company to ship stuff back home. I got the feeling I'd need to contact the car rental company to let them know I'd be in Australia for a little longer than I intended. Chapter 15 Gus headbutted me with his fuzzy, ginger face, and for a second I thought he was being playful, except when I blinked my eyes open, he was staring at me with that look. Wake up, he hissed. I frowned at the guest bedroom of Aunt Tabby's house and was about to tell him I was awake until I realized I wasn't. Gus wasn't in Australia, and he told me before I left, he would send any warnings through my dreams. Opening my mouth to ask after what kind of warning that could be, I screwed up my face as Gus took a swipe at my nose. I said, wake up. I sat up in bed with a sudden gasp, unsure if the bang I heard was inside my dreams or outside the house. My throat tightened, and I reminded myself to breathe. After the destruction of the patio set, Maybe the intruder had returned, so I eased out of bed as quietly as I could to tiptoe toward the window. Another thumping sound came from the direction of the kitchen, and for a second I feared whoever it was could be inside this time. But the noise was somehow metallic and further away than I first thought, so I swallowed and padded to the sliding glass door. It was pitch black outside, and a quick glance at my phone confirmed it was 2 a.m., I wasn't sure if I was brave enough to investigate, but after waiting a few minutes in complete silence, I told myself to stop being a sissy and turned the flashlight on the phone on. A quick sweep through the patio door didn't reveal any shining eyes in the darkness, so I eased into my boots and took shaking steps out onto the lawn. There was no sign of further destruction, it's not like there was much left to break so close to the house, so I headed in the dumpster's direction. As I drew closer, it looked like the pile of trash was smaller. Flummoxed, I crossed the distance and angled the light into the rusty metal box. Okay, I was either going out of my damn mind, or the assailant who had torn apart the patio set had gotten a case of the gilts. A good portion of the twisted iron furniture was in the dumpster, and I don't know why, but the sight was more frightening than the initial mess. Turning tail, I rushed back toward the house and closed the door behind me as I leaped inside. I was dealing with a psychopath, an actual Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, someone who goes around smashing things and comes back around to clean up after themselves. Who even does that? And they couldn't be that far away either. That they had stopped when I woke up told me they were keeping a real close eye on the house. And me. There weren't any cars I could see from the living room either on the driveway or the lane beyond. The only illumination out there were some solar lights in Beverly's yard, and I wasn't going to head out there to stand between this nutcase and escape. I knew I wouldn't get back to sleep anytime soon, so I decided to turn on every light in the house and start making some noise. I would have called the police, except the story was too absurd, even in my own head. If I'd scared them off, all the better. As soon as it was light out, I'd finish off the job of cleaning up and hope to all that was holy that would put off whoever it was from returning. It wasn't like I didn't have anything to do, so I put on some music from my phone and got busy packing up the house again. The dawn was the sweetest sight I ever saw. 
Still shaky though, I waited until it was broad daylight until I felt safe enough to jump in the shower and get ready to head outdoors. It was the day of the memorial service, so I knew I had to keep it together rather than head back to bed to get those hours of sleep back. It didn't take long to fill the dumpster with what remained of the debris on the lawn, and I considered it a job well done. Alfie from the landscape supply store said he'd be at the barbecue, so I figured I'd tell him directly to come pick up the dumpster at his earliest convenience. After a quick call to Mom to let her know about the local Inquisition being on the case, I made some breakfast and finally sat at the dining table, staring at the phone number and address of Billy Waite. I was glad Mom seemed in better spirits, but that may have had something to do with Grandma being away on council business. I didn't tell her about the nocturnal incidents that had occurred, not wanting to give her yet another person to worry about, but hearing her voice went a long way to soothing my nerves. It was a shame it was the weekend, not that I knew what hours the Inquisition kept, as I suspected I wouldn't hear back from Amelia until Monday. In the meantime, I had the details I needed staring me in the face to confront Aunt Tabby's ex-husband. Against better judgment I was tempted to get in the car and seek him out, but the barbecue also offered the opportunity to find out whether he'd been back in town lately. That would be the kind of confirmation that I was looking for. A stamp of legitimacy, on why a flame as old as that one would have something to do with the missing relics. After passing the time by checking my cousin Marissa's well-documented trip to New York on social media, I left her a message wishing her a wonderful vacation and put my phone away. I was antsy in a half-packed house, not quite sure what to do next, until I decided I could at least offer Kelly next door a hand setting up. It was a little awkward, approaching the house by ducking through the wire fence that separated the properties rather than up the drive, but I spotted Kelly and the kids by the house and gave a friendly wave. She managed to wave back underneath an armful of flowers, and a guy who must have been her husband unburdened her of the blooms as she met me halfway. Cat. Glad you're here. We're just getting things set up. Kelly didn't look much different than the last time I saw her, with her muddy rubber boots and baseball cap on. I got the feeling that was her usual attire, and I could absolutely get behind that kind of wardrobe. I know I'm a little early, but I wanted to lend a hand if I could. Kelly grinned and waved as if it were no consequence, no worries at all, why don't you come inside while I get the food organized? On the way in she introduced me to the kids, young Ben and tiny Talisha, along with Kelly's husband Graham. He appeared to be charged with keeping watch on the tearaways as they charged around the yard. Inside I met Kelly's parents and an aunt who looked like she might have been having a day trip from a retirement home while outside seemed to be Kelly's domain, her mother Diane commanded the kitchen. I soon had a cutting board and knife in my hands and was grateful to be prepping salads alongside the normal chatter of a family getting together. So how long did you say you'd be in town? Kelly added a good dose of vodka to the fruit punch. I should have some time next week to help with the house if you want. It's no trouble, I smiled. I've started on the smaller things around the house, but I might take you up on the offer come time to lug around the furniture. Awful business, that. Diane shook her head. Always takes twice as long as you think it will, and half the time you end up dragging your feet in grief. I spend Thursdays down at the op shop, so if there are things you need to find new homes for just give me a yell. Rick can bring the truck around. I stared a little dumbly at the woman, but Kelly kindly added, second-hand store? Mostly volunteers with the money going to charity. Oh, I nodded. I certainly can't take everything home, so that would be very much appreciated. I wasn't sure if there might be friends of Aunt Tabby who might want a keepsake or two, but either way I'm sure there'll be plenty of things for the store. Soon enough a steady stream of people began to arrive, most of them lugging coolers and smiling. It wasn't what I would expect of an event for mourning the dead, but somehow it felt right. The smell coming from the barbecue itself hung thick among the crowd of people chatting together and drinking mostly beer, and Kelly's husband Graham pressed a bottle in my palm with a wink. Not an Aussie Barbie without beer. Proper beer, too. 
I blinked down at the label and wondered how potent it was. I wasn't too proud to admit I was a bit of a lightweight when it came to alcohol. Ah, uh, thanks. But Graham only smiled and headed back to his post, the differences between countries not so different as he held court around the grill with a few other guys. I took a tentative sip and smacked my lips. It wasn't too shabby. If I thought I was going to have time to do much beyond greeting a sea of faces who came up to pass on condolences or share their favorite stories of Aunt Tabby, I was mistaken. But for a few scant hours I could forget about the missing relics, inquisitors, and weird nighttime visitors. It was all about people coming together to remember my aunt, and mostly tears were confined to hasty sniffles and covert dabbing of eyes with a handkerchief. Even Beverly was there without the usual sour expression I'd become accustomed to, even if she seemed to stay on the opposite side of the crowd to me. How are you doing, Katerina? Auntie May caught me by surprise, and I turned with a plate in my hand and a mouth full of what passed for sausages on this side of the world, or snags as Graham had put it. I wasn't a fan but refrained from grimacing as I swallowed. Auntie May, good to see you here. I stashed the plate circumspectly aside on a table and allowed the woman to envelope me in a hug. A younger woman who bore a marked resemblance stood beside her, and I smiled and offered a hand. I'm guessing you must be? I struggled to recall the name of Auntie May's daughter and made a comical face. Cheyenne, the woman laughed, glad to meet you. Auntie May beamed and glanced between us, like she was sizing us up against one another. Cheyenne runs the hairdressers in town, but before that she used to do the cultural tours with Jaron. You don't say? I smiled. Well, I'm sure you can probably tell me all the secrets of the place. I haven't even managed to take the boat out since I arrived. Auntie May frowned but caught herself and smoothed her features. Still packing up then? Did you find what you were looking for? Not yet. I bit my lip as I shook my head. But I'm chasing up one or two things. Hopefully they'll turn up in good. Ugh. Auntie May curled her lip and looked past me. It's that bloody Simon Flagstaff. The man has no shame, turning up here. I swiveled to follow Auntie May's gaze, and sure enough the realtor was in the crowd with a beer in his hand and what I supposed was a more casual shirt. He caught my eye and began making his way over. I groaned and turned back around hoping he would get the message to stay clear. But from the look on Auntie May's face he didn't, and I took a deep breath to calm my temper. Cat. Simon stepped around me and leaned down to smile. Great to see you here. I really take my hat off to Kelly for organizing all this. I'm sure your aunt. You. Auntie May poked Simon's chest and gripped her walking stick as though she was thinking of using it as a weapon. Can just bloody well leave this girl alone. Can't you show any damn respect for the dead? Leave your wheeling and dealing for business hours. Simon held his hands up. I assure you, Auntie May, I'm only here to pay my respects. Bulldust, she barked. Now Katerina doesn't want the likes of you. Is everything all right? Graham approached with his barbecue tongs in hand. I, ah, uh, I stammered. Simon here is bothering Katerina. His sort can't help themselves, always sniffing around after money. Auntie May glowered, and my cheeks burned. Although I thought Simon had ulterior motives he hadn't said or done anything untoward, yet. Really, Simon? Graham made a face. How about you bugger off, pal? This isn't the time or the place. Simon's face turned an ugly shade of red, and he curled his lip. Figures you too would see it that way. But I'm telling you now Myrtle Glen will be dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century whether you like it or not. There'll be winners and losers when all is said and done, and it'll be the ones too stuffy to see a good deal who'll miss out. My jaw dropped at the man's tirade, and he turned to stalk off away toward where the cars were parked on the lawn. I glanced between Auntie May and Graham a little sheepishly, and Graham only shook his head and returned to the grill. Auntie May watched Simon get into his car with a belligerent glare. Told you he'd kick off, she spat. I supposed she was right, 
and that she'd saved me the trouble of listening to him get to the point before shooing him off. I'm guessing Aunt Tabby's isn't the only place he's after. Probably not, but so far at least the city council has been tight on zoning to keep the place turning into Goldberry, she sighed. But the zoning which allows for the cultural tours also makes the property a target for developers. I shared a look with Cheyenne, who appeared like she was used to her mother speaking her mind with whoever she pleased and smirked. I supposed it was much like living with Grandma. Well, I promise I'm not going to let that happen. Somehow, I'll see it right. Good girl. Auntie May patted my shoulder. Now I'm going to go look for a feed. I let go a breath I didn't know I was holding as Auntie May made her way to the spread and glanced around at the guests who had undoubtedly noticed the little exchange with Simon. But despite the unpleasantness, the whole occasion was done in such good spirits, unlike a lot of the funerals I'd been to in my life, and while it didn't appear any formalities were forthcoming, I noticed a table had been set up with a photograph, flowers, and a sign-in book. I picked that up for you to take home. Kelly sidled up to me with a shy smile as a local B&B &B owner jotted down a message. I thought it would be nice for your family to see that Tabitha was loved over here too. I don't know whether it was the beer I drank, or if the sentiment caught me by surprise, but my face crumpled and Kelly pulled me in for a hug. At once feeling overly self-conscious, I willed myself to composure and gave Kelly a squeeze. It's just been too busy, you know, to properly remember her. You've got a lot on your plate. Kelly gave a lopsided smile. Sure. I took a deep breath and glanced around. Seeing people like Jan and Auntie May around was something I expected, but for the likes of Constable Lewis to be chatting to Alfie in a more relaxed polo t-shirt caught me by surprise. I guess maybe I assumed it would be just a couple of close friends of hers. But the town has really turned out for the occasion. Tabitha was popular among the kids. Kelly smiled as if recalling a pleasant memory. She used to let some of us into her fortune-telling tent for free and tell us all what we wanted to hear. I remember sneaking in, I couldn't have been older than fifteen, and she told me I'd marry Graham one day. She shook her head with a grin. I must have been mooning over him pretty bad for her to notice. I chuckled at that, glad that at least to some extent Aunt Tabby had the opportunity to use her magic for some good in a regular town, but Constable Lewis' sharp look over my shoulder caught my attention. I followed his gaze back toward my aunt's house and was surprised to see a woman in a black business suit walking around the house with a folder in her arms and a nondescript black SUV parked in the driveway. There was something about the way she moved, with the utmost confidence and looking like she was expecting to pounce on someone, that told me she wasn't some kind of door-to-door -door salesperson. I startled as a hand gently squeezed my shoulder and shrank back as Constable Lewis looked down at me from his considerable height. Would you like me to go with you to see who that is? He quirked an eyebrow, and though his voice was kind, I could tell he was on edge. Ah, should I? I guess that depends what you've been up to, he frowned across the open green that stood between us and the house. I know a detective when I see one. Crap. I realized who it had to be, and I doubted very highly that Inquisitor Amelia Ward wanted the local police officer getting under her feet. Um, well, I stammered, sure, I'd appreciate it. I glanced at Kelly, who only looked a little uncomfortable, then noticed the rest of the crowd stealing not-so-covert glimpses our way. Great. One of the least pleasant things about small towns. I wondered how long it would take for news of my mysterious visitor to become common knowledge among the residents of Myrtle Glen. Chapter 16 As Constable Lewis and I crossed the distance between houses, I felt like my back was burning from the people who must have been enjoying the spectacle. Then again, the look Amelia leveled our way wasn't exactly friendly either. I wished she'd at least stayed on the far side of the house out of sight but it appeared we were going to have this conversation on the patio. I don't know what I expected her to look like exactly, but sharp suit aside, she didn't strike me as an inquisitor.
Long midnight black hair hung around her face, and her skin was a deep natural tan, which made her bright red lipstick really pop. The two high heels she wore seemed impractical for chasing down criminals. But who was I to judge? She eyeballed Constable Lewis, and I thought she could probably tell he was an officer much the same as he'd identified her. When we got within respectable talking distance, she flipped the folder in her arm open and drew out what I thought was a pen. Except that it wasn't. Just as soon as Constable Lewis opened his mouth, Amelia Ward pushed a button on the side of a slender device, and the poor constable stood dumb, his mouth hanging open. It was a condition I'd seen once before with a detective in California, though I'd never known how the stupefaction was done. I really wish you hadn't brought him over here. Amelia sighed and tucked the wand back in the folder. Nice to meet you, Cat. Ah, you too, Amelia. My gaze lingered on Constable Lewis, and for a second I was kinda wistful that Inquisitors got to use magic on regular folks. I sure could have used that wand once or twice in my life. He noticed you first and offered to escort me. It would have looked weird if I said no. Amelia looked over my shoulder and pouted. We better take this inside then. Come on, Lurch. Constable Lewis followed Amelia into the house, and I was more than a little chagrined that I'd left the sliding door unlocked. After seating herself at the table, she didn't look up from her folder as she pointed to the living room. Go, sit. I bit my lip and folded my arms as I stared at Constable Lewis taking a seat on the sofa, as if moving on a set of strings. Does that do any, you know, permanent damage? Amelia looked up from her paperwork and frowned. He might have a headache in the morning. I took a deep breath and sat across from the woman, putting the moral issues of stupefaction aside. I thought you would have just called. If you're here, I'm guessing it's bad news. Amelia ran her tongue over her teeth and looked like she was bracing herself. I'm afraid our divination expert found traces of magic when he examined your aunt's body. He said it's too late to get a proper reading on exactly what it was, but he suspects a magical poison. The words felt like a sharp slap to the face, and my body froze. Murder was an eventuality that I'd considered, but still, it came as a shock. I didn't want to tell you that over the phone. Amelia sighed. I'm really sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I reminded myself to breathe. It came in a ragged gasp, and I fought ugly tears threatening to overwhelm me. So, what now? I managed. Amelia tapped a typed report splayed out on the table. I'm following up on the leads you gave me. Our office is down in Melbourne, so I thought I'd drop in here first. Do you want to explain to me again why you think this ex-husband of hers may have had a hand in this? Blinking, I fetched Aunt Tabby's phone and the wedding picture from the living room and sat across from Amelia. I guess it started as just a bad feeling. Grandma hated the man's guts, and he would be the only person in Australia who we know for sure had intimate knowledge of the relics. But she kept the wedding photo after all these years right on the bookcase, and she even has his number in her cell phone. I proffered both unlocked phone and picture, and Amelia took them. She inspected the photograph, taking it out of the frame to note the date on the back, and began scrolling on the cell. Don't you think that's weird? I asked. Maybe they were in contact recently or something. It's not unheard of for people to get back together after divorcing, right? I can't go off weird, but most people would probably only keep the wedding photo for Dart's practice. Amelia snapped some photos from her phone and began tapping away as though she were firing off a text message. I'm sending this to the office so they can check it out, but it won't hurt to go pay the guy a visit seeing as though I've already come this far. I stood with a sudden rush of adrenaline, raking my hands across my scalp. Okay, well, let's go then. Amelia's eyes widened, and she held up a hand. This is Inquisition business. I can't have. She's my aunt, I gritted my teeth. And if you think I'm just going to wait around here, you're sadly mistaken. I know this is all a lot to take in and you're upset, but... I have his address. I folded my arms and lifted my chin. 
If you don't let me come with you, I'll just follow. Amelia didn't bother to hide her annoyed expression and closed her eyes for a moment as though willing herself to patience. There's a reason people close to a case should stay the hell out. You're emotional. It's to be expected. But your family's reputation notwithstanding I can't have you blowing up the case. My family's reputation. If Grandma was good at anything, it was at bullying her way into things. I'm coming along. If you don't want me to say anything, fine. But if you leave me out and the investigation hits a dead end, I'll let people know how lax your department is. Amelia sat back, affronted, but I didn't care. An unexplained death in the magical community should have been investigated, and she had admitted that lost time had cost them a proper divination into the cause of death. Amelia snapped her folder shut and stood, her face stony. Fine, but if you put this investigation in any kind of jeopardy, I'll arrest you for interfering with a murder case. I let out a breath and nodded before glancing at Constable Lewis. What are you going to do with him? Amelia snapped her fingers and waved Constable Lewis over. He blinked as if confused and Amelia turned on a million-dollar smile. So glad Kat's got someone like you to be watching out for her during this hard time. But as I said, I'm just here to talk about the insurance so I'll just run Kat into town so we can take some photocopies of Tabitha Crow's identification documents. Constable Lewis scratched the back of his neck and nodded. Oh, of course. I should let you two get back to it. It was a little disconcerting on both ends. That Amelia could spin a yarn like that on a moment's notice while the officer lapped it up without question. But he was already on his way out the door and back to the memorial, which reminded me I likewise should be there. But seeing justice for my aunt was more important. Rather than go back to give my apologies for leaving early, I settled for a big wave at Kelly, who looked my way as Constable Lewis crossed the boundary fence, and she likewise lifted her hand. Questions could come later. For now I had a disgruntled inquisitor and a long car trip to deal with. Apparently, Amelia's acceptance of my presence didn't extend to polite conversation as we drove two hours north to Coola Vale over the state line. I couldn't exactly blame her but turning up the radio blaring with pop music was unnecessary. She didn't ask me a single question as she kept her eyes on the road, and for the most part I kept my mouth shut, even if I did have a boatload of questions about my aunt's ex-husband. Once the signposts for Cool Laval became more frequent on the highway, I got to the point where I couldn't hold them back. So, have you even looked into this guy? Amelia shot me a dirty look, and I bit the inside of my cheek. I was questioning her integrity and she really didn't deserve that. Sorry, it's just that I really don't know much about him. He and my aunt split when I was little. It seemed to appease her a touch, and Amelia raised her eyebrows before returning her gaze to the road. William Waite moved out here with your aunt 52 years ago and became a permanent citizen three years later. He's been a member of the Magic Association since arriving, and we have no misdemeanors on record. His registered brand of magic is a specific kind of alchemy, metallurgy, which has put him in good stead over his long career in mining. He has a few personal stakes in mines which take a good haul of gold and copper. I blinked, thinking that was about as normal as it could get for a magic user. So, he's rich? From what we can see, he lives a pretty comfortable life. Amelia turned off the highway. By the time he and Tabitha divorced, he was in a position to hand over the house and a tidy sum of money before skipping out. I guess he won't be hunting the family down to contest the will. I frowned. But then, it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to be after a bunch of relics which mostly deal with the site. I wouldn't jump to conclusions. People do strange things when money and sentiment are involved. It didn't take long from there to pull up at a dusty property with a large house sitting squarely in the middle. Like many of the homes I'd seen in Australia, it was a bungalow style and sat beside similar houses on small acreage on the outskirts of town. It didn't look particularly affluent, but then I guessed people with money didn't much like spending it. Amelia turned into the drive and blocked in a Land Rover before hopping out without a word. 
Guessing that I should take her lead, I followed her to the door, feeling at odds with her professional attire wearing jeans and a knitted sweater sewn with pearls, which I'd borrowed from my aunt's wardrobe. There was something about the way a police officer knocked, though. I jumped despite myself as Amelia pounded on the door like she had every right to be there. It took a couple of minutes for an elderly man to open the door and glance suspiciously at us. Mr. Waite? I'm Amelia Ward, Inquisitor of the Second Order. Inquisitors on a Saturday? He opened the door a little wider, and his gray mustache twitched as he obviously warred with whether to invite us in. His accent was remarkably local for someone I knew was born in the States. But then, that had been a very long time ago. Who's dead, then? My jaw dropped before I realized it was supposed to be some kind of bad joke. Amelia kept her face deadpan. Your ex-wife, Mr. Waite. Tabitha Crow. His face fell, and somewhere deep in my psyche, I thought I should have been pleased by the expression. But I wasn't, and Billy ran his hand over his mustache and waved down the hall. You better come in. After Amelia introduced us properly, and keeping me quiet lest my accent give away the family connection, we sat in a well-appointed kitchen while Billy rattled around making coffee. Amelia flicked her folder open to a clean sheet of paper, and I wrung my hands under the table, doing my best to keep from fidgeting. You know, I haven't seen Tabitha in years. Billy carried two mugs over and sat them in front of us, despite having declined the offer. I wasn't about to go drinking coffee with someone who may have poisoned my aunt. What happened? He reached over the counter for his own mug and sat at the opposite end of the table from us. The air in the room was tense, and I looked to Amelia, who didn't seem in a tremendous rush to put him out of his misery. Can you clarify years, Mr. Waite? Her pen hovered over her notepad. Well, ah, I suppose it must be close to ten. We never kept in touch, but I saw her fortune-telling tent at a local fair. I'd meant to leave, but she spotted Jenny and I. Tabitha was never one for making much of a scene so she just glared as we went past. And who is Jenny? Amelia scribbled notes, while keeping her eye on Billy. My wife. Billy took a deep breath and grimaced. I suppose Tabitha would have called her the other woman. Ick. Billy had cheated on Tabitha, Grandma was right, Billy was a lowlife. And where were you between Wednesday the 6th and Friday the 9th? If the revelation disgusted Amelia, she didn't show it, and I wondered if she'd known about the infidelity before arriving. Billy scowled. What is this about? You two come here telling me the woman I divorced 30 years ago died, and I'm a suspect after bumping into her at a fair sometime in the last decade. Just following all the leads, Mr. Waite. We believe the cause of death was suspicious. Now, your movements between the 6th and 9th? Billy's mouth worked, but he gave over with a frown. Well, you lot must really be out of ideas if you're banging down my door. Last Wednesday to Friday? Same as always, I go and sit with Jenny for most of the day and have a feed at the pub on the way home. Your wife. Amelia frowned. She's in a nursing home, Alzheimer's he snapped. Now, is that all? I'll need the details of the nursing home and pub, and if you don't mind. Amelia nudged a form across the table. You can consent to a reading which will speed up the process on our end. A reading? Billy looked truly flabbergasted. Do you really think I did this? Covering all bases, Mr. Waite. Amelia held his stare. Fine. Billy pulled the waiver closer to him and produced a pen from his shirt pocket. He signed it with a flourish and bared his teeth in a nasty smile. Happy? I appreciate your cooperation. There might have been a touch of amusement around Amelia's eyes, but after she confirmed the locations Billy had frequented and made to leave, I could help myself from bringing up the pertinent topic. Tabitha Crow's family relics were missing along with every magical item she owned, Mr. Waite. Now, I'm sure you understand that very few people would have cause to know about them. Any ideas on who may have been after them? I smiled a little too sweetly, and Billy curled his lip, recognition dawning on his face. Now she speaks. 
Tell me, Inquisitor, is it above board to let family members follow you around without full disclosure? Amelia glared daggers at me, even as I stood and stared down at the man. If you haven't seen Aunt Tabby in ten years, then tell me why she still has your wedding picture on a shelf, huh? Or why your cell number was in her phone? Maybe she became your other, other woman? Billy recoiled, then sneered. Why should it be my problem if the woman held a candle for me all these years? She never remarried so far as I heard. I had to beg her to sign the divorce paperwork. He pointed at Amelia. I've agreed to have my head poked at to clear my name, but even the cold hard truth is never enough for a crow. My cheeks burned, and I opened my mouth with every intention to let the man know exactly what I thought of him. But Amelia caught my elbow and steered me toward the door. We'll be in touch, Mr. Waite, she called over her shoulder. Looking forward to it, he grunted. He didn't bother showing us out, and after closing the door behind us, Amelia stormed back to the car. You had one rule to follow, she growled. I caught her up and hopped into the passenger side. Sorry, but you weren't asking the right questions. Amelia peeled out of the driveway without another word, and I guessed we were in for another long drive of loud music and frosty silence. Chapter 17 As it turned out, we only made the brief trip into the town of Coulevelle itself and pulled up at a café. Amelia got out of the car without a word, and I followed her inside, feeling a little sheepish now my head had cooled off and I could see what kind of position I'd put her in. I'd been so desperate to make the connection that I'd envisaged between the pair. As I sat beside her on a stool by the window, I figured it was up to me to make amends. Look, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have gone all vengeful witch back there. Damn right you shouldn't have. Amelia propped her head in her hands and closed her eyes. I tried to tell you, nobody can keep a cool head when it comes to family. I bit my lip and nodded. So what now? I'll check out these alibis, but that doesn't account for his movements overnight. I'm having our tech illusionists look at his mobile phone location data and scour the witchy web. Witches who deal in poison aren't blatant enough to list them there outright, but we try to keep tabs on suspicious vendors. If he is our killer, though, he may very well have gone in person to make the order. Her tone was businesslike, but I could tell she thought we were chasing a dead end. You don't think he did it? Amelia glanced at me from the corner of her eye and sighed. Neither do you. I suppose there wasn't much I could say to that. As someone with personal experience with being cheated on, I couldn't help but loathe the man, but he didn't strike me as a killer. My conjured dreams of a bitter ex-husband just didn't add up to what I saw in real life. Not really. But someone did it, and if their motive was tied to her possessions, I have no idea who it might be. We ordered coffee while Amelia got on the phone to check out Billy's story. It matched what he told us, and Amelia's people in HQ couldn't find anything that placed him in Myrtle Glen that week. She hung on the phone a little longer, though, and began scrawling on her notepad, with a frown. After she got off the call, she swiveled in her seat and tapped the page. Nothing on Billy Waite, but my colleague mentioned a potion dealer in Woodford. She made a recent sale for an astral projection potion, but the data is scrambled on it. We've seen those kinds of patterns before when people try to cover their tracks. I don't know why my brain made the connection then and there, but my jaw dropped as I recalled the vial I'd found in Aunt Tabby's greenhouse. I'd almost forgotten about the brew, which I'd assumed at the time had some kind of gardening application. Perhaps if I wasn't so fixated on Billy back at the house, I might have twigged the moment Amelia spoke about poisons. Um, now, I probably should have thought of this back at the house, but I think I may have the murder weapon. What? Amelia hissed. I dragged my hands over my face and groaned. I'm sorry, I didn't even think about it until you said the words potion dealer. I found a vial in the greenhouse a few days ago. I assumed it was just an ordinary potion. But maybe that's just where the killer stashed the evidence. Amelia's jaw flexed, and she took a measured breath. 
I'll pick it up later and get it taken over to the lab. I suppose it has your fingerprints all over it by now. I cringed. When I found it, I had no reason to think. Amelia held her hand up. Forget it. Having it is better than not having it. Right. I swallowed. So where is Woodford then? Maybe an hour away. Amelia was busy punching coordinates into her phone. I looked out the window where late afternoon was darkening with heavy clouds. Might be a late one, huh? Be all part of the job. Amelia gulped the last of her coffee and stood. Better get on the road if we want to get back to Myrtle Glen before midnight. The only thought that crossed my mind was that it was taking an awfully long time for us to be supposedly making photocopies of Aunt Tabby's ID paperwork. The trip to Woodford was more like an hour and a half, though I couldn't tell if that was further away from Myrtle Glen or closer. We drove for the most part in heavy rain, but at least Amelia cooled it on the radio. She spoke a little about the work they did in solving magical murders and the burgeoning field of tech illusionists who did a lot of heavy lifting when it came to busting open a case. Never thought I'd envy an illusionist, Amelia chuckled, but their pay grade is climbing. My boss is now a tech illusionist and new positions are opening up all the time for their kind. And what's your brand? I'd wondered, but since she hadn't offered, I thought maybe it was rude to ask an inquisitor something like that. I'm a medium. She smiled and shrugged. Used to be the most highly sought qualification in my line of work. I always knew I'd end up working for the Inquisition. It made sense, and I knew one or two mediums back home. Their magic was not unlike a seer, and probably just as rare in its natural form. I imagine speaking to ghosts comes in pretty handy, though. Sometimes. But on the job, it only really helps if a soul hangs around to tell the tale. Mostly they just depart and let us figure it out on our own. Ha. Huh. Maybe we had it all wrong when it came to unfinished business. I have to make a point of telling that to Grandma, though I thought she would hold on to the superstition. But before I could take the conversation any further, Amelia pulled into a street and pointed to a house across the road. Woodford appeared to be a bigger town than most, and this time we were in a more densely populated area where sweet little timber-sided homes sat almost side by side. The only thing that marked the house Amelia pointed at from the others was a couple of brightly colored wind chimes on the porch with a lit sign marking the place as Minerva's Herbalist Remedies. From what I could see so far in Australia, witches seemed to make a split living between servicing regular clientele as well as magical. It wasn't different from how things went back home, save for the few towns which were almost exclusively inhabited by magic users. I shouldn't have been surprised by the cheery facade of the house, but I pictured maybe a spooky-looking shack out in the countryside. Now, are you going to keep to your word, or do I have to leave you in the car? Amelia arched an eyebrow. I held up my hands in supplication. I'll be good. I swear. Amelia narrowed her eyes but got out of the car in the pouring rain and held her folder over her head to cover her hair. With no such protection for myself, I hunched and folded my arms as I trotted behind and was glad to get under the sheltering porch. An old-fashioned doorbell hung by an entrance fitted with stained glass, and Amelia rang it with gusto to be heard over the din of the rain. It was almost completely dark and I wondered if Minerva might have a regular house someplace else and used the property as her place of business. But the door opened a crack, and a woman with wizened features and frizzy hair dyed a vivid orange stuck her head out. Can I help you? Minerva? Amelia cocked her head and the woman nodded. I'm Inquisitor Ward and this is Cat Crow. Do you mind if we come in? Minerva's eyes widened, but she stepped back and opened the door. You people again? I've told you I'm keeping my nose clean. Too much trouble comes barking otherwise. I was guessing when Amelia said the woman was on their radar that they had busted her once or twice before. But there had been an argument older than the hills about culpability of witches who either provided hex charms or poisons. I didn't have any particular insight on how things were done in Australia, 
but there was strong campaigning back in the States that a witch wasn't responsible for what people did with their products. Just as a gun store wasn't liable for people choosing to shoot someone. Gray Area didn't begin to describe it. We'll see. Amelia raised her eyebrows. Are you going to invite us in? Minerva grumbled, but kicked at a line of salt at the door and stepped aside. Don't reckon I have much of a choice. Inside, the house felt much more properly witchy beyond a hall with a consulting room on the right-hand side. Minerva must have dwelled in the back section of the house, and after opening the door to the kitchen, the heavy scents of herbs hit my senses, overridden by the pungent scent of eucalyptus. Every conceivable surface was covered in bottles, dried herbs, oils, and a potion master's assortment of tools. A rack over the island bench held cauldrons of various sizes, and mortar and pestles sat at the ready. At the dining table by the kitchen, neat labels with fancy calligraphy were piled up, and Minerva pushed aside a laptop before sweeping a space for us to sit at. Well, what is it now? I know you people keep tabs on my online store, so how about this time you just tell me what you're looking for? Minerva plonked herself down and folded her arms. Glad to get to the point, Amelia wrinkled her nose and perched on the edge of her seat, casting her eye around like she was reluctant to have crumbling herbs mess up her suit. You sold an astral projection potion a couple of weeks ago, but both you and I know that wasn't what it was. So? Minerva shrugged, her face a mask of belligerence. My clients prefer discretion. It's not a crime. Perhaps. But you and I both know it's against Witchy Web's terms of service to sell poisons. And you might not have direct culpability, but if you don't cooperate in providing me the details of who you sold the poison to, I can get you on obstruction of justice and make a complaint to Witchy Web to boot. Ha! Huh. Minerva rolled her eyes. I know your tech people have their tentacles deep into the website. They can't figure it out? The data is scrambled, Amelia confirmed leaving me to wonder why she was being so open about it. But if you don't give us a name, they might want to do a more comprehensive investigation. We could confiscate every gizmo in the house for inspection. Her eyes wandered to the laptop. You might get it all back in a few months, depending on whether we uncover anything else that might warrant investigation. Minerva's face turned an ugly shade of red, and I sat back with a smirk. Amelia definitely knew what she was doing. I don't know who it was, Minerva grunted. They placed the order using guest checkout and left a message in the special instructions part. When I looked back on the order to post it off, that box was suddenly empty. My best guess is it's one of your guys gone rogue. I'll need the address you sent it to. Amelia steepled her fingers. Fine. Minerva shrugged and pulled her laptop over. She brought up the sales page in front of us and pointed to the delivery details. After jotting it down, Amelia stood and gave Minerva a level stare. We'll be in touch. Looking forward to it. Minerva made a face, but before I stood I frowned at the screen. Minerva Flagstaff? The woman scowled. Yeah, what of it? Any relation to a Simon Flagstaff by chance? I glanced at Amelia, but she seemed more curious than angry at me. He's a cousin on my non-magical side. Why? Minerva made a face like she was trying to connect the dots. And does he know what his aunt does for a living? I arched an eyebrow. Of course not, she spat. I barely speak to that part of the family. We were at a wedding together last week in Adelaide, and they snubbed me for the most part. My mind fired a million miles an hour as I tried to figure it out in my head. If Simon and Minerva were together a week ago, did he hit up his cousin for a brew that would get my aunt out of the way so he could make a sale? I think you might want to get all the details for the wedding. I spoke to Amelia, my eyes pleading, as I didn't want to voice my suspicion in front of Minerva. Amelia nodded slowly, her forehead creased with faint lines. Right, Minerva? Looks like we'll be staying a little longer. Chapter 18 Amelia took the details of the wedding, 
with particular interest in Simon Flagstaff. If what Minerva said was true, they'd arrived in Adelaide on separate flights two days before Aunt Tabby died and attended a family dinner before the wedding ceremony the following day. Minerva wasn't sure when Simon had flown back in, but she herself had traveled home the morning that Aunt Tabby had been found dead. Amelia scribbled all the details in her folder and told the woman to stay put while we went to verify details in the car. When we got outside I thought I was fit to burst from not talking. Simon has a financial interest in Aunt Tabby's death. It's too much to be a coincidence, isn't it? Amelia herded me toward the car with a scowl, and only spoke when both doors were firmly closed. What is this? Are we in a cone of silence now or something? Inquisition cars are warded. We don't go blabbering about our opinions in front of a suspect's property. And that's all we've got right now, Cat. Opinions. I dropped my head back against the headrest and groaned. It's the closest we've come so far, though, isn't it? Not if this story checks out and this Simon of yours, the estate agent, if I recall, was interstate when your aunt was poisoned. Oh, come on, that woman was as slippery as a snake. She obviously knows how your department works and could have made sure they were both out of the way with a neat alibi at the time of death. As I spoke, conviction firmed in my mind. And the vial I found in the greenhouse? It reeked of eucalyptus. Tell me you couldn't smell the stuff inside. Oh yeah? Amelia cocked her head. If she was that smart, why is there a transaction at all on Witchy Web? If it was her cousin, she would have kept that offline. But the vial could be the key to pinning this on Minerva. Damn it. She was right. I raked my fingers through my hair, irritated at the logic. Unless Simon had made the order without Minerva's knowledge. But that doesn't mean she didn't know who she sold that poison to. Witches like Minerva will work with the Inquisition only when they're cornered. Their whole business model revolves around a good rep for being staunch to their clientele. Amelia thrummed the steering wheel with her fingers, but maybe the connection gives us enough to bring her in for an involuntary reading if we can establish that this vial of yours came from Minerva. She went immediately for her phone to call who I assumed were her superiors, and I remained quiet, not wanting to disrupt her train of thought. Performing an involuntary reading outside the Inquisition could land a magic user in the kind of trouble which ended in an enchanted cell. I thought the practice wasn't even used all that much inside magical law enforcement. Amelia was relaying the story to whoever was on the line, a woman from what I could hear, who interrupted incessantly. I know that. Amelia's jaw muscle flexed as she gritted her teeth. What does the postal address turn up? Aha. Uh -huh. You know she's saying it's a rogue agent, right? Of course I don't believe it. But if our people can't unscramble the data this person poses a serious risk. Exactly. Oh, okay. Understood. She ended the call and puffed out her cheeks. My boss isn't happy, but she's agreed to an arrest. She wants to question Minerva herself before she'll agree to a reading. Well, that's something? I gave a lopsided smile. Let's just hope it isn't a dead end. The postal address on the order was an abandoned warehouse in Melbourne. We can't figure out how it was diverted to wherever it ended up after that. Amelia reached to open the glove box and fetched a pair of handcuffs. I'll drop you home on the way. My boss is going to be less than impressed that I let you tag along this far. I opened my mouth to protest, then clicked my teeth shut. It was one thing to tag along for a car ride but being in HQ while someone was getting their head read under duress was another. And you need to stay the hell away from this Simon guy. If it turns out he's connected somehow, leveling a finger in his direction will only send him underground. My cheeks burned like I was a chastened youngster, and I sighed. Fine, but I can't help it if he turns up at the house. He could have been the one to trash the patio furniture. I hadn't told Amelia about the weird occurrence of the early hours cleanup, but I fobbed it off as irrelevant. If Simon was a killer, having a few screws loose to boot couldn't be all that surprising. All right, let's go make this arrest. Minerva kicked and screamed like a banshee as Amelia subdued her, 
which was quite a sight from a woman her age. After the old potions maker tried to bite the Inquisitor, Amelia threatened to gag her on the ride to Melbourne. Once outside, though, Minerva must have decided to keep up appearances with the neighbors and held her nose in the air as she climbed into the back of the SUV. Amelia pressed a button in the front which sent up some kind of force field around Minerva, and my eyes boggled as I turned in the seat to see the woman's mouth moving with no sound. One of the better innovations the Inquisition has come up with. Before restraining fields, trips back to the office were pretty tedious. I wasn't sure I agreed as my skin prickled from the proximity of the barrier it felt like itchy static electricity gone wild. We got back on the road and even though I knew Minerva couldn't hear us, I kept quiet on the trip. After the events of the day, my eyes were droopy and the long lull of highway driving in the dark had me yawning most of the way. Amelia was stoic though and looked vigilant behind the wheel. When we pulled into Myrtle Glen, I worried a little at Minerva knowing my address. I voiced my concern to Amelia, who gave me a strange look. She can't see us, Cat. She's in her own little lockbox back there. Huh. I frowned, imagining how disconcerting it would be to feel the pull of driving while in an otherworldly cell. I haven't seen anything like it before. Cutting edge. Amelia pulled up the driveway to Aunt Tabby's house and smiled. Why don't you go and grab that vial and I'll let you know as soon as we're done with her. Just keep your head down until then. I stifled a yawn as I unbuckled my seatbelt and opened the door. Sure thing. Just don't leave me hanging, okay? Squinting against the headlights, I approached the front of the house and let myself in. I'd left the vial in the pocket of a pair of jeans and located them in a heap in the guest bedroom. After trotting back out I handed the vial through the window and watched Amelia pull out of the drive. In the strange space while my eyes adjusted from light to dark, I went around the back of the house with a funny feeling prickling the hairs on the back of my neck. Perhaps I should have asked Amelia to hang around. I feared someone could have been standing within feet of me and I wouldn't know. The refrigerator door was open again, leaving a small pool of light against the side of the house. I glanced inside and wasn't surprised that the last case of beer had disappeared, less the detritus of shredded cardboard and crushed cans from last time. Closing the door, I made a beeline for the front of the house and locked up behind me. Inside I swallowed and hugged my arms around my middle. Perhaps it was as innocuous as someone helping themselves after the memorial next door. I checked through the kitchen window after turning on the outdoor light and couldn't see any mess. Deciding now was as good a time as any to call mom and grandma and at least hear some friendly voices, being close to midnight, which I thought must be morning back home, I drew all the curtains and climbed onto the sofa. It was grandma who answered, and I brought her up to speed on the situation as succinctly as I could, mindful it was the first she was hearing about the suspected poisoning. After I finished, she was quiet for a good while. Then I heard a scratchy breath on the other line. Oh, cat. Her voice was thick, which was so unlike her I wanted to cry. I shouldn't have sent you. It should be me over there fixin' this up. I just never would have thought. Neither did I. I blinked away tears. But I'm not on my own. The woman from the Inquisition really has a bee in her bonnet about this one. I'm sure they'll piece the case together soon enough. I grandma's voice trembled. It's just how she didn't see it come and truly has me kerflamoxed. That she wasn't spitting and hissing and instead, using words like kerflamoxed was perhaps the most disturbing thing I'd heard all day. I know. I chewed my lip as I thought about the high-tech magic Amelia had at her disposal. But maybe that wasn't an accident either. These inquisitors have all kinds of newfangled magical items, Maybe the killer had something up their sleeve that blocked Aunt Tabby's sight somehow. You could be right. The Council are always yammering about new threats with this technology stuff. I smiled a little at the notion of Grandma thinking she was older than technology itself. Either way, we should have some answers soon. How's Mom doing? Out in the barn with Polly. Jerome cut himself up pretty bad out on his tractor. 
I reckon the man will be mostly stitches by the time they're done with him, Grandma tutted. Just another day in the office for Mom, who was ironically at her happiest when covered in blood. Well, I'm really beat, Grandma. Can you send her my love? Course. You just take care out there, Katarina Crow. If nothing comes out of this potions woman, I'll be booking the next flight out. I swallowed, not sure I wanted to be around if vengeful Grandma touched down in Australia. I'm sure something will turn up soon. And really I'm fine, I'm sorry that I had to be the one to tell you about all this. Don't you worry about me, Chickabitty, you just go get some sleep. My breath caught in my throat, she hadn't called me that in years. Love you, Grandma. You too. Call me when you hear something. After ending the call I felt like I'd been wrapped in a warm hug, despite being a world away from home. It wasn't often that Grandma showed an affectionate side, and although it was in some ways concerning I couldn't help feeling reassured. Even the missing beer didn't worry me too much, nothing disastrous had happened so far, so I finally let my body slump and couldn't even find the energy to pull myself up off the sofa before succumbing to exhaustion. Chapter 19 I woke with a crick in my neck, and though the curtains were drawn, the light peeking in through the cracks told me I'd slept in late. My mouth was intolerably dry, and my stomach felt hollow from all that investigating with only the one coffee stop to tide me over. With considerable effort, I rolled off the sofa and trudged to the kitchen like a zombie to get a glass of water. Staring a little dumbly across the lawn, I noted that nothing was out of place following the refrigerator incident. It looked peaceful out there, with the sun bathing the native gardens in a warm glow. It was a sight worth remembering, both familiar and completely different, and I understood why Aunt Tabitha had spent most of her life a world away. The lanky trees held a rustic grace, and while the woods back home were dark and ominous at times, the vegetation in Australia seemed like it had room to breathe. Without bothering to slip into my boots, I tracked outside, relishing the feeling of dirt between my toes and the scent of grass in the air in the scant few moments before wakefulness brought me back to the present. Thoughts of speculation, treachery, and chasing leads swirled in my mind, and I wondered how Amelia had gotten on with Minerva if indeed they hadn't just stuck the woman in a cell until a more respectable hour. Reluctantly, I headed back inside to get cleaned up and grab something to eat. There were no messages on my phone, and rather than call Amelia, knowing she'd had a bigger day than I had, I decided the only thing I could do was try to keep busy. The house was a mess of boxes already, in a half-state of packed but functional. The 70s decor stood out more starkly without Aunt Tabby's knickknacks lying around, and I wondered if I might have some time to at least take the yellowed wallpaper away and give the place a lick of paint. Maybe I'd watched one too many of those home improvement TV shows, but for some reason I felt the urge to make the place look its best before leaving. Like with a fresh makeover, I'd find a buyer who would immediately see the charm of the place and agree to never sell it to a developer. I was probably just being naive. I had done nothing out in the garage though. It was close enough to being outside for my tastes, so I slipped my phone into the back pocket of my jeans and hauled boxes, tape, and markers outside. I wasn't sure there would be much worth keeping out there, but as I glanced at the dumpster that stood between the garage and the house, I figured I could at least get rid of some trash that had accumulated in dark corners. After hauling up the roller door and carefully bracing it, I caught a flash of movement from the corner of my eye and jumped in surprise. Oh, didn't mean to scare you. Kelly grinned and held her hands up. Just saw you outside and wanted to come see if all was okay after yesterday. I clutched my chest to slow my hammering heart but giggled and nodded. Yeah, sorry for skipping out without a word. Who'd have thunk an insurance agent would do house calls on a Saturday, huh? Kelly shrugged and was kind enough not to press me further. Well, you didn't miss much. People didn't stick around for much longer after you left. I think some of them were heading to the pub. I wanted to say thank you, by the way. I bit my lip. It really touched me to see everyone come together like that. Just the way we do things around here. Kelly nodded to the garage. Need a hand in there? 
So she wasn't kidding when she said she wanted to help. I'd taken an immediate liking to Kelly when I'd met her over the fence, and she hadn't let me down on that gut feeling yet. You any good at starting trucks without a key? I smirked. Kelly frowned, first at the braced roller door, then at the dusty yellow truck inside. Getting it started won't help much if we can't get it out. What happened to the door? Oh, you know, after I got it open last time it almost fell on my head. I stared at my makeshift arrangement, the door stuck halfway open, unsure if I wanted to chance it a second time. Kelly pushed up her sleeves though and ducked underneath. After jostling it around some she pushed it up overhead, and the door creaked to a stable position up out of the way. I must have looked like a dumb city girl when it didn't come crashing down a moment later, but all I could think about was the hex, which had been a little too quiet since then. Now, you don't have keys for the ute? Kelly frowned and began fumbling around in each of the wheel arches. I had already tried that but folded my arms as she made her inspection. I've been right through the house and haven't seen them. The house set doesn't have anything close to a car key on it. That's weird. Kelly clapped her hands together but failed to get all the black grease off her palms. She rubbed them on her jeans instead, and I thought if cousin Marissa saw that, she'd be liable to have a heart attack. Tabitha drove it around all the time, and I doubt she was using a screwdriver to get it started. I puffed out my cheeks as Kelly tried each of the locked doors and peered inside. I honestly have no idea. I'm not sure who I should call to get a new key cut, or if I should just have the whole thing towed away as is. Kelly rubbed her chin, leaving a black smear, and cast around like she was looking for something. Let's go with the theory that she's accidentally locked the keys inside the car. It's pretty old, so a coat hanger or a ruler might do the job to get the doors open. I was glad at least one of us was thinking pragmatically. If I'd been spending less time chasing around other missing stuff, I might have already arrived at that conclusion. I'll go grab a hanger from inside. Not sure about a ruler. Ah, the kids will have one somewhere if we get stuck. Kelly waved a hand. Sure, would you like a cuppa? I hoped I'd gotten the colloquial term right. From Kelly's matching grin I thought I must be at least close to the mark. I'd love one, tea with two sugars please. That I could do. I headed into the house and brought back two mugs and various implements which I thought might work, and we went about the business of breaking in. I learned Kelly was pretty proficient at the practice, and I leaned over the hood as I watched her try to catch the inside lever. You must have some kind of nefarious past busting into cars. I kept smiling to make sure she knew I was teasing, but she didn't look up as she snorted with laughter. Man, the amount of times I've locked the keys in the car. This method is no good with new models, but until recently I had a Toyota that was probably older than this one. She hissed as the hanger slipped past the mechanism and angled it again. Graham knows he has to keep a spare key fob on him at all times. I chuckled, warmed by her honesty. So how does the wholesale flower industry treat you? I've got to say I was hoping to sneak a peek in the greenhouse yesterday. The flowers around the house were beautiful. Kelly's face brightened, and she glanced up from her maneuvering, looking as proud as punch. I really love it, you know? It's taken a while to get up off the ground, but I have solid relationships with most florists within a few hours' drive, and I grow almost everything they need. I used to run a hydroponic shop back in California. But what I've always wanted was a nice little nursery. No way? Kelly's eyes widened. I should definitely get you to check out my system. If I had known, I would have dragged you over a lot sooner. Whenever I talk plants to Graham his eyes glaze over. I smiled a little wistfully, tempted to tell Kelly to forget about the truck and run off to play in the garden. But my phone buzzed in my back pocket, and I glanced at the screen and saw it was Amelia calling. Crap, I've got to get this. Do you mind? I'd already taken a couple of steps by the time Kelly waved me away and kept working on the door. I picked up the call just a second before I thought it would ring out and hurried out of earshot. Cat, you there? Yeah, sorry I was just in the middle of something. I ended up at the bench seat by the water, 
and turned so the sun warmed my back. I wanted to give you an update, but I'm afraid it's not good news. I took a deep breath and rubbed my nose. When is it ever? Evidently choosing not to dwell on that part, Amelia launched into a clipped report. So, my boss questioned Minerva, and we were able to verify that both she and Simon were out of the state when your aunt died. I looked into this Simon on our database and confirmed he isn't a magic user. And from what I can see of the family connection, he didn't appear close to the cousins who are. Twice removed. Okay, but did she, you know, get questioned properly? I wasn't sure why I was so averse to naming the practice of involuntary readings, perhaps because the notion made my skin crawl. My boss wouldn't agree based on what we have. I can't say I blame her. Minerva was happy enough to state that the vial you found came from her, but all that means is we don't have enough to test it against her stores at home. She maintains she doesn't know who bought the poison, but she's aware that if we can prove later that she did, we would charge her with obstruction. I dragged a hand over my face as ugly emotions twisted my features, unable to do anything other than keep listening. Cat, we aren't giving up on this. The poison Minerva sold may not have been the one we're looking for, even if she says it is. She's wily enough to know how to keep us from getting anything concrete and would probably take great pleasure in covering for a peer. We have our best people scouring sources to widen the net and see what we dredge up. The Inquisition is taking the matter very seriously. It's not every day we come across someone capable of hiding a transaction with this level of sophistication. I could only nod. As stupid as that was, given Amelia couldn't see me. Dragging my sleeve across my nose I sniffled to regain my composure and tried to order my thoughts. You're looking for a tech illusionist, right? There's one guy in town by the name of Ash. Except he told me he was away in California at some kind of conference when Aunt Tabby died. He helped her out one or two times by getting on to Witchy Web. And you're only telling me this now? Amelia made a disgruntled noise and rephrased. He wouldn't have had to be in proximity to make the order, Cat. Not if he was getting it for someone else. Crap. I pictured the awkward guy in his computer repair store and wondered if the kid had it in him to do something so sinister. But then he'd gotten me Billy Waite's details without so much as a what for. Dark thoughts swirled in my mind, and I thought the family relics might have fetched a good price for someone with the skills to sell them under the radar in an online international market. That was if he was working with an accomplice, who perhaps had sown the idea. I'm sorry Amelia I wasn't thinking. My team is going to want to hear about this right away. But you're going to have to sit tight. Before I come out, our tech illusionists will look into him and poke a little at his online presence. Tell me you aren't going to do anything to mess this up. If he gets a whiff of this. Course not. I swallowed. I'll wait for your word if you promise not to leave me out of it. There was a pause on the line and I chewed my lip. This is a lot more serious than scoping out a suspect, Cat. It's in your interest to stay away and let us take care of it. If we find evidence on the scene, I don't want to have to explain your presence in the report. We don't need anything that might compromise the case. I chewed on that, disgruntled, but sensed the urgency in the Inquisitor's tone. I'd wanted professionals in. I knew I had to let them do their job. Please, just tell me before you go out there. I promise I won't gatecrash your investigation. I'll hold you to it. Amelia ended the call, and I pressed my lips together, trying to hold it together. Kelly appeared in the doorway of the garage, waving the coat hanger victoriously. Planting a cheery smile on my lips, I took a bracing breath and returned to the more ordinary mystery of the missing truck keys. I got the feeling that I was in for a torturous waiting game. Chapter 20 I'd spent the rest of my Sunday still in hot pursuit of the truck keys, and eventually Kelly had gone home with a promise to look into mobile locksmiths, who in her words wouldn't cost an arm and a leg. I tossed and turned the entire night, wondering if Amelia was holding to her word, or was in Myrtle Glen arresting Ash for procuring the poison that had killed Aunt Tabby. 
I didn't dare call mom and grandma back yet, despite seeing a missed call from them before heading to bed. I wanted to give them a resolution, not more ifs and maybes. After a fitful sleep, I got out of bed with the dawn and drank tea while I tried to piece together how and why Ash might have been involved in Aunt Tabby's death. I hadn't seen him at the memorial service like he'd promised, but I had to ask myself if that was suspicious on its own merit. He was a youngster who probably ghosted a lot of occasions like that. I kind of liked the guy, but maybe his awkwardness was really his guilt, and I had no clue whatsoever on who he might have been working with, if in fact he'd ordered the poison for someone local. If what Minerva said was true, and Simon Flagstaff was not only just a regular person, but had no inkling of the magical world, I couldn't place the two guys together. Now and then I glanced at the keys to the rental car on the counter and wondered if I should just drive by the computer repair shop to see if Amelia was in town. If I were her, I'd probably forget to call me too. All I knew was that I couldn't sit in the house any longer waiting. I had to do something before I went completely insane. When I grabbed the keys off the counter and locked up the house, I promised myself I would steer clear of the investigation. I could use a nice breakfast, I told myself, and there were plenty of cute cafes in town that I'd been meaning to check out. If I got wind that Amelia was in town while I was there, well, that would just be a lucky coincidence. A light fog outside held my attention as I admired wisps dancing over the water of the swamp. I'd come to learn from observation that the wildlife was at their busiest early in the morning, and while I couldn't forgive the kangaroo who jumped out in front of the rental car when I arrived, I had to admit the critters were cute. A group of them grazed at a respectable distance away from the house, and I thought I could spot a baby in a mama's pouch, the tiny head just visible at that distance. The birdsong rose and fell, and I recalled someone at the memorial mentioning kookaburras, whose distinct call was reminiscent of laughing. I hadn't seen one yet, but stunning white birds with bright yellow crests made shrieking sounds to rival the noise of the others as they swooped into a nearby tree. I caught myself smiling at them, then shook myself and chafed my hands together as I hurried to the car. The air was decidedly frosty, and I reckoned some of the folks back home would never believe me when I said Australia got cold. With kangaroos present in my mind, I drove with particular care with the headlights on as I made my way into Myrtle Glen. Their grayish-brown color might have been handy for them to blend in with their surroundings, but I imagined every twisted tree stump on the side of the road was one about to hop out in front of me. I passed by open fields without incident, though, and through bigger industrial yards than to suburban homes before arriving in the streets with storefronts hugging the sidewalk. It was just a little early for the rush of getting kids to school and adults off to work. Some folks were out and about in sturdy coats walking dogs, and I spotted one or two trucks hauling trailers with livestock. I passed the computer store which appeared firmly closed, the only nearby activity coming from the florist next door who arranged an outdoor display of bouquets to presumably draw in passing foot traffic. I didn't know what I'd been expecting exactly but a lack of flashing lights and Amelia's SUV quieted the voice in the back of my head a little. I took the first breakfast option that came up, which happened to be a place simply called Shannon's. The cafe looked as sweet as pie, with a freshly painted white facade and flower boxes out front bursting with colorful snapdragons. I let myself in and noted the almost artful collection of mismatched chairs and tables in varying degrees of repair. I'm not sure that I was in the camp who agreed that chipped white paint on furniture looked good, but I had to admit the place had a charm about it. The almost empty streets were in contrast with the bustle inside, with only a couple of tables free. Pleasant smells of bacon, frying eggs, and coffee lured me to a small table in proximity to the pass-through window for the kitchen, and I waved with a polite smile as a waitress, straddling a steaming coffee machine called out for me to take a seat. I pored over the menu while I waited, trying to relax. When I decided on what I wanted, I took the cue of others I'd spotted who went up to the counter to order. From what I could see it was just the waitress out front managing orders, coffee, cleanup, and delivering plates from the kitchen. 
I thought she gave me a curious look when I ordered eggs Benedict and a double shot coffee, but I wasn't in the mood to make small talk. Besides, she looked like she had enough to keep her busy without me holding her up. The coffee was blessedly strong and hot, and I sipped at it as sedately as I could while poking at my breakfast. It was delicious but I should have thought about the implications of having a stomach knotted with anxiety and a big plate of food. I alternated between checking social media witchy web and my emails, even cleaning out my junk folders to pass the time. I could have been doing something more productive maybe, but anything requiring more than surface-level concentration seemed beyond reach. My mind ticked incessantly and I held my phone as if expecting it to ring at any moment. When it did, I startled, sending the cutlery spinning off the table. I hastily reached to retrieve them from the floor and frowned at the number on the screen. It wasn't Amelia, and I almost didn't answer. Hello? Hi, came a warm feminine voice over the line. Am I speaking with Kat? It's Helen White from the coroner's office. Oh, I blinked. Hi, um, yes it is. Great. Have I got you at a good time? I was calling to give you some information following the autopsy of your aunt. I glanced around the cafe, and despite people generally engrossed in their own conversations or reading newspapers, it seemed off to be talking about something so serious at a cafe. Uh, can you give me just a minute? Helen replied in the affirmative, and I scooted out of the cafe with a wave to the waitress before heading back out to the car. Once I was inside, I took a deep breath and resumed the call. Sorry about that. I'm fine to talk now. Great. Sorry to catch you off guard. I can call back at another time if you'd prefer. No, it's fine. I wondered what the coroner's office could have put a magical poison down to, and despite knowing the cause of death, maybe the effects had more ordinary symptoms. I understand that you've come across from the States, so we wanted to try to get as much closure for you and your family as possible. You must be in a difficult situation so far from home. It was something of an understatement, but the sentiment rang true, thank you, any light you can shed would be appreciated. Okay, I heard the shuffling of papers in the background and folded my arms, so what we were able to establish was that the cause of death resulted from an embolic stroke that is a clot in the heart, which cuts off oxygen to the brain. We know that your aunt was found in her bed, which makes it likely that the stroke occurred while she was sleeping, Helen cleared her throat, but we also found another condition while examining the body. I checked in to see whether this had been diagnosed with her local GP and understand that it wasn't. Tabitha was suffering from pancreatic cancer, which is one of the most aggressive forms of the disease and has a low survival rate. I know this must come as a bit of a shock, but we want to ensure that your family are aware of any risks associated with your aunt's death. My jaw dropped, and I worked my mouth, searching for something to say. Cancer? I managed. And she didn't know. It's highly likely that she would have been experiencing symptoms, typically abdominal and back pain, but she had reported nothing to her doctor. Her last appointment was about a month ago. I swallowed, piecing that together. Would she have been terminal? I would say her chance of surviving would have been low based on what we've seen, and she would have been in a lot of pain toward the end. Ha! Huh. I took a shuddering breath and wiped a tear from the corner of my eye. So a stroke was almost a blessing? You might want to look at it that way. Helen's voice was kind. She may not have even woken up from the stroke. I guess that was something. Trying not to picture it too vividly in my mind lest I start blubbering uncontrollably, I rested my forehead on the wheel and closed my eyes. Thank you for letting me know. You're very welcome. I can go through some process details now or call you back tomorrow. It's really no trouble, and I expect you'll want to pass on the news. The business of getting Aunt Tabby's body back home was the furthest thing from my mind, and I appreciated the offer. I mumbled something about talking to her later, and she ended the call with a promise to get back in touch. It was a lot to take in, and something I never expected given the circumstances. 
Looking up with bleary eyes, I noted more people out and about, some of them looking at me in the car with concerned frowns. I wiped my eyes, wishing I'd stayed at the house, and tried to fathom the chances of Aunt Tabby meeting her end before being consumed by disease. I blinked, the mess of emotions in my mind sharpening into a sudden clarity. Unless it wasn't by chance at all. I turned the key in the ignition, my focus skipping to what I had to do next. Peeling onto the street, I almost veered to the right-hand side of the road in my haste and corrected my trajectory with a wince. I turned around to head to the computer repair shop, hoping Amelia would forgive me for going back on my word. Chapter 21 As I suspected, Amelia had gone back on her word too. Her shiny black SUV sat out front of Ash's store, and I skidded into the nearest parking space to jump out of the car. Clicking the key fob over my head as I ran across the street, I burst into the computer repair shop, holding up my hands. I wasn't sure what it was I expected to find, but Amelia, with a colleague in tow, gave me a sharp look. Ash's eyes darted between me and the Inquisitors as he wrung his hands from a stool. What are you doing here, Cat? Amelia's face was mulish. You're interrupting an invest. I have information. You're going to want to hear this. Amelia pointed to the door with a glower. But I shook my head and turned my attention to Ash. You procured the poison at Aunt Tabby's instruction, didn't you? Ash bit his lip, his face wretched, and hugged his arms. I swear I didn't know what she was going to do with it. She said something about rats in her garage. Amelia opened her mouth in indignation, and I held up my hand to halt whatever tirade she planned on firing off. I just got off the phone with the coroner's office. The official cause of death was a stroke, but Aunt Tabby had an aggressive form of cancer. Undiagnosed. Amelia narrowed her eyes as she processed that. I thought I'd connect the last few dots to save us some time. She was a seer, Amelia. We've been chasing our tail on how she didn't see her death coming, but it makes sense now that she did. And didn't like the look of it. Amelia frowned, then shook her head. Then why did she need Ash here to hide the transaction? It was the missing piece to the puzzle, and I wasn't certain myself, but I voiced the half-baked ideas on that, even if they sounded bitter in my own ears. Shame, maybe? Or not wanting the family to know that she'd taken her life? Silence followed, and I tried to slow my heavy breathing. And the relics? Amelia shared a look with her colleague. I was hoping Ash may be able to shed some light on that, like really, really, really hoped. Amelia's colleague held up her hands and shook her head. Let's all just hold up a minute and take things back to the start. She pointed at me. You, sit. I'm Stella Marshall, Inquisitor of the First Order. I'll be the one asking the questions here. The tech illusionist boss, then. The gravity of busting into an investigation dawned on me, and my cheeks burned. Sidestepping, I tugged one stool a little closer to me and perched on it awkwardly. Okay, take me right back to the start, Mr. Stevens. Talk to me about the events leading up to you purchasing the poison. Ash scratched his nose and, if possible, hunched a little where he sat. I, ah, well, I'd known Tabitha for a few years. Not that well, but once we were properly introduced, she made a point of coming into the store now and then. She kind of reminded me of my mum. There was always some kind of question about her phone or a gadget she picked up, but sometimes I got the impression it was just an excuse to come in and chat. I could see Aunt Tabby doing something like that, particularly if she thought the guy was as lonely as he looked. I guess as time went on she took an interest in things like Witchy Web and I offered to put up a listing for her. She was pretty excited when people began calling her to book appointments, but she always needed me to help out with the back end to manage payments. He gave a nervous chuckle and rubbed his chin. Every once in a while she'd ask me to track something down for her. Potions or items, nothing too out of the ordinary. Then she comes in a few weeks ago and asks after a poison from a witch over in Woodford. Amelia folded her arms with an I told you so look at Stella, 
and Ash paused to swallow as he eyed the pair. She said something about having some kind of long-standing grudge with the woman, but admitted she made the best poisons one could get their hands on. I was leery, but she said it was to keep the rats out of her garage, he shrugged. I'm not sure I believed her, but I would never have thought she was the kind of person who would do anyone harm. She was just a sweet old lady. I'm not stupid. I knew something was really off when she wanted to know if I could make it look like the sale never happened. And you didn't think to tell anyone about it? I arched a tart eyebrow, annoyed at the fact I'd been in his store just days ago. I panicked, he blurted. When I got back from the conference and heard she died, I put two and two together and figured she must have taken it herself. But then I worried about what it looked like. It doesn't make sense that she would have gone to that kind of effort to hide the purchase if she planned on taking it herself. I guess that I could understand that. Not that it made me exactly sympathetic. And the relics? Did you go and help yourself to Tabitha's magical items after her death? Amelia frowned. How could I? Ash threw up his hands. I only arrived back in the country a few days ago. I swear if anything is missing it's not because of me. My stomach did backflips as the thread I hoped would be accounted for was abruptly snipped. If Ash didn't know about the relics it killed my entire theory. And you're willing to submit to a voluntary reading? Stella cocked her head. Not that we don't have enough to compel you anyhow, but it would be better for you to cooperate. You know, should anything else turn up inside your head unrelated to the matter? Ash gulped and nodded. I only paid it half a mind. I'll get the coroner's report. I glanced up to see Amelia giving me a concerned look. We have yet to establish if she took the poison herself. I held her gaze but could tell she wouldn't offer up anything else in Ash's presence. I suppose they would cart him off to HQ, and I would be left again to puzzle things over. I was sick and tired of puzzling things over, and increasingly bitter that Aunt Tabby would leave a mess like this behind. Okay, well, we should get this show on the road. You can ride with us, Mr. Stevens. Inquisitor Amelia will continue the investigation after she brings you back to Myrtle Glen. Stella nodded toward the door. Ash stood and grabbed a set of keys from behind the counter, and Stella drew a recording device from her pocket and clicked it off. Only Amelia and I didn't move, each staring at each other like maybe we could tap into telepathy if we tried hard enough. But I couldn't just sit dumbly in Ash's store all day. I stood hugging my arms and turned toward the door. As Ash locked up behind us, Amelia tugged me by the elbow to a spot further along the sidewalk where we wouldn't be overheard. I'm really sorry, Kat. If I'd have seen the coroner's report before they called. She sighed. Well, I suppose that wouldn't have helped much, either. But I promise this isn't over. Not until we find Tabitha's things. I twisted my lips in some semblance of a smile and nodded. Thank you. I know it's probably a little distasteful, but my boss is going to pose this to me. Is it possible Tabitha might have hidden the relics if she intended to take a poison? so they didn't end up in the wrong hands? I blinked at that, trying to make some sense over a dying woman's actions. It would have helped if she'd at least left a note. Instead, she'd left me to run around thinking she was murdered. I didn't pretend to know much about how the site worked. But even if she didn't truly foresee the sequence of events that followed, she should have expected the heartbreak she'd left behind. Just like any regular person would, I don't know. They aren't at the house. I can tell you that much. And I've been pulling out my hair since I got here trying to figure out the same question. We might be able to get a tracker on the case. If I can get Stella to agree it's warranted, it would be a long shot, but if they're in the vicinity of the house, it could save us from digging holes all over the lawn. A smile quirked Amelia's lips, though I couldn't imagine the woman in her two high heels and crisp suit with a shovel in her hands. I couldn't help but chuckle, even if the sound was thick in my throat. Well, I'll refrain from bringing in a bulldozer then. Amelia clapped my shoulder and took a deep breath. You just sit tight, I'll let you know the minute we're done with Ash. 
I watched Amelia trot to the SUV, where Ash already sat in the back seat and Stella waited in the passenger side. Wondering absently if Ash had likewise been put in the force field lockbox, I watched them drive away. The adrenaline which had spiked frenzied energy on the way to the store had drained away, leaving my limbs feeling sluggish and my heart heavy. Trudging to the rental car, I got in and wondered what to do next. I couldn't call mom and grandma, not yet, not after what I'd heard. Without a complete resolution, I felt like an utter failure, and I had no wish to burden anyone else with the news. I knew heading back to the house would only make me angry as I came to terms with Aunt Tabby taking her life. But at the same time, I knew I had no right to pass judgment on that decision. I just wished she'd done things differently. Had she come home to Arkansas, Mom would have made sure she was as comfortable as possible in the last months of her life. But I guessed home was relative. I turned on the ignition and turned onto the road back to the house. Australia was Aunt Tabby's home, and I guessed she wanted to see out her days in the place she held close to her heart. Even if that meant breaking everyone else's. Chapter 22 Maybe I needed someone to talk to more than I thought. And even though I knew it must have been some ridiculous hour in New York while it was early afternoon in Myrtle Glen, I dialed Cousin Marissa, who answered blearily. Cat? Is everything okay? I'm sorry, it's just. I broke down in tears, not sure where I could possibly start. Hey, Marissa sounded suddenly wakeful. Tell me what's going on. In halting sentences marred by ugly sobs, I told Marissa everything. I wasn't sure if it was all coherent, but I expected she at least knew some of what had happened from mom and grandma. She listened, never interrupting, right up until the point when I told her about the cancer. You think she took her own life? Marissa gasped. The tech illusionist, named Ash, confirmed he procured the poison, that she'd instructed him to. I stared out over the swamp from the bench seat by the water. Staying inside the house was just too much, with turbulent feelings crashing through my head. He wasn't even in the country when she took it. Marissa was quiet for a moment, and I wished she would just say something. Anything that might prove me wrong. Wow, it's just... Cat. I guess being a seer must be pretty cruel sometimes, Marissa sniffed and her words were thick with grief. That was it? Rage bloomed in my stomach, and I stood with a fist bunched at my side. Really? I would have thought it meant she'd have known better. If that was the way she chose to meet her end, why couldn't she have found the decency to clue us in? If we'd have known, I'm sure the entire family would have come out here to say goodbye. Cat, when did you ever know Aunt Tabby to do something without a good reason? Marissa pleaded. A lot of the things she used to say only ever made sense in retrospect. There must be something else in this. Something you're missing. I opened my mouth to speak, but all that came out was an indignant squeak. The world had truly turned topsy-turvy if my usually higher-strung cousin was trying to talk me off the wall. I was the grounded one who thought things through. But damned if I had done nothing but think about this mess ever since I arrived. I've looked everywhere, Marissa. If she planned on leaving any clues lying around, I would have found something by now. Okay, okay. Marissa took a deep breath. Let's think this through. Maybe she got all her stuff together and shipped it home before taking the poison? You know how long international freight can take. Or maybe she's left it with someone she trusts. Have you asked absolutely everyone in her close circle if they're holding on to anything of hers? I felt like tearing my hair out, but instead I racked my brain. I've asked Jan at the post office, the narky neighbor, and a friend of hers by the name of Auntie May. I don't really know who else qualifies. It's not like anyone other than the realtor has come by dropping off a care package. The realtor dropped off a care package? No, never mind. Didn't you say you went to that memorial service? Well, yeah, but I kinda had to leave early, remember? There were plenty of people there who told me they were friends with Aunt Tabby. It's not like I had my BFF detector on. I dropped back onto the bench seat. Maybe start with this Kelly person and go from there? 
Is the Inquisition still in on this or do they step out if they conclude it was suicide? Marissa clucked. I'll bet they can help to bang down doors. Amelia said she'd be back, and maybe she can get a tracker on the case too. I guess we're just back at square one with the relics is all. Logically, that's all it was, the revelations and heartache of the morning aside. There you go, Marissa crooned. I'm really sorry that you're out doing this alone, Cat. If I'd have known, I would have skipped the wedding and come along. Do you need me to tell Grandma about all this? That was the one person in the world I was dreading telling the news to. I was tempted to say yes, but it felt too much like getting off the hook. She'd be just as angry as I was, probably worse, and for once I couldn't blame her. Maybe we were similar in more ways than I cared to admit. Cat? Just say the word and I'll call her. No, I'll do it. She should hear it from me. I rubbed my forehead. I'm sorry to call so late. How's the trip been? Oh, ah. Uh. Well, the timing might be awkward, but... My phone vibrated, and I held it up to see Marissa was trying to switch to a video call. Frowning, I accepted, and my eyes boggled at a big fat rock on Marissa's finger. Jake asked me to marry him. I was glad Marissa had her finger way too close to the screen to see the expression on my face. Evidently she'd had her way with Jake and dragged him off to Tiffany's. Oh my, congratulations cuz. That's just… wow. I know, it's not really the time to be gloating and all, but it was just perfect, you know? That my cousin was settling down with a guy she'd been dating for maybe 12 months was something I wouldn't have expected from her a few years ago. But Jake was a good guy, even if he lived all the way over in Dallas. I supposed that meant. So, I'm guessing you'll ditch the bar and skip over to Texas? Well, I mean we haven't quite decided yet, but my job at the bar hardly compares to him running the family business one day. I smiled at that. It had always been me who had wanted to get out of tumbling springs into what I fervently argued was the real world. What about that potion shop you've been trying to talk me into for years? I teased. Marissa giggled and rolled her eyes. Well, there's this thing called the witchy web. I don't suppose you've heard about it. Unless of course you want to tag along to the Lone Star State with me? I don't think so. I made a face. You can keep your longhorns in cowboy boots. Marissa snorted and glanced over her shoulder. I was guessing we were getting too raucous in her dark hotel room. Fine. She lowered her voice. But what are you going to do when you get back, Cat? I doubt you want my job down at the bar. I sighed and dragged a hand across my face. The trip to Australia had well and truly distracted me from the problems I faced back home. Newly single, back at home with mom and grandma, and still with no direction. Rudderless. I'll figure something out. I might go stay with dad in Florida for a while. My non-magical father had been trying to talk me into trying out his side of the country ever since I let him know about the split with Damon. It was a fresh start worth looking into. Even if I didn't care for his wife. Oh, come on, remember when you tried that at sixteen? You didn't last a week. I recalled that spat with mom ruefully, and the awkward days I spent with dad after that. Yeah, well, I'm not a kid anymore, I just need some place to stay long enough to get my life back in order. The beach would be nice, and maybe I could get a job as a gardener at one of those fancy resorts. I should have been putting more thought into my life's trajectory than that. Tumbling Springs had never offered the kinds of opportunities I was looking for, and if I wanted more, I'd have to go out and forge my way into the world. I almost preferred thinking about the case of the missing relics. Hey, if it comes with vacation discounts, I'm all for it. Marisa poked her tongue out. Now are you feeling better? I frowned, realizing Marissa had deftly shifted my mood. Maybe that's why she had the Midas touch when it came to Grandma. I, ah. Uh, well, I guess so. You know, honestly, I can't say I wouldn't have made the same choice if I knew I was in for a painful battle I couldn't win. Potions, which or not, having choice at the end of life is a powerful thing. Your mom would understand that, too. Marissa twined a finger through her lightly tousled bed hair. 
I just wish she had have done it different, Marissa. I really do. Something caught my attention from the swamp, and I glanced up at a spot where ripples fanned out in the water. The disturbance was large, and I narrowed my eyes trying to figure out what it was. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what turns up, huh? I'll bet that tracker will be able to give you something, even if… I'd stopped listening. From the distance all I could see was the head of what must be the wild dog as it swam toward me. I thought perhaps it had been too shy to approach me, or the house with Aunt Tabby gone. Hey Marissa, I'll call you back, okay? At a decent hour. I didn't wait for an answer as I hung up with the dog making a beeline for me. I stood a little wary, wondering if it might attack or something. I wondered how big it was, with only its head visible, but there was something about how it moved in the water, maybe closer to beaver swimming than a doggy paddle, which made my skin crawl. Rounding the bench, I stood behind it ready to run if I needed to, and my breath caught as it got to the spot where it began walking on the muddy bank. Its maw held fangs not unlike a saber-toothed tiger, and its front paws splayed with webbing and talons. It was the color of mud, but its fur was reminiscent of a seal rather than a dog. Its hind legs were a good deal shorter than the front, and its tail was like a caudal fin. It gave a shake, spraying water everywhere, but stood to its full height as it considered me from the shoreline. It was one of those horror flick movie moments, the one where I was supposed to run, except I couldn't. How I ever mistook this thing for a dog was beyond my comprehension. It had to be bigger than a wolf. Greetings. I have something you will wish to see. Squawking, I held my head and tried to turn and run, but only ended up tripping on my own feet and fell to the ground. I must have imagined it, I told myself. That thing was going to kill me, and my brain had snapped. Tabitha told me to wait until you were ready. It appears you have arrived at some conclusions now. I rolled over to glare at the beast, who only cocked its head at me. It was like a familiar was talking in my mind, except this one had a gravelly voice which matched its grisly countenance. Who the heck are you? I asked. Your aunt called me Billy, but I am a water spirit of these lands. Many humans call my kind bunyips. I blinked at the bunyip, almost hoping it would disappear when I opened my eyes. It didn't, and I said the first thing that came to my mind. Aunt Tabby called you Billy. Billy the bunyip stood a little straighter and lifted his nose in the air. It is of no consequence what humans name me. But she often said I shared the same good looks and humor of her first mate. I snorted, and in my panicked state couldn't help but focus on Aunt Tabby's joke as I giggled maniacally. When you are finished cackling, come to the boat. I will take you to the island. Billy bounded away, and I sat up to watch the creature head to the makeshift dock where the John boat was tethered. This bunyip had something that I should see in the middle of a swamp, huh? Jumping into a boat with a self-declared water spirit sounded ridiculous. But even in my bewildered and somewhat cracked state, I'd put two and two together. Marissa was onto something when she said I hadn't spoken to everyone yet. Chapter 23 Even as unsteady as I was on my feet, I managed to climb into the boat, and Billy kept to the water as he guided the John boat to an island. There was a cobbled-together dock on the far side made from plastic drums lashed together, and I rolled rather clumsily onto it. Billy was already out of the water, and I stared up at him as he trotted off down a muddy trail. He truly looked like he was made of bits and pieces, and I guessed bunyips weren't exactly in the tour guide handbook of native Australian animals. Water spirit, I reminded myself as I pushed up onto wobbly legs. The vegetation grew thick on the landmass, and I batted branches aside as I followed Billy down the path with mud sucking at my boots. I'd been meaning to go out and explore the swamp ever since I arrived, and now I wondered what would have happened if I'd done it sooner. I wasn't sure what to make of Billy's earlier statements of coming to conclusions and Aunt Tabby asking him to wait. It was like I was hallucinating out of desperation. But as I stumbled into a clearing I first noticed the chest beside Billy, 
who had sat dog-like beside it. I surmise you are eager to check the contents in the chest. I shall wait until you are ready to speak. Even though I knew what I'd find in there, I hurried to drop to my knees and unbuckled the old-fashioned straps keeping the chest secured. Even that far inland the soil was saturated, and my jeans soaked it in. I didn't care and popped open the lid to stare at the items which had evaded me all week. Running reverent fingers over the all-seeing spectacles, which reportedly allowed one to see and speak to the dead, I felt a hot tear slide down my cheek. The divination dice which I had only seen in a black-and-white sketch were actually carved from a pinkish amethyst, and the crystal ball was cloudier than I thought it would be. I kept my fingers clear of the human skull tucked away in the corner but traced the painted eye at the bottom of the dream walker's teacup. On top of a faded leather grimoire was an envelope with cat scrawled neatly on it, and I broke down into ugly sobs. I'd been so angry, and yet the box had been sitting there the entire time. The note on the mantle left anywhere but. Rubbing my eyes I got onto my feet with the letter in hand and flipped the lid of the chest so I could sit and stare at my dead aunt's handwriting. Billy groomed himself with a grotesque tongue, a very feline gesture, and I turned the envelope in my fingertips to slide the missive out. Cat! The strangest part of being a seer is bitterly regretting decisions that you have yet to make, and I want to start by apologizing for the subterfuge on my part, which led you on a wild goose chase. I wish things could have been different, but sometimes the sight shows you something too strong to ignore. Not all things are a given, and visions are like lines in shifting sands, possible but not inexorable. Sometimes I think the gift of sight is the divine placing choice back in our hands, which is why I've sought to interfere when necessary to keep me and mine safe. But I want to tell you that we all get to choose our direction in life, and you shouldn't feel compelled to follow a path your gut tells you isn't right. I moved to Australia as a bright-eyed youngster who was newly married and seeking adventure. While the marriage didn't last, I found a new love in this land and lived a long and happy life here. This place is home to me, and like you I always had itchy feet back in tumbling springs. As I'm sure you've pieced together by now, my obligation to the property and its keeper, Billy, is deeper than sentiment. His stomping grounds have shrunken in each passing year, and I worry for the future if water spirits are banished from the world in favor of industry. I may not be a green witch, but I hold to the old teachings of worshipping the land and the ancient ones who keep the equilibrium. I know you won't let the place fall into the wrong hands, and as such you'll find my will bequeaths all my worldly possessions to you. It's not my place to be telling you how and where to live your life, but if you chose to remain in Australia, I would consider it a blessing. Last time we spoke I told you about a bright future I'd glimpsed for you, and regardless of what you choose, I'm sure you will find happiness. You've got a good head on your shoulders, and while you might not think a green thumb holds much value in the modern world, your brand of magic is a sacred gift much closer to the root of magic than you'd expect. You must be wondering how my sister is going to take the news. I expect she'll be madder than a wet hen. But she's old enough to take care of herself, and your mother has always been her rock. She'll keep just fine after she comes to terms with things. And perhaps in the afterlife we can bury the hatchet. Forever yours in spirit, Tabitha Crow. P.S. I get the feeling Alfie might be selling the landscape supply yard soon. I always thought the place had a lot of potential. A teardrop fell onto the page, and I held the letter to my chest as I cried. I wanted to read it again, sure that there must be more words to be said than that but instead I rocked back and forth with the realization that Aunt Tabby had planned all this around me. Even in death, she was setting things in motion for another, and I couldn't help but dwell on how very sad that was. Billy seemed content to let me be until I'd shed my last tear and for that I was grateful. I let go of an entire week of tension and worry, and it was a balm I hadn't realized I needed. Retrospect, indeed. Maybe I shouldn't have made so many stupid assumptions and placed faith in the woman who had never done me wrong. Without so much as a tissue on my person, I dragged my sleeve across my nose and got my breathing under control. 
I had a whole lifetime to come to terms with what had happened, but for now I needed more answers. You allowed me to go running around for days before showing yourself. Why? Billy looked up from his grooming and retracted his long tongue. I only did as your aunt bade me. She thought that you needed to see these lands for yourself before you could decide if you wished to remain. I was supposed to fall in love with the place while investigating a murder. I do not seek to comprehend the fancies of humans, only to honor the wishes of one who saw her own death. Billy stood then, and arched his back, cat-like. She assured me you wouldn't allow the great yellow chariots to lay waste to my billabong. Great yellow chariots? I frowned as I puzzled the words over before thinking about the developer's offer. Bulldozers? I decided not to sell the house to those folks days ago. Then you wish to stay. He tilted his head to the side, which made him look creepier. I, ah. Uh. I swallowed, then clamped my mind shut. I didn't need this older than the hill spirit picking up on any wayward emotions inside my head. It was harder to keep things under wrap when talking telepathically. I was only here to come and get Aunt Tabby's things. Nothing more. This is all quite the bombshell, as I'm sure you understand. I guess I'll have to. Think about it. I really didn't want to anger the creature while stuck out in the middle of a swamp. And the words rang true in my ears. I needed to process what I'd just learned. I don't suppose you know anything about why the patio furniture got trashed. It surprised me to see such a ferocious-looking head seeming suddenly chagrined. His fangs receded in his maw, and ears set too far back on his head flattened. I lost my temper when I caught the scent of pots you moved from the translucent room. I am the keeper of the balance and cannot tolerate your foreign species invading my lands. Ha! Huh. Well, I guess that made some sense. And then you cleaned up afterwards. I did not intend to frighten you, or break the metal structures. I wasn't sure what was more frightening. The act itself or knowing an innocuous plant could make Billy go all hulk on the place. I'd have to tread with care. And Beverly's garden next door? Billy flashed his fangs in a snarl, and I recoiled. I am not a giant green man. Tabitha instructed me to leave the small house alone. I only remove what will bring toxins or seeds to my waters. I guess that was some concession, but I tightened my hold on my thoughts. Who knew that Bunyip's read comics? But maybe it explained why Kelly didn't share Beverly's griping from her greenhouses. I stood slowly, wanting to get back to the house to have some time to think. But the beer? My one weakness in the ways of mortals. Billy made a rumbling sound in his throat, which I took to be wistful. Tabitha kept me in good supply of the beverage. You shall do the same. My mouth twisted in a smirk. I haven't agreed to stay. Then you shall inform the next caretaker. It is of no consequence if another provides tribute in fermented yeast and grains. A water spirit appeased with beer, wonders would never cease to amaze me. But there was one more question I had for Billy, one that may or may not break my heart. Was Aunt Tabby, you know, scared at the end? I hate that she died all alone out here. I wasn't sure that a bunyip would pick up on the nuances of human emotions and death but felt compelled to ask. Tabitha met death with the courage and wisdom of one who knows it is yet another beginning. Those who see far do not easily succumb to fear. I reckoned the bunyip didn't have it in him to spare my feelings, so his words gladdened me. While I couldn't help but dwell on the tragedy in all this, it was reassuring to consider that it wasn't some desperate act to be true to her gift at the cost of her life. Even Mom couldn't magic away cancer. Maybe Marisa was right in saying the poison was, in some way, liberating. I guessed I could never know that for sure. It was a path one took on their own. Frowning at the chest on the muddy ground, I reckoned with my chances of getting it onto the boat and back to shore without falling flat on my back, or worse, dropping the contents into the water. Billy followed my gaze and made a deep rumble in his throat. 
You have much to consider. I shall get the box back to your hut so you may seek wisdom from your ancestor spirits. He got behind the chest and began pushing it with his nose toward the trail, and I realized my mouth was hanging open. Billy's tone and inflection was odd in a way that was reminiscent, perhaps of learning the English language centuries ago. I guessed he likely thought English was about as newfangled as Grandma considered things like witchy web. Clicking my teeth shut, I folded the letter carefully and put it back in my pocket. I'd need to do a proper inventory of the relics back in the house. And call the Inquisition off. Maybe with just one or two omissions. Chapter 24 I snapped pictures on my phone as I carefully placed each of the relics on the dining table, true to my word before coming out to Australia on replacing the generation's old family records. The all-seeing spectacles and Dreamwalker's teacup were probably the most delicate items in the collection, so I photographed them first before wrapping them carefully in dishcloths. A quiet calm had replaced the mess of emotions back on the island, and I sat waiting for Amelia to call me back. I wasn't in any hurry. Having space to just be for a while suited me fine. I'd have to call Marissa before she went yammering back to Mom and Grandma, but since it was still some ridiculous hour back home, I wasn't worried about it yet. The soldier's canteen was battered as all hell, and it was any wonder how it hadn't unintentionally ended up in a scrap heap or a car trunk sale over the years. Its enchantment was one of the oddest in the bunch, said to purify any water sealed inside, which I supposed would be invaluable to a survivalist type stuck out in the wilds. I made a mental note to test it out with the swamp water before snapping a picture, then set it aside on the kitchen counter. The amethyst divination dice were less delicate, and I thought I might play around with those if I found any notes in Aunt Tabby's grimoire on how they worked. The crystal ball and its ornate pewter stand I assumed was firmly reserved for those with the sight, which made it no business of mine. One item which had piqued my curiosity when I read about it in an old journal back home was the skeleton key which, unsurprisingly, was carved out of bone. It looked more like a fancy old wardrobe key than one that might fit in a modern tumbler, but it was supposed to work on any lock. I wasn't sure I wanted to consider which of my ancestors had felt the need to acquire that particular relic, but conceded it could come in use. I dropped my head back to stare at the ceiling with a groan. The truck. Could the missing keys be as simple as Aunt Tabby having lost them years ago and never getting around to replacing them when she had a perfectly good solution in her box of tricks? I was about to get up to test the theory when my phone buzzed on the table and Amelia's name flashed on the screen. Cat, she spoke as soon as I picked up the call. I told you I'd be back as soon. No need, I interrupted. I found the relics. I grimaced at the silence on the line and sighed. Before Amelia blew her top on how much of her time I'd wasted, I went on to explain, I took a boat out into the swamp this morning, a box was stashed in the middle of one of the islands, along with a note from Aunt Tabby. I thought you said you'd checked everywhere. Amelia didn't sound as angry as I feared, but there was a definite hardness to the words. I guess I thought I had. A swamp hardly seems like some place people keep their family heirlooms. I guess we don't need that tracker then. Amelia paused. Are you okay, Cat? Did the note confirm that Tabitha took the poison? Not in so many words, but yes. I wanted to keep Billy out of the conversation if I could. And did she explain why she went to such lengths to keep us from finding out? I guessed Amelia deserved at least some answers, she was invested in the case, and her business was getting to the bottom of a mystery. She was a seer, Amelia, she saw it happen before she ever did it. But she's left everything to me in her will. I think. I took a deep breath. Well, she wants me to stay in Australia. Some welcome party Amelia grunted. I'll want to come by to check out the note and the relics if that's okay. That will all have to go into the report. Sure. But maybe you can tell your boss to take the thumbscrews off Ash. Amelia chuckled. Already been done, I'm afraid. He's just recouping with a cup of coffee now. 
I wasn't sure if I wanted to ask if the procedure was painful now that I knew what he'd said was true. Maybe some kind of apology gift on my part was in order. Okay, well, drop by when you're back in town. I'll be around. After ending the call, I stared at the skeleton key in my hand and thought I'd check just one more thing. While grabbing my purse, I paused when my eyes rested on the postcard I'd found on the coffee table when I'd arrived. I picked it up and stared at the picture, which in retrospect looked way too similar to the swamp to be a coincidence. The simple message of Discover Australia made me groan. If that was Aunt Tabby's message to me, I was less than impressed. But maybe it wasn't so silly to expect someone like me to have spent the week out exploring nature rather than herring around the neighborhood looking for murderers. It might have saved some heartache, at least. After propping the postcard on a bookshelf, I stood outside the house and held the key up to the sliding door lock, not entirely sure what to do next. The latch snapped closed, and even though I was hoping that would happen, I took a step back and yelped in surprise. Well, I guess that was one down. I made my way into the garage and glared at the roller door after pushing it up out of the way. It didn't come down after a few seconds but even so, I scooted underneath it in haste. The door to the truck was unlocked thanks to Kelly's handiwork, but of course we never found any keys inside. Hopping in and buckling up, I took a deep breath and held the bone key up to the ignition. And the truck fired up. Checking the rearview mirror, I cracked up laughing at the goofy grin on my face and pulled out of the garage. The yellow beast might have been old, but the engine sounded smooth, and I drove off down the dusty lane past Beverly's house. Up a little higher, the idea of running afoul of the wildlife bothered me less, and I cracked the windows open to let air stream in. The vehicle had about as much character as my wrecked van back home, with rips in the seats and cracks on the plastic dashboard. But it was comfortable on the trip into Myrtle Glen and I'd always wanted a truck. The idea of getting a load of fresh soil, and having room to load up the back with all manner of gardening gear, made my green thumb itchy, and I found myself making a beeline for the landscape supply store. When I pulled in, I shook my head a little ruefully at the for sale sign on a board out the front. Somehow, I thought Aunt Tabby must have been at least a little smug from the afterlife. It chafed a little to think that the decision that lay ahead of me was preordained, but after digging out Aunt Tabby's letter from my pocket and reading it again, I thought maybe she didn't know for sure if I'd stay. It was my choice. Staring at the sale sign, I dwelled on what that meant for me. A woman in her thirties who was still drifting through life, looking for yet another fresh start. If I wasn't going home to stay in Tumbling Springs, then would it matter if the next place I wound up was half a world away? None of the other fresh starts I'd had in mind came with a house, truck, and a bank account the size of Aunt Tabby's. Not that it wouldn't be possible if I chose to sell up and take my fortunes elsewhere. It didn't make much sense, but as I dug deep, I realized the sleepy town of Myrtle Glen had grown on me during my short and eventful trip. Narky neighbors and pushy realtors aside, the inhabitants of the town had been mostly friendly, and I'd at least already established myself as an acquaintance to some, meaning I wasn't a complete stranger. There was something gladdening about that, and if what Aunt Tabby had insinuated was right, I had the prospect of a good livelihood staring me right in the face, literally. My previous business venture had fallen on its face but looking back I wasn't sure why I thought running a hydroponic shop in California was my happily ever after. A landscape supply store wasn't exactly the boutique magical nursery I'd always dreamed of, but everyone had to start somewhere, right? The closest thing to a nursery in the lot was a pair of giant palm trees hemming the gate and some yard art here and there, but there was plenty of space and it was easy to picture a section in the front with rows of verdant green. This could be it. My patch of soil where I could plant my own flag in the ground and watch it grow. Me grandma would be angry. Mom would likely be as upset as she was when I took off to California, if not more. It was a reality I'd have to face with the courage of a grown woman, and there was nothing to say I couldn't likewise be home for Christmas every year, just as Aunt Tabby had always done. Unbuckling my seatbelt, I took a deep breath and hopped out of the truck. 
I made my way into the small office, all the while trying to quiet the nerves fluttering in my belly. I'm not committing to anything yet, I told myself. It was just getting the full picture of what was possible. When I pushed open the door, I was surprised to see Auntie May sitting across from Alfie, nursing a mug of tea. The two of them looked up at me, and it appeared they'd just shared some kind of joke. Cat, Alfie smiled. Good to see you, love. What can I do for you today? I bit my lip, then summoned the courage to ask the question. I couldn't help but notice the for sale sign. How would a girl go about finding out how much you're looking for? Alfie frowned with a flummoxed look, but Auntie May wore a small smile. I held the woman's gaze, understanding now that when she'd asked if I'd seen Billy she wasn't talking about Tabitha's ex-husband. As Alfie clearly searched for the polite way to ask why an American girl would be interested in buying his store, Auntie May spoke up. I'm guessing you found what you were looking for then? She seemed amused, and I wondered if she'd known all along. I did. I smirked and folded my arms, bumped into Billy too. About time. Auntie May rolled her eyes. And it doesn't look like he scared you off? I guess not. I'm thinking about sticking around for a while. There, I'd said the words. Auntie May gave a stern nod of approval and turned her attention to Alfie, who was most definitely on the out in our careful conversation. You better give this girl a better deal than you gave the land council on that gravel. It's only right that a local should pick up where you left off. Alfie opened his mouth as if to protest, likely about how someone like me could be considered a local, but he snapped his mouth shut and gave her a surly look. Well, I guess we could cut that Simon Flagstaff out of the sale. Should save a few bob. The idea of the slimy realtor being deprived of a commission sent an uncharitable shiver of pleasure up my spine. I reckon I'd insist on that, but you just get me the paperwork and I'm sure we can strike a deal. Alfie held out a hand, and I stepped closer to clasp it with a nod. After promising he would get me a proposal and the particulars of the business within the next few days, I said my farewells and departed the store, feeling lighter than I had in months. Perhaps Billy wouldn't take kindly to my horticultural experiments back at the house, but as I crossed the car park, I imagined a veritable playground for my green thumb just waiting to be unearthed, a place that was all mine. So long as I didn't go too crazy and grow an army of enchanted flytraps capable of taking off a limb, that hadn't gone down well last time I tried, but perhaps Gus may be more amenable to Myrtle Glen than he was about California. I just wouldn't mention cat quarantine until we got to the airport. He must have been sick of sleeping in the barn by now anyhow. Thanks for listening to An Unforeseen Demise, Book 1 in the Trouble Down Under series. If you enjoyed this audiobook, consider subscribing to P.A. Mason's channel to make sure you keep up to date with new books as they're published. Until then, happy reading.